So Arjuns, can you start your recordings? PC recording rolling. Our recording is underway. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Martinez, can you give us the opening, please? Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that email is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm joined remotely today by Council Members Reynoso, Rivera, um, Grudenchek. Today we will hold public hearings on the 135-137 Bedford Avenue rezoning and the Sudam Street rezoning, both relating to property in Brooklyn, located in Brooklyn, a citywide rezoning text amendment as part of the Department of City Planning's Flood Resiliency Initiative, along with three separate but related proposals for the Garrison Beach and Sheets Head Bay uh, in Brooklyn and the Old Howard Beach in Queens and a proposal to rezone Governor's Island relating to the island in New York Harbor and part of the borough of Manhattan. And as a procedural note, I will note that the Governor's Island hearing will uh, begin no earlier than 11.30 a.m. Uh, I now want to begin our hearings. Uh, I will recognize the subcommittee council to review the remote meeting procedures. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not already done so, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the New York City Council website at www.council.nyc.gov to sign up. Members of the public may also view a live stream broadcast of this meeting at the Council's website. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first. Members of the public will be called and recognized as panels in groups of up to four names at a time. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your microphone is on before you begin speaking as there is a slight delay in the process of unmuting. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit instead of appearing before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of your primary viewing window. Council members with questions will be announced in order as they raise their hands and Chair Moya will then recognize members to speak. Witnesses are requested to remain in the meeting until recognized by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting as we address various technical issues and we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, Arthur. I now open the public hearing on a pre-considered LU item for the 135-137 Bedford Avenue rezoning proposal, seeking a zoning map amendment on the ULERP number C210043 ZMK and relating to property and council member Levin's district in Brooklyn. I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online in advance and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. Um, Council, can you please call up the first panel for this item? The applicant panel includes Richard Lobel and Fayon Baton, Land Use Council for the Applicant. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Okay. 
And council, if you could please administer the affirmation. Uh, panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have received your slideshow presentation for this proposal. When you are ready to present it, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advances, uh, advancing of slides. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists uh, would please restate your names, uh, organizations for the record, you may begin. Uh, I, I also, I'm sorry, I just wanna acknowledge that we've been also joined by council member uh, Ayala. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for Dawn Kiernan, the applicant in the 135 to 137 Bedford Avenue rezoning. Pam Baton from Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Thank you, Chair. Council members, good morning. Uh, this is a very straightforward application, which we're happy to bring to the Council. Uh, this is for a C14 overlay over an existing R6 and R R6 A and B disc on Bedford Avenue between North 9th and 10th Streets in Williamsburg. Can I have the slide presentation, please? So to briefly run through the slides and uh, Brian, if you can pull up the second slide, which is the zoning map. As you will see in the lower right-hand portion of the map, the area circled is the area of the rezoning. This is on Bedford Avenue. This is a site which is currently R6A and R6B, which although it allows the underlying bulk of the proposed buildings here uh, being roughly five and three stories, it does not permit commercial use on the ground floor and this rezoning would allow for that. Uh, next slide. Good, so you can see here the area of the rezoning as well as the area of the development site. The development site is highlighted in red. It is roughly 4,000 square feet. Uh, and the uh, area to be rezoned encompasses roughly 10 or portions of 11 lots on the frontage of this block. Uh, important to note is that on the immediate block, the area to the east of this, the entirety of the block is an MX8 M12R6A zoning district, uh, a holdover from the special north side mixed use district, which allows for commercial use throughout uh, these properties. In fact, uh, as will be discussed, most of the properties on the block have some form of commercial use uh, on them. So the rezoning here would really restore the condition which would allow for commercial use as was previously allowed in, in uh, prior zoning. Next slide. So you can see here, this is a land use map. Uh, as you would expect, there are commercial uses uh, which abound in the area, particularly along Bedford Avenue. Uh, on the west side of Bedford Avenue in this area, there is a six block uh, linear area along Bedford that has already been zoned C14, as well as a rezoning that was uh, performed uh, within the last two years, which created additional commercial overlays along Bedford. There, is also, there are also three blocks on the eastern portion of this area, which are zoned C14. So Bedford Avenue already has an existing commercial flavor here. We're seeking to allow for an extension of this uh, to provide for commercial uses on the ground floor of this block. Next slide. This is merely a highlighted portion demonstrating both the uh, frontage here as well as the development site. And again, you can see the C14 overlay that is proposed uh, and other commercial overlays which exist on this frontage. Next slide. And if you can just page through the pictures here, you'll see not only the development site, but you'll also see uh, commercial uses to the uh, north and south portions of the block. Roughly half the uses on this block frontage already constitute commercial uses. Uh, the rezoning side, which we um, just skipped over, would merely allow for a C14 overlay as already exists. Uh, next slide. Finally, we just page through the project plans, which again demonstrate this three and five story building. The building bulk here is as of right. The R split R6A and R6B district would allow for these buildings uh, at this bulk, with the exception being that the commercial use would now be allowed 
pursuant to the C-14. Um, we hope that the council and the, specifically the subcommittee joins in the vote of Community Board 1, the Brooklyn Borough President, uh, and the City Planning Commission in uh, finding that this is an appropriate use of the property and uh, we're happy to answer any specific questions. Thank you. Um, just, uh, just two quick questions. Um, for private applicants, the rezoning process, even to simply add a commercial overlay, can be a long and expensive process. Uh, how do you determine that including a commercial ground floor in this development was worth the delay and the expense? Thank you, Chair. So uh, as you mentioned, it is a rather long process, although less costly with our office than maybe with some other offices, but I won't editorialize. But the truth is that here, the applicant wanted the flexibility to allow for these commercial uses. The intention of the applicant going forward is to have seven productive residential uses on the upper stories. So to complement that, uh, the applicant sought for this commercial use on the ground floor, which already reflects a robust commercial presence on Bedford Avenue. If you look across the street here, if you look to the north and south of the building, there's commercial uses. So for the applicant here uh, who had the time and availability here, uh, they thought that this might be something which was going to benefit the property and more importantly benefit the, the building, potentially allow them to develop a building and, and provide the incentive in that regard. Um, the community board agreed with that. And so while there was time and expense that was uh, engendered in the application, they, they were here given the time frame, we're happy to engage in that. Uh, given the uh, recent other rezonings in the area and the fact that Bedford Avenue here really is a commercial thorough. Thank you. Uh, last question. The, the block between North uh, 9th and North 10th on Bedford Ave has a, a mixed character and includes many buildings that are exclusively residential. Uh, have you heard from any neighbors raising objections to this proposal? Did we lose Richard? I think you froze. Um, no, we haven't had heard that any couple of a question. <laughs> uh, we haven't heard any opposition. Okay, thank you. That I'm aware of. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, that's that's it for me. Um, I now want to invite any of my colleagues to ask questions. Um, I'm going to turn to. Uh, our council to see if we have any council members that have questions for this panel. Chair, council member Reynoso has his hand raised for a question. Council member Reynoso. Uh, outside of the shameless plug, um, this, this does seem like a wholly um, uh, um, appropriate uh, rezoning considering it's along Bedford Avenue. I go all the way up to North 5th Street and it is a commercial corridor. Um, and it, it adds a lot of uh, vibrancy um, and character to the neighborhood. Every, anyone that knows anything about Bedford Avenue knows that um, if, if we could make it continuous that way with the commercial overlay all the way up, up to McCarran Park, it would be amazing. Um, but yeah, this seems like a very appropriate um, use uh, and looking forward to hearing from the council member, uh, Levin there, um, but just wanted to chime in there. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other council members who have questions for this panel? Uh, no, Chair. I see no other members with questions for the panel. Okay. There being uh, no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 135 137 Bedford Avenue rezoning application? Yes, Chair Moya, there uh, we have one public witness who has signed up to speak. I will note that uh, once panelists have completed their testimony today, uh, they will be removed from the meeting as a group. Uh, upon removal, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast uh, at the City Council's website. And we will now hear from the first panel Uh, which will include Buana Paye Kizito, and uh, apologies if I have mispronounced that. Buana Paye Kizito.
Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you so much. So thank you so much for taking me and thank you so much for listening to that testimony. And I already have written down, so it will be quick. So thank you so much. So I believe that this is not for rush and unfair to all New Yorkers today and in the future. Land use, public hearings being held virtually due to COVID-19 are too difficult for authentic public participation and should be suspended. There is precedent to this. The ULURP process is currently halted in two Brooklyn rezonings, Gowanus Rezone and N60 Franklin Avenue rezoning plan across the street from the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens. So I oppose zoning and I will participate to the rest of this hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, if we have any council members who have questions for this panel. Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay. And we have no additional speakers uh, on this panel. Okay. Um, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on 135, 137 Bedford Avenue rezoning proposal under ULIP number C2104. Chair, ex oh, excuse me. Um, I'll ask you if you would dismiss this panel and then we'll make a general okay. announcement uh, for anyone listening. Thank you. Yes, uh, the panel is now excused. Uh, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 135-137 Bedford Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. And the meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for any members of the public uh, who have signed up. Chair Moya, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the 135-137 Bedford Avenue rezoning proposal under ULIP number C210043 ZMK, the public hearing on this pre-considered LU item is now closed and the item is laid over. I now open the public hearing on LU numbers uh, seven. 753 and 754, and a related pre-considered LU item under ULIP number N200343 ZRK for the Sudam Street rezoning proposal, requesting a zoning map amendment, a zoning text amendment, a zoning special permit, and relating to property in council member Reynoso's district in Brooklyn. Once again, anyone wishing to testify on this item who has not already registered in advance must do so now by visiting the council's website to sign up. Uh, I want to now uh, take this opportunity to uh, turn it over to Council Member Reynoso if he has uh, a few opening remarks. Thank you, Chair. Bear with me one second. Okay. Uh, good morning to the Chair and the members of the committee. The project we're hearing today, 349 Saddam Street, I'll represent six years of work by the Bushwick community and the development team to realize a project that meets the needs of Bushwick's residents. I want to commend all of the parties involved in bringing this project to fruition. I believe 349 Sudan represents a model for how to conduct a community process around responsive development that actually results in a building in a buildable project. For years, residents in this community have been crystal clear that they want to preserve manufacturing spaces to provide well-paying jobs for local residents and build affordable housing 
to provide homes that are actually accessible to local residents. This project does both, preserving and expanding an existing manufacturing building with a commitment to retain existing businesses and, a, and building a fully affordable housing building in a vacant lot behind the manufacturing building. The project delivers on a number of priorities that Bushwick has been pushing for for years, and that is a microcosm of the issues raised during the Bushwick community planning process. Unfortunately, it took a private actor to deliver on these priorities. I want to note the huge missed opportunity by the city to actually engage in proactive planning work in Bushwick. Time and again, our community was told by the city and other developers that the type of development we wanted to facilitate was infeasible. Today's presentation shows that this position was inaccurate. I would strongly encourage the city to look at the 349 Sudan project as a precedent for responsible development in the city of New York. No housing is affordable without a job and the continued discon disconnect between our housing and economic development strategies is hindering us from actually delivering economic and housing justice to residents. Finally, I wanna raise the issue of enforceability of development agreements. Bushwick has had a terrible experiences with developers reneging on agreements made with the community. This experience is not unique to Bushwick and has occurred across the city. Even with this experience, uh, the Department of City Planning continues its refusal to enact restrictions when granting zoning approvals to ensure the project proposed is what actually gets built. This is a failed policy and I would strongly urge the next administration to pay restrictive declarations on zoning approvals. This will go a long way towards rebuilding trust with communities who seem to always get the short end of the stick when these agreements go wrong. Thankfully, the developers for this project have agreed to enter into a CBA with a community-based organization, which will ensure the project we approve will be the one that we get. Again, I wanna thank everyone for their hard work to reach this point. I look forward to the presentation from the development team. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Reynoso. Uh, Council, if you can please call up the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Richard Lobel, uh, and Fayon Baitan, Land Use Counsel for the Applicant, Ann Tershwell on behalf of the applicant, Getst Obstfeld and Matt Lanuzzi uh, as the property owners. Okay. Um, Applicants, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to speak, uh, in order to begin to speak. Council, if you could, uh, please administer the affirmation. Analysts, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, you are in uh, receipt of your slideshow presentation for this proposal. Uh, when you are ready to present the slideshow, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. Once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would please restate your names and organizations for the record, you may begin. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Hey, I'm Baton from Sheldon Lobel PC. Annie Tershwell, Type A Projects, applicant team. Ms. Ofsfeld, owner, applicant. Matt Lanusi, owner, applicant, Sudam Street. Thank you, Chair Moya. Council member, council members, uh, first of all, we are um, really thrilled to be bringing this application to the subcommittee uh, and would echo um, council member Reynoso's statements. This, this has been a long process, but one which we feel is going to be successful and we're uh, happy to discuss this and answer any questions. Um, again, we are here for the Sudan Willoughby development uh, and the uh, general rezoning plan. I will present the zoning discussion uh, to be followed by Annie and Getz, who will discuss the program for the development site, as well as the community interaction to date. May I have the slide presentation, please? And you can go straight to the second page, which will show the zoning map, which demonstrates that the site is currently zone M11. The site is 
roughly 32,500 square feet. The M11 designation has been in place uh, since 1961, the, uh, the initiation of the zoning resolution in its current form. And so M11 districts are, uh, are somewhat hamstrung by permitting only a one FAR for commercial uses, as well as not permitting residential use. The zoning action sought here would cure both of these problems and allow for a productive site to be used both for manufacturing as well as for residential use. Next slide. So this slide illustrates the nature of the four zoning actions sought. The first would be the creation of the MX21 district, which, which would create a mixed use district pairing an M15 district with an R7D residential district, allowing residential use on the Willoughby side of the property. Uh, the second would be a rezoning of um, the properties, both to the M15 R7D, the M15 district on the Eastern portion and a small 25 linear portion on the Southern portion, which would allow for designation of R6 zoning uh, to be on an existing non-conforming site. Uh, the third action would be to um, provide for a text amendment, which would allow for the imposition of mandatory inclusionary housing on the site, uh, both options one and two. And the fourth action would be for a parking waiver to waive roughly 36 parking spaces, which would otherwise be required for the development. Next slide. So you can see in pictures of this site and feel free to page through these, both the four story school building to the south of the property uh, along the vacant lot, as well as the existing four story manufacturing building. What do these buildings demonstrate? They demonstrate that the existing building typology in this, in this area allows for these rather tall buildings. Uh, although four stories, the school building, as an example, stands at 95 feet tall. Uh, the proposal here would be to allow for um, both the enlargement of the manufacturing building on the third, fourth stories, and for an additional fifth story, as well as for the creation of a new residential building uh, to be discussed by Annie on the Willoughby Avenue side which would house roughly 95 units. From the land use map here, you can see prevailing land use in the area. We note the existing R6 districts to the south of the site, which already permits uh, residential development and an FAR of three for quality housing and 4.8 development for mixed use buildings, uh, as well as the, um, the fact that there is a commercial presence here, which would be understood and expanded by the imposition of this rezoning. Next slide. The next slide merely demonstrates the zoning change map, which shows the existing zoning district at an M11 with an R6 to the southern portion. And again, after the rezoning action would allow for this bifurcated zoning district with an M15 designation to the east, a, an R7D M15 designation to the west, and the institution of an R6 zoning district for 25 feet on the southern portion. With the additional slide, slide nine, we're going to go into the building program and typology and I would ask that Annie discuss the building program and move forward with the nature of the development. Annie? Great, thank you so much. Um, I have to say, uh, this is Annie Tershwell from Type A Projects again. I echo the council members' excitement over this project. We are in fact grateful to the council member and the community board for what has been a long but incredibly productive community engagement process. And so I think um, just hearing from the council member this morning filled me with renewed pride and excitement over the trajectory of this project, again, starting in 2015, which um, I will run you through a little bit more um, at the end of uh, the presentation. Um, but I think over the course of this project, we've been able to stick to um, the goals, which um, as um, the council member uh, highlighted, um, provided for both affordable living and manufacturing, uh, sorry, of uh, providing affordable living and affordable working spaces in one development. Um, we hope as well that this project will be a bellwether for other developers in Bushwick and other neighborhoods across the city where living and making coexist today, one without cannibalizing the other. Both are so important uh, for a healthy and productive neighborhood where one can affordably live and work in a walkable transit rich environment. Um, so just to the project itself, 
Um, as Rich notes, um, this is a, a two-part project, one which will expand the existing manufacturing building. The building itself is over 42,000 square feet. We would add 14,000 square feet of manufacturing space. Um, and again, uh, both fill out the building and add one small floor on top. Next slide, please. The uh, residential portion of the project, again, um, will be a, a nine story, approximately 95 unit um, project, 100% uh, affordable. Again, we have presented this project um, to the community board and to the council member and have um, worked with them to craft uh, the residential um, development. Uh, next slide, please. The existing um, building itself, um, is, uh, as I said, about 43,000 square feet. It is tenanted fully by M1 tenants uh, or tenants fulfilling the M1 zoning requirements. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about who those tenants are in a moment, but the existing building site, as noted, also has a 17,500 square foot adjacent uh, vacant lot that we intend to build the manufacture, uh, the residential building on. Um, as you probably know, uh, Bushwick is um, adjacent, is a uh, transit rich community, particularly this site. It is adjacent to um, transportation and responds to um, those making spaces that are still living and well in New York City. Next slide. In particular, we wanted to highlight two tenants who have been in the building for a long time and continue to um, not just um, tenant the building, but actually grow in the building. Two tenants uh, who are both in the carpentry uh, design and woodworking business. Molina Carpentry has been a tenant for over six years, and Naula Inc. has been a tenant for over 14 years and really represent the type of work that goes on in the building. In fact, as part of the community process, both city, uh, well, city planning had organized a series of tours of the site for the community and for their staff. And frankly, people were really surprised to see how robust our manufacturing community was in the building. Next slide, please. Um, so our expansion, um, again, seeks to build approximately 14,000 square feet of uh, M1 space. Um, we think that'll bring online approximately 25 to 35 new jobs. And as part of this process, we will upgrade the building facade and some of the building systems to accommodate this growth, but solidly keep it within uh, a manufacturing um, uh, uh, vernacular. Um, you can see, um, the image here shows the addition. This is really just for um, illustrative purposes. We have been going through this process as we've stated and as the councilman noted for, for a number of years. And so um, we've gotten some comments from city planning to perhaps look at a facade that integrates the new construction into the old building. And we will continue to do so as the project uh, winds its way out of ULERP and into formal design. Uh, the next slide, please. The next slide represents, oh, next slide, please. The next, uh, this slide rather represents uh, also a rendering of the facade, um, but this time of the residential building. Um, we sought to respond to the red brick of the adjacent school building, but integrated into a new construction affordable housing project. Next slide, please. Um, as you will be able to see, um, from this slide, um, we uh, again intend to build approximately 95 units of housing, 100% affordable. We have been in conversations with um, HPD over the last number of years, in fact, but um, also more recently as the EULER um, became imminent. imminent we have presented to HPD an 100% affordable project through their M squared program. Um, I think one thing to note on this slide um, is the uh, unit distribution. We responded to the community's goal to having larger family size units. So you can see that only 10% of the units are studio units and um, actually uh, over 50% of the units are two and three bedroom uh, more appropriate for family units and um, also have been working with the community on um, crafting the AMI breakdown. Next slide, please. Um, the next few slides are just preliminary um, floor plans. Um, I think we can peruse through them pretty quickly. Um, 
and end up on uh, the community engagement slide. Um, so the community, as we've noted a number of times, but really is, I think, one of the aspects of this project that uh, we're most proud of uh, started in 2015. Our first meeting was, was with the council member um, and then quickly um, to both general community board meetings as well as subcommittee um, meetings of the community board. There was uh, a, a organization from the community board that we worked with directly. We held uh, site visits organized by city planning and um, uh, sort of whether they like it or not, the community board, I think perhaps got a little sick of us, but we felt it was really important to continue to work with them over the course of this project, engage them and respond to their um, comments um, and desires for the project. Um, I would say the one thing I would end with is that um, as the council member had noted, um, his office has requested that we, um, as, well, as well as the community board, um, enter into a community benefits agreement. And we have been working closely with his office um, to craft that to make sure that we um, honor the commitments made as part of this process. So with that, um, I guess, Rich, we're meant to open it up for questions. Thank you. Rich, are you done with the presentation? Ready for questions? He's muted. Can we unmute Richard? Thank you. Yes, that concludes the presentation. Uh, Chair, we're happy to answer questions. Great, thank you. Uh, before I turn it over to Council Member Reynoso, I just have um, uh, two quick questions here. Uh, just going back to the original point, uh, the Community Board, the Borough President, Council Member Reynoso all express support for this development as presented, uh, but have also noted a concern that the proposal does not actually require 100% HPD affordable housing or industrial retention. Uh, one, are you working on any mechanisms to memorialize uh, these commitments? And two, what is the status of the discussion with HPD on financing the proposed M Square development? So Rich, why don't I take the HPD question and you can follow up with the CBA. So yeah, we have been in conversation with um, HPD as I'm sure everyone on this um, presentation knows. Um, the pipeline at HPD is rather clogged. Um, and in fact, the program that we have been working with them on, the M Square program has not had a term sheet um, reissued. That said, uh, we have been working concertedly with uh, HPD um, over the last few months again, um, and we have a response back to them uh, going in this week. And so it has been really iter an iterative process. And we think, um, and I think HPD thinks we're on the right track. Um, but again, as the pipeline is so long at HPD, um, there have been no formal commitments made, nor can there be until the property is uh, rezoned. But we have been, again, in working dialogue with them and continue to be so um, I I as late as uh, last week. Thank you. And just to supplement and, and to add with regards to the um, community arrangements, uh, you know, I would note that um, it's, it's been an easier job here than in many other locations because uh, Getz and Matt do have such great relationships with the, com with the community and have such a long-standing history in the community of providing space for really worthwhile and productive manufacturing jobs. Um, they're, they're what we would call good neighbors. And so while we are engaging in that process right now to memorialize these arrangements, both with regards to uh, aspects including affordability and the retention of manufacturing space, um, you know, we understand that that will be our burden going forward. It will be one which uh, will be memorialized in an arrangement, in an agreement. Uh, we are working with that, uh, with the council member's office on that, as well as working with a nonprofit partner who would be uh, responsible for administration thereof. So uh, this is a, an active uh, concern of the applicant and one which we are happy to engage in, given the fact that this has been such a positive process uh, throughout its entirety. Thank you. Um... My last question, uh, the project uh, with 100% affordable housing and the industrial expansion and retention is what many communities around New York City would like to see, but developers usually say such goals are unrealistic or financially uh, not feasible. What's the difference uh, 
what is different and special about this property and or your team that makes this possible here? Um, maybe I'll take that. Um, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, Getzopst, uh, one of the owners. Uh, uh, well, we've been involved in developing affordable housing in the city for the last uh, 30, 40 years and have uh, uh, several thousand units uh, under our belt in terms of construction, management. Uh, and so we have a strong sense of the costs of uh, developing affordable housing. Um, and uh, we've also owned this property for about 20 years or so. And uh, uh, so that gives us a sort of a leg up uh, in terms of uh, uh, acquisition. Um, the other uh, aspect that we think will help us with the cost of making this project work is that on the industrial side, we plan on expanding an existing industrial building. So that means that we won't have to uh, uh, expense the cost of uh, all new services. We have water service, we have sprinkler service, we have uh, gas mains, we have elevator. And so um, uh, by expanding on an existing building as opposed to building something new, uh, our costs are, are much less. Um, and uh, so, uh, that will uh, help us uh, achieve the cost, um, meet, meet the cost parameters that we, we have to in order to uh, make a project work. Okay, now how do I get you to come to Corona? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, that's it for me. I wanna take this opportunity now to uh, turn it over to uh, council member uh, Reynoso. So I'm up again. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and look, I, I want to be honest here. The way this happened is that Gats is not a, a speculator. I think the problem we have in this city is that we have uh, developers and folks that buy properties at exorbitant prices and then come to us to bail them out when the current use doesn't work. And that's happening in my district all over the place. We have people that buy manufacturing buildings in which manufacturing space isn't getting more if you get 23 to $26 a square foot, you're on like the high end of what it costs to be able to um, rent out or, or lease out your space. And they're buying it for $250 a square foot and then coming to us and saying, oh, it just doesn't work. Um, it was never going to work when you buy, you know, 10 times its cost. Getz has been here for so long, for 20 years. One, he's from the community. So it's easier for him to talk to the people he already knows and people respect that they've had businesses there and they've been part of the community for so long, but also this is his property that he's had for a long time and there was no speculation. And in doing so, there's a win-win across the board, a long time Bushwick tenant, right? Or Bushwick owner um, gets an opportunity to develop property at 100% affordable housing. Um, and we get an industrial, not only retention, but expansion here. Um, and, and I think it, it really speaks to the, the, the issues we have, the larger issues, um, in the city of New York when it comes to speculation and how people are buying property, um, expecting the city to bail them out through the BSA or to come through our committee. It's constantly happening. So this was a very unusual situation here. Um, and also the applicant, you know, stuck, stuck with us for seven years, right? We've been talking about this for like six years. Type A came to us so long ago um, and they didn't get, you know, they didn't get tired or bored of having to go to the community board, having to come see me and, and so forth. They just stuck with it. Um, you know, and, and Richard already said that he's like, he has the, the most inexpensive system, um, in the city to get these things done. So it just ended up being a perfect marriage, uh, to really ha have this happen. Um, but I just wanted to like serve as, a, an example, if speculation doesn't happen and the city doesn't bail people out for speculation, then they stop taking these risks of purchasing these buildings um, outside of what they're worth um, or si so significantly, right? Now, if you buy it for $50 a square foot instead of the 25 that you're gonna get, maybe we could, they, there could be something that happens there. But when people are buying it for 10, 10 times what it costs, it just doesn't make any sense. So again, I just wanna thank the applicant. Um, Chair Moy, I really, it's me, you know me and how I am about these affordable housing projects and these developments in general. And for them to come through and make, do this process the way they did, um, it's the only 
rezoning that's happening in Bushwick in my time as a council member. I wish we could have done the entire Bushwick rezoning, which would have talked or helped projects like this happen. Um, and the city didn't want to do it. So we had to go through this private application. So I just want to thank everybody for this. The CBA, the community benefits agreement is in like it's finishing stages. It isn't um, a matter of if, it's a matter of when we're in discussions and we all agree that the CBA is going to come soon. If it was up to Getz, he would have already signed it, but we have more things that we need to work out when it comes to like the organization that's going to be doing this work. Um, so it isn't a pro, it isn't something like that we're negotiating or that it'll last minute or change anything. We all feel like we're going to get this done. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. And I'm really excited about this project. I hope that it could be a model for how we're going to be doing work long term. Thank you, Councilmember Reynoso. Uh, this is the happiest I've ever heard you uh, since I've been chairing this committee. Uh, so now I want to uh, ask any of my colleagues if they have uh, any questions for the applicant panel. Uh, Chair, it appears that there are no members with questions for this panel. Great, thank you. There being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify uh, on the Sudam uh, Street rezoning application? Yes, Chair Moya, we have uh, one public witness uh, who has signed up to speak and is present. And I'll remind panelists, public speaking panelists, that upon completion of your testimony, you will be removed uh, as a group and may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this meeting uh, on the council's website. And we will now hear from the first public panel on this item, which will include Buana Paye Cazito. Again, apologies for mispronouncing Buana Paye Cazito. Yes, Buana, thank you so much. But just uh, before, you, before you start, I just want to give a reminder to the public uh, that you will be given two minutes uh, to speak. Uh, and please don't begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. So uh, now whenever you're ready, uh, you can begin. Thank you so much. So I just wanna make sure that the communities that are in Brooklyn that have been in Brooklyn uh, are considered, you know, I wanna make sure that black people and Hispanics, you know, are, be are being taken care of and are respecting this process. It is very important and you know, I believe, I still believe like earlier that this is an awful rush and unfair to all New Yorkers today and in the future. Land use public hearings being held virtually due to COVID-19 are too difficult for authentic public participation and should be suspended. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, that we've been joined by council member Borelli um, and is there any council members that have questions uh, for this panel? Uh, okay. uh, Chair, no, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, uh, there being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, council, if you could, uh, please call up the next panel. If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the Sedan Street rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now and the meeting will stand at ease uh, briefly while we check for any newly registered members of the public. Chair Moy, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the 
pre-considered LU item under ULIP number N200343 ZRK and the related LUs 753 and 754 for the uh, Sudam Street rezoning proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. I now open the public hearing on a set of actions by the Department of City Planning that are generally related and intended to collectively address coastal flooding resiliency. Uh, we hear a number of pre-considered LU items for this project for ULURP number N210095ZRY, Zoning for Coastal Flood uh, Resiliency, which is a proposed uh, zoning text amendment to update floodplain regulations citywide, and three separate proposals under the Department's Resiliency Neighborhood Framework for the Garretson Beach and, Sheep, and Sheepheads Bay in Brooklyn, and for the Old Howard Beach in Queens under ULURP's numbers C210130, ZMK, N210131, ZRK, N210132, ZRK, and C210133, ZMQ. Uh, Garretson Beach proposal includes a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment related relating to property in council member Mizell's district in Brooklyn. The Sheep's Head Bay proposal includes a zoning tax amendment related, relating to property in council member Deutsch's district in Brooklyn. And the Old Howard Beach proposal includes a zoning map amendment relating to property in council member Ulrich's district in Queens. Before I turn it over to my colleagues and uh, affected local members for remarks, I will uh, remind everyone that we will first receive a combined presentation by the Department of City Planning staff on all of these items. And for any members who have questions for this panel, I'll just note that we will address the citywide proposal first, uh, and then each of the separate neighborhood propose proposals in turn, taking questions to the applicant panel in that general order. We will then take public testimony on all items concurrently in one hearing. And where appropriate, I'll ask the public to please specify which proposal they are uh, commenting on when their, names, uh, when their name is called. As a general reminder to the public, if you wish to testify in this meeting, please visit the council website now to complete the online registration process, or you may also submit written testimony to uh, land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. So uh, I want to ask our council, uh, do we have any council members uh, who wish to make any opening remarks? Uh, no chair, it appears that uh, we have no members seeking to make remarks at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you now council can please call up the first panel uh, for this item. The applicant panel uh, for the following items will include Manuela Poadeco, Kate Richard, and Joy Rezor, all of the Department of City Planning. Manuela Poadeco will present the citywide zoning text amendment. Kate Richard and Joy Rezor uh, will focus on the neighborhood, uh, resilient neighborhood proposals. Also available for question and answers uh, are Michael Morella, Frank Rashala, and Chris Hainer all of the Department of City Planning uh, and Eric Wilson of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Uh, Michael Morella, the Director of Waterfront and Open Space Division at City Planning will act as a moderator um, in dealing with questions and answers. Frank Rochala and Chris Hainer are the Director and Deputy Director of the Zoning Division of the Department of City Planning. And Eric Wilson is the Deputy Director of Land Use and Buildings uh, at the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Uh, Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Thank you. Um, Council, if you could please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Yes. 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 Do. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are in receipt of your slideshow presentation for this proposal. Uh, when you are ready to present the slideshow, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. 
Once everyone, uh, once again, everyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists, if you would please restate your uh, names, organizations for the record, and then you may begin. Chair, my apologies. We also have Alexis Wheeler appearing on behalf of the Department of City Planning. Okay. Thank you. I'll start. Um, my name is Manuela Pogdaiko. I'm a senior planner in the zoning division, New York City Department of City Planning. I guess I should start or should everyone introduce themselves? Yeah, if everyone just can quickly say your name and then we can. Michael Morella, I'm the director of waterfront planning at the Department of City Planning. Yep. Frank Rochella, City Planning. Chris Hainer, City Planning. Flex is Wheeler, City Planning. Kate Richard, City Planning. Joy Reeser, City Planning. And Eric Wilson, Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Thank you. Now you may begin. So first of all, good, good morning, council members. Um, I would like to really thank you for your time reviewing this proposal and for all the work that you do on resiliency. I'll start this presentation by highlighting that zoning for coastal flood resiliency is really the result of the feedback we've received from thousands of New Yorkers through more than 200 public meetings since 2016. It's also a work that was built upon the painful experience the city went through with Hurricane Sandy in the several years of recovery that followed that. I'll do a quick recap of the citywide tax proposal and then the project managers for the resiliency local actions would also do the same prior to getting to Q&A. So next slide, please. So as you know, while there are many sources of flooding in New York City, coastal storms present the most significant flood risk in terms of compromising human safety, property damage and business disruption. When we are analyzing the city's risk, we tend to focus on the area that FEMA designates as the high risk flood zone, the area that has a 1% chance of being flooded every year. However, in 2012, Sandy awakened us to a more widespread risk by inundating well beyond that area. Close to half of the properties that are technically classified as being at moderate risk of flooding today are having a 0.2% chance of flooding every year were inundated. In the two areas combined, we have almost a million New Yorkers living at risk of being flooded by a coastal storm. And with climate change, the floodplain will continue to expand. By the 2050s, today's moderate risk flood zone will likely be the future's high risk flood area. Next slide. So to the wide range of challenges that come with flood risk adaptation, we need to pursue a strategy that involves multiple lines of defense. The city's work includes coastal defense strategies, protection of our inland infrastructure, and advanced emergency preparedness. However, the CFR focuses on advancing resiliency of our building stock. Next. So this project builds upon two tax amendments that the city adopted post-Sandy on an emergency basis, which are already expiring. The 2013 flood tax is set to expire one year after the adoption of the new flood insurance rate maps by FEMA, and the 2015 recovery tax expired on July of last year. If these rules are not made permanent, it could hinder the protection of existing vulnerable buildings and disincentivize resilience measures in new, new construction. However, in addition to that, the CFR builds upon lessons learned from the recovery process proposing changes that refl reflect the feedback we've received from more than 3,000 stakeholders, which were published well in advance of the start of the public review process. Next slide. So now I'll get to a quick uh, summary of the proposal. Next slide, please. So after this long process, we were able to establish four overarching goals that help us move from Sandy recovery to a longer term resiliency strategy. First of all, the floodplain community wants to be able to prepare buildings for flooding, even if they're not located in what FEMA currently determines to be the highest risk flood zone. People also want the option to raise their occupiable space a little higher than the current flood level that FEMA projects, 
because they have seen already higher flow levels and ex expect the risk to grow in the future. Third, residents and business owners want to be able to invest in resilience incrementally, so it's more affordable over time. They want options like moving their mechanical equipment to a higher elevation without necessarily triggering a requirement to raise or fully flood-proof the structure all at once. And lastly, we know that we need a way for the city to be nimbler in responding to future events that might require rebuilding homes or even other forms of recovery. Next slide. So starting with goal one, the text applicability. It's important to note that these regulations are all optional and will be facilitating buildings to meet or even exceed flood resistant construction standards set by FEMA and enforced by the, the city's building code in Appendix G. Next slide. Next slide, please. Not sure if there's a lag. We shall be seeing a, a photo slide. One second. Let's just uh, having a little technical difficulty here. Just bear with us for a second here. Sure. All right, perfect slide. So to continue on the city's uh, citywide tax applicability, the so CFR will be expanding the applicability of the current tax by allowing any lot located within both the 1% and the 0.2% annual chance flow planes to have access to rules that enable resiliency at the building scale, even when they're not required by Appendix G of the building code. Next slide. Regarding goal number two, this set of, of uh, provisions, they include regulations that will be available only if the building fully complies or even exceeds Appendix G. Next slide. So starting with the building envelope, more flexibility with height and yards would allow building owners to elevate aptable spaces above expected flood elevations without putting them in the hard spot of potentially having to choose between keeping their whole building versus making their homes more resilient. Next. And through floor area exemptions and ground floor regulations, the proposal would encourage internal access and active uses to be kept at the sidewalk level. So flow plane communities continue to be vibrant and accessible. Next slide. And to ensure that resilient buildings contribute to their surroundings, the CFR will mandate that a set of streetscape requirements are met so that the ground floor level design of resilient buildings is improved. Next. In the floodplain, we also have many buildings that do not fully comply or conform with our current rules, leaving residents in these areas in a hard position when trying to undertake resilience improvements. Therefore, the proposal would set up a framework that allows these buildings to be retrofitted without bumping into zoning constraints. 
Next slide. Last on goal, uh, goal two, sorry. Because of such a vast and diverse building stock, the proposal will continue to offer discretionary pathways in the form of BSA special permits to ensure that all unique situations are able to meet resiliency standards. Next slide. So now moving to our third goal, which includes what we call partial resiliency strategies, since they assist buildings undertake incremental steps towards resiliency without requiring the structure to fully meet Appendix G all at once. Next. We learned that brazing mechanical equipment is often the first step to make buildings more resilient. And so the CFR through permitted obstruction regulations would enable more options for the placement of equipment above the flow level, either on top of roofs or in a separate structure. Next slide. We also learned that many businesses cannot completely be elevated or dry flow proofed and may therefore need to prioritize what kind of spaces would be raised above harm's way. The proposal would then provide floor area exemptions and more flexibility regarding how mixed use buildings can be configured to enable that. Next. The CFR would also allow different types of flood protection measures to be implemented on sites by classifying flood panels and landscape berms as permitted obstruction on open areas. Spaces used for the storage of panels would be able to be exempted from floor area to enable on site storage. Next slide. And last, the CFR will continue to offer flexibility for the grading of waterfront sites and required visual corridors and facilitate resilience measures such as soft shore lines to be designed to help account for sea level rise. Next. And now regarding our final goal, which differently from the previous regulations, they include rules that would mostly apply on the CDY level. Next slide. First of all, Sandy really showed us how a storm's effect can go beyond the floodplain, especially across our energy grid. The proposal would allow power systems to be considered permitted obstruction on open areas across all zoning districts to facilitate their installment. Next. And in addition, to ensure that all areas of the city can easily provide ADA access, the proposal will classify both ramps and lifts as permitted obstructions in all required open areas to facilitate accessible designs. Next slide. And another important issue is how disasters, especially those that require the evacuation of residents, impact vulnerable populations, especially residents of nursing homes who require continual medical care. The CFR will prohibit the development of new nursing homes within the high-risk floodplain and selected geographies that would likely have limited vehicular access during a storm. Existing facilities would still be able to conduct enlargements. Next slide. And last, the proposal would include rules that could be made available to facilitate the recovery process from future disasters, some of which will be implemented now to help address the pandemic. This include allowing more time for property owners to complete their regional plan of construction or return to operations. Next slide. And I'll end the presentation by acknowledging that after several years of civic engagement, this proposed zoning changes received support from the vast majority of community boards, borough boards and borough presidents. And thank you so much again for your attention and engagement on this project. It's been a long run. Um, now Kate Richards will present the Brooklyn Local Actions. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. A um, Couple of questions here. Can you uh, briefly, can you speak briefly to all the components of the city's multi-layered resiliency strategy of which the uh, ZCRF is only one part? Let me just go to this slide and maybe, um, well, I guess I can just speak about it. So yeah, so the idea here is really for the city to advance what we call the multiple line defense strategy. We, we need to look into the building stock while we are looking into infrastructure improvements and coastal defense strategies, such as the uh, Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. 
Uh, so while we have other agencies and other levels of government really working on those other levels of protection, which of course includes the amazing work that the Office of Emergency Management does with uh, residents and business so they are prepared in advance of coastal storms, the, the idea is that DCP together of course with the Department of Buildings really focus on the properties and how buildings and the building stock can be made more resilient. And I'll just say that, you know, one of the main components of this text is to conduct the necessary changes and the tweaks that we found necessary after our civic engagement process that were preventing specially existing buildings from being retrofitted, since we have such a diverse building stock in the city, which is very different from elsewhere in the nation. But that's, that's the general gist, gist of it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so, so does the, 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 ZC, the ZCFR uh, encourage new development in floodplain areas? No, no, it's not encouraging uh, development. Um, basically, because it's a citywide text, we really just we're just removing existing hindrances for development that is occurring uh, to be able to, you know, comply with resiliency standards. Um, also, we, we have several provisions that we're proposing as part of the text that will be incentivizing extra levels of protection. Uh, something that actually wouldn't be able today without uh, you know, a lot of property owners having to go to the BSA for special permits. Um, so that's one thing that we are doing. Um, and with existing properties, as I mentioned before, uh, this is not incentivizing new development or, or, or requiring retrofits but it's just providing the framework uh, for that work to occur in a more resilient manner. <clears throat> okay, so uh, should there be uh, city, state, <clears throat> or federal programs to help property owners afford to make their buildings more resilient? Yes, we understand that uh, it's very expensive to conduct the measures that we are trying to enable with the text. Um, you know, I personally went to several of the workshops um, and actually all the workshops that we did for the text. And one thing that we did was to connect with the residents and go in a case by case basis. And everyone, of course, demonstrated the, their, uh, you know, will and, and they're wanting to uh, create, you know, make their buildings more resilient, but of course don't have the means to do that right now. Uh, a lot of, we're talking about homeowners that, you know, have been there for a long time and a lot of uh, homes that are really, you know, it's a, it's a place in the city that is really providing affordable homes to a lot of New Yorkers. So uh, we understand that there is a need for more funding. And uh, I have other colleagues here that can speak a little bit more about programs that we have today. I think it could be helpful to just list what we have today since I got, uh, we got a lot of comments about, for example, the need for backflow valve installations. And so we have some programs already, but uh, there's always need to, to, to have more pre-disaster funding. So maybe I'll turn to Michael. Great, thank you. Uh, I think there are several of us who will need to be unmuted for this. If I could ask that Eric Wilson also be unmuted. Um, it's an excellent, Point that funding is obviously and access to capital is absolutely one of the keys to making certain that more New Yorkers are able to uh, make use of the provisions that we're seeking uh, through zoning for coastal flood resiliency. Um, on the whole, I would say that we have to be looking at our federal government for the funding. The scale of the problems uh, of our coastal resiliency can only be resolved looking at funding from the federal government. A key aspect of that is what's referred to as pre-disaster mitigation, putting money in advance of a storm. Uh, that's in contrast to how FEMA funds things currently, which is by and large putting money after a storm occurs, like what we saw during Hurricane Sandy, and after Hurricane Sandy, I should say. But let me turn to Eric Wilson from the mayor's office who could speak about a couple of projects right now. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Council Member, for that question. Um, coming off of Hurricane Sandy, we did receive funding from state and federal um, organizations to create what's called the Flood Help New York program. Um, and everyone can still go to this. It's at floodhelpnewyork.org, floodhelpny.org. This is a partnership um, between the state governor's office of storm recovery, um, the city of New York's office of resiliency, um, and the Center for New York City Neighborhoods to get information out 
to property owners across the city about resiliency retrofits and about flood insurance, um, which is another part of our multi-pronged um, resiliency strategy. Um, the idea is to get information out there so property owners can start making decisions. In some neighborhoods, um, property owners qualify for an in-home resiliency audit um, to help them understand what vulnerabilities their property has um, and strategies to advance construction projects that will make their homes more resilient. Um, as part of the Flood Help New York program, um, certain property owners may qualify to get a backwater valve. Um, a backwater valve is a key component um, of one's home that can prevent um, sewer backups um, into a basement, um, and that program will subsidize the installation um, of a backwater valve. In addition to Flood Help New York, we're continuing to work with our colleagues at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to identify new opportunities um, for to assist New Yorkers make this big transition um, that we need to make to make all of our buildings more resilient. Um, one of the programs we're looking at with them is, is Home Fix, um, which is an existing program for property owners. Currently under Home Fix, um, properties, um, properties can apply for assistance with a number of different kinds of repairs, roof repairs, um, but included in that well are backwater valve installations, which we think are a pretty key element um, of making one's property more resilient. So um, together with this proposal um, that the Department of City Planning is bringing to you today, which makes the regulatory framework much more flexible, um, we are looking at new ways and you know, building on Michael's comments of, of federal partners, the federal government is going to be an absolute necessity um, in this and we look forward to continued partnerships with them. Yeah. So just uh, with that, uh, as you, this was being planned, was there any conversations that the city had with its partners from the state and the federal level to look at what type of funding may be available knowing full well that this is something that was gonna be asked of property owners, aside from the valve that you're talking about right now? It certainly was. This has been part of the, the city's legislative priorities, both in Albany and in Washington. Obviously um, now in Washington, we have a very different environment in which uh, there's we anticipate far greater reception for uh, these types of partnerships than we had um, just a few months ago. Um, so I think that is really changing the, the going to be changing the tenor of the conversation. Okay. Um, and, and then just how does the, this text amendment uh, affect the mechanical void allowance allowances and how does it interact with uh, recently approved or proposed changes that provide exception for certain mechanical void spaces? Then Mala, do you wanna respond? I believe Manuel needs to be unmuted. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, with the void question, um, the proposal uh, has you know uh, options for the kind of creation of new mechanical buildings. And we got that question a couple of times uh, in, in a couple of council member meetings. But basically, we, we have, for example, for mechanical equipment on yards, we have height limits. And even though we don't have height limits for the mechanical buildings, they, of course, do have to comply with the, the height limits of the, the lot itself. But we don't see a reason why someone would try to create a void in that instance, because we have uh, the way we wrote the language, we require that me mechanical buildings have to be predominantly used for mechanical equipment. So it's not that you are, you know, creating more space for residential because it's just an ancillary structure to support uh, the, the, the functionality of the, the building, especially on campuses, uh, which is uh, one of the main uh, strategies that we have for, for housing campuses. Um, I don't know if, if that answered your question. Okay, uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving because uh, we have a couple more uh, a couple of members who want to ask questions as well. Uh, this is my last question. Regarding section uh, 64-322 paragraph C uh, and subparagraph two of the proposed text, 
does this section have any limitations on floor area exemption of the area below the first story of uh, the flood elevation, uh, which is beyond uh, a limitation on the habitable spaces? Manuel will need to be un unmuted again. Okay. I'm sorry, again, I usually mute myself automatically to avoid uh, background noise. Okay. Um, so I believe you're talking about the exemption we have uh, for wet flood proofing spaces. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't have a limitation on that and I'll explain why. Um, so the wet flood proofing floor area exemption is only for areas that will be, as, as it says, wet flood proof pursuant to code. And what that means is that Appendix G only allows parking storage and building access to be wet flow proofed. So you can't really use that for anything uh, you know, more useful. Um, and the wet flow proofing flyer exemption, it's something that we already have today in, in the zoning resolution. Um, it's, it's a provision that was really crucial for us to include after Hurricane Sandy. Otherwise, buildings will basically, especially low density buildings that we have a lot in the floodplain, will have to lose a third of their, their homes uh, in order to retrofit since, you know, they have to raise and, uh, and that ground floor is, is only, um, you know, can only be used for parking storage and access. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that explains uh, the wet flow proofing exemption. Thank you. And could you just make sure you keep your yes. mic open just for the remainder of the questions? Please. Yes. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. Um, that is it for me. Uh, I want to ask uh, our council if we have any council members that have uh, any questions for the panel. Uh, no, Chair Moya. I see no members with questions uh, for the panel at this time. Okay. Uh, there being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify uh, on any of the Department of City uh, Planning's flood resiliency proposals? Uh, we do have some members of the public signed up to testify, Chair Moy. I just want to confirm with the applicant panel that they um, have concluded. Or do they? No, yeah, we still have the local action presentation. So three local, local actions. We asked the chair if you would like us to proceed with the presentations on the local actions. Yes, please. I think we'll ask for the presentation to come back up. Is that you're, you're ready for that? Yes, please. Thank you. And you can go to slide 26 for Kate. Thanks, Manuela. No problem. All right, uh, good morning. So this is the first of two local resiliency actions in Brooklyn, uh, Resilient Neighborhoods Garrison Beach. This area located in Brooklyn's Community District 15 was studied as part of DCP's Resilient Neighborhoods Initiative. Next slide, please. The Garrison Beach neighborhood has some unique conditions that can pose resiliency challenges. Um, these include narrow streets, sunken lots, non-standard lot sizes, uh, and limited egress and access uh, to and from the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Uh, to address these resiliency challenges, DCP proposes a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment in Garrison Beach. The zoning map amendment would replace the current R4 zoning with R41 zoning, the C3 zoning with C3A, and uh, the C12 and C22 commercial overlays on Garrison Avenue would be replaced with a C23 overlay. The zoning text amendment would establish a new special coastal risk district. Next slide, please. The new R41 and C3A zoning districts would prevent the development of new attached or multifamily homes in the neighborhood. Uh, reduced side yard requirements would also allow for contextual flood resistant development in Garrison Beach. 
Additionally, under C3A, uh, the existing mix of water dependent and residential properties along the neighborhood's waterfront would remain in conformance with zoning and would not face obstacles from zoning regulations if they were to undergo uh, any resiliency retrofits. The new C23 commercial overlay would permit some expanded retail services, including home maintenance and repair services that would be useful in disaster recovery or rebuilding. Next slide, please. The Special Coastal Risk District would further restrict the density and scale of future development in Garrison Beach by only allowing single family detached homes on lots less than 3,000 square feet. Residential building height would also be limited to 25 feet above the reference plane. Next slide, please. Um, this project was referred out for public review in October 2020. Uh, Community Board 15 held a public hearing and vote for this project, along with Resilient Neighborhood Sheepshead Bay and uh, ZCFR on November 17th and voted unanimously in favor. Um, the Brooklyn Bureau President also submitted uh, recommended approval of the project in January 2021. Uh, that concludes the Resilient Neighborhood Garrison Beach presentation. Um, I can answer questions or go ahead to the Sheepshead Bay presentation. You can go go ahead. Okay. Um, in that case, next slide, please. Uh, Resilient Neighborhoods Sheepshead Bay is the second local resiliency action in Brooklyn. It is also list, uh, located in Community District 15, and it was also studied as part of DCP's Resilient Neighborhoods Initiative. Uh, here, DCP proposes a zoning text amendment. Next slide, please. Uh, created in 1973, the Special Sheepshead Bay District promotes water-related commercial uses and new public open space. The special text allows floor area bonuses in certain areas for developments that provide open space on site. However, there is minimal guidance on how those spaces should be designed and maintained and no consideration for flood risk or resiliency in these spaces. Uh, for example, Plaza spaces may be entirely paved and sunken up to two feet below grade, which creates a drainage issue and flood risk. Uh, the proposed text amendment aims to encourage flood resilient and active design of public spaces where the special district requires or encourages them through floor area bonuses. Next slide, please. Uh, more specifically, the proposed text amendment would encourage flood resilient and active design by requiring plazas to be located at or above grade, by improving the consistency of public space across the special district by consolidating what are now separate types of open, open space bonuses, eliminating a bonus for arcade spaces or covered walkways, which tend to produce enclosed spaces that don't support the goal of commercial activation, and by setting clear and improved standards for how future plazas are designed um, to ensure they are accessible, provide elements like seating, trash bins, drinking fountains, and have uh, trees and plants that are tolerant to occasional saltwater flooding. Next slide, please. Uh, to help show the effects of these proposed changes, we've taken um, an example of existing conditions on Emmons Avenue and shown what might occur under the proposed standards. This is just an illustrative drawing. There's no planned redevelopment of this site um, or any other sites that would be affected by these regulations um, at this time. So this plaza was designed to the existing standards. Uh, it is a hardscaped open space with minimal planting. Under the proposed uh, conditions, there would be requirements and standards for things like seating, movable furniture, and bike parking. Next slide, please. Uh, this project was also referred out for public review in October 2020, and um, the public hearing and vote by Community Board 15 was held on November 17th, um, and they voted unanimously in favor, um, and the Brooklyn Borough President recommended approval of the project in January 2021. Um, and that concludes this presentation. We'll go straight to the presentation on Queens, if that's all right, Chair. Yes. Thank you. 
Excellent. Um, good morning, council members. I'll be presenting on Old Howard Beach rezoning, which is the, local, the Queen's local action that's certified in conjunction with zoning for coastal flood resiliency. DCP is seeking a map amendment here. Next slide, please. Old Howard Beach is outlined here in white and is served by the A train at the Howard Beach JFK Airport Station. It's a waterfront community north of Jamaica Bay, bounded by Shell Bank Basin to the west and Hawtree Basin to the east, making it susceptible to flooding. And it's also a neighborhood that was deeply impacted by Hurricane Sandy in 2012. As Manuela mentioned, the city has done a lot of work since 2012 to ensure that coastal communities are better protected against flooding. In 2014, DCP launched the Resilient Neighborhoods Initiative to work directly with coastal communities that were devastated by Sandy. The 2017 Old Howard Beach, Hamilton Beach, and Broad Channel Resilient Neighborhood Study built on that work, providing zoning recommendations specific to unique neighborhood conditions and risks, which for Old Howard Beach included enacting targeted zoning treatment to reflect the neighborhood's unique character and long-term vulnerability, updating zoning to make it easier to retrofit buildings and advancing infrastructure and coastal protection strategies. The proposed rezoning aims to achieve these goals while also leveraging ZCFR provisions to increase flexibility for resilient construction. Next slide. As you can see from this map, Old Howard Beach is largely within the 1% annual chance floodplain or the high risk flood zone. Portions of Old Howard Beach to the north are within the 0.2% annual chance floodplain or the moderate risk flood zone. The neighborhood was completely inundated by Sandy, with most streets experiencing an average of three to six feet of flooding and some seeing up to 18 feet of inundation. Next slide, please. Old Howard Beach consists of predominantly low rise residential buildings, the majority of which are detached single and two family homes. This slide reflects the housing typology that exists under the neighborhood's current zonings. The majority of the area is zoned R31, which is reflected in the detached homes you see in the top right. Some of these homes have already been elevated to be more flood resilient. Homes within the northern portion of Old Howard Beach, shown in the bottom right, are typically semi-detached in nature and are single or two-family duplexes and are most common in the R32 zoning district to the north. Semi-detached buildings are harder to retrofit to meet resiliency standards. Next slide. The proposed rezoning includes a map amendment outlined in orange and yellow, affecting 48 blocks and 1,037 buildings in the area. The proposed rezoning would change the current R31 and R32 districts into a single R3X district. The R3X zoning would better reflect the typology of the existing housing stock, which consists of predominantly single and two family detached homes. The proposed zoning would not produce a large difference in what is currently permitted with the FAR maximum height and parking requirements remaining the same. The largest difference would be in the permitted housing typology, which would be limited to only detached single and two family homes. Along Huron Street to the north, outside of the 1% annual chance floodplain, the current R32 district would be rezoned to R31 which is the lowest density district allowing for semi-detached single and two family residences and would ensure that housing typology characteristic of the street remains in compliance. However, the future construction of small multifamily apartment buildings would no longer be permitted. And again, the FAR maximum height and parking requirements would all remain the same. The difference here would be in the permitted housing typology. Next slide. On December 3rd, Queens Community Board 10 voted unanimously in favor of the proposal with the following conditions. That no future development of community facilities with sleeping accommodations be permitted, and that all other restrictions listed in the special coastal risk district text be applied, including floor area limits and maximum floor area ratios for zoning lots containing residential and community facility uses. The Queensboro president also voted in favor of the proposal with the following condition that nursing homes with sleeping accommodation, excuse me, that community facilities with sleeping accommodations be further excluded in agreement with the community board's recommendation. To address these points, Manuela had mentioned earlier that nursing homes are licensed to house populations that require continual medical care, 
which puts them at risk whether residents shelter in place or evacuate prior to a coastal storm event. Community facilities such as psychiatric and other health facilities gen generally do not serve a resident population that experiences negative health and morality outcomes when subject to evacuation. However, we respect the community board and borough president's recommendations and will cont uh, continue to consider future restrictions in the floodplain. In response to the second recommendation, the agency conducted outreach and research during the neighborhood planning process to determine the appropriate zoning treatment for Old Howard Beach. A map amendment rather than a special coastal risk district is being proposed because of the neighborhood's slightly higher elevation, wider and more regularly sized lots, and lower susceptibility to da daily tidal flooding as compared to nearby Hamilton Beach. The proposed downzoning would work in tandem with the ZCFR citywide tax amendment to bolster resiliency efforts by limiting future development to housing types that are easy to retrofit and build to resilient standards, as well as retaining the existing neighborhood character. This concludes my presentation and I'm now available for questions. Thank you. Um, I just have one quick question on uh, Old Howard Beach here. Uh, how, and, and I might've missed it, I'm sorry, but if you touched upon this, but how, how do you determine which uh, vulnerable populations met the criteria uh, for limiting certain land uses in the floodplain? Sure, um, I'm happy to answer that a little bit and I'll pass it on to Manuela if you'd like to elaborate more. But um, again, we, we did some research and really looked at different populations that exist within the floodplain and um, how we're defining vulnerable populations. And in this instance, nursing homes are considered the most at risk because whether they shelter in place or evacuate, they're still subject to harm um, because of the continual medical care that they need. Uh, so we've determined that they would be placed at the highest risk if they were allowed to remain in the floodplain. So it was just nursing homes? Because I'm just uh, wondering why weren't uh, more uses restricted to the floodplain, such as um, a homeless population, hospitals, uh, senior housing, et cetera. Uh, Chair, if I may, this was based on uh, rather extensive research and in collaboration with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and our colleagues at the Department of Aging, that the nursing home residents face a very unusual type of risk. For most other populations, in the event of a storm, relocating temporarily to another location during the duration of the storm is what's considered best, pra practice, best practice throughout the United States. However, nursing home residents, um, given the nature of the care that they require, face a very different type of risk, which is that there's a negative health outcome if they were to either move to a different location during the duration of the storm, or if they were to try to stay in place during the storm. And this is based on the experience during Hurricane Sandy, as well as national uh, research that shows new, uh, uh, numerically that the, the, this is based on actual statistics, that there's actual health consequences to that. That makes them really in a very different category. One of the reasons and why it's, you know, there are some similarities between obviously hospitals and nursing home facilities, but hospitals tend to be much larger facilities that have the ability and the staffing, et cetera, to be able to, uh, in general, not always, but in general, um, take uh, uh, the continuity of care into consideration during the duration of the uh, of an event like a hurricane. But there's also a lot of senior housing over there too, and I'm just yeah. And but but it's the it's the yes. But senior housing, when particularly when it's independent uh, senior housing, where the the residents are able to take care of themselves, there has not been the research to show that there is that same level of negative health consequence to that of nursing home residents. That's really the key distinction based on the research that, that we have conducted, that we have found, um, I should say. So, so where was this research done? I'm sorry. So this was research that's done uh, after Hurricane Katrina, after Hurricane Irma in Florida. Um, numerous, uh, and this is not research that that, this is research that public health officials and public health experts have done 
to examine this exact question. But the, the city itself just took uh, those studies. You didn't do your own study in regards to its effect on uh, the old Howard Beach and other areas like that. No, no, we were looking at the national studies that have been peer reviewed um, and have been published in scientific uh, public health journals. Okay. Uh, I'd love to talk more about that uh, after this. I, I, I don't want to hold up uh, other folks, but, but it really concerns me that we're not thinking um, more broadly um, when it comes to seniors and the hospital uh, issues that we already have seen um, in the last year. So uh, this is something I'd like to continue this uh, offline uh, with all of you. Uh, with that, that is that was my last question here. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to our council to see if we have any council members that have any questions uh, for this panel. Chair Moya, I see no members uh, at this time with questions for the panel. Okay, thank you. Uh, there being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify uh, on any of the Department of City Planning's flood resiliency proposals? Yes, Chair, we have uh, two registered witnesses signed up to testify. Uh, for members of the public here to testify, please note again that public witnesses will be called in panels. If you are a member of the public sign up to testify on one or more of the flood resiliency proposals, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the chair recognizes you. Please note again that upon completion of your testimony, you will be removed from the meeting and can view the live stream broadcast of this meeting at the New York City Council's website. And we will now hear from the first panel which will include Juana Paella Cazito and George James. First speaker will be Juana Paella Cazito, followed by George James. Good time. And just as a reminder again uh, to members of the public, you'll be given two minutes to speak. Uh, please don't begin until the Sergeant at Arms uh, has started the clock. So you may begin now. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much. And I would like to add, it is very important not to forget the communities that live in Harlem, in Yonkers, in the Bronx, in Washington Heights, around Marcus Garvey Park, that still need to be renovated, in Southside Jamaica, Queens, East New York, in Brooklyn, uh, Queensbridge, and Left Rack. There's other communities that will be impacted by flooding, about other natural causes due to the climate, and it needs to be not to be forgotten. And I wanted to add that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be George James. Your time will begin. Thank you. Um, my name is George James. I'm an urban planner. Um, I have two points to make about zoning for coastal resiliency. First, this zoning does not make new buildings safer. That's the job of the building code. What ZFR does is it makes building in the floodplain easier, which I would say encourages development in the floodplain, in the places most likely to flood. And really there's a question for this policy making body is, is it good policy to encourage development in areas that will likely flood? And actually, I don't know the answer to that question, right? I, I, it's, it's a decision that was made right after Sandy and New York City really has never had a serious policy discussion over this question. ZFCR makes permanent and expands build it back policy. And is that a good thing? My other point is that there is one citywide change in ZFCR that applies everywhere in New York City that I hope you will modify. ZFCR would make accessory mechanical equipment housed in separate buildings exempt from floor area and allowed as permitted obstructions in yards and courts everywhere, not just in floodplains. This provision will allow buildings to cover 25% of the lots required open space. The DOB does not, this is important, the DOB does not require that a building be right-sized to the mechanical equipment it holds. 
So you should expect that it will be built to its maximum size. This change would allow the development of structures on small lots or you know, large, relatively small buildings on small lots, but larger buildings on larger lots um, in Tower of the Park style development. Um, it will mean a loss of green space, but also the increase in the amount of per impervious surfaces, which perversely increases the potential for flooding during storm events. You should either strike this provision expired. entirely, limit its application to floodplains, or require that spaces used for this mechanical equipment be right size. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Chair Moya, that was the last speaker on this panel. Okay. Uh, is there any council members that have questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, thank you. There being no more questions, uh, there being no questions for this panel, uh, the witness panel is now excused. Um, council, uh, is there another panel? Anyone else that's uh, listed to testify on this item? We will uh, now check to see if there are, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the zoning for coastal flood resiliency proposal or any of the resilient neighborhood proposals for Garrison Beach, Sheepshead Bay, or Old Howard Beach. Please press the raise hand button now. And the meeting will stand at ease while we check for any uh, other members of the public who may register to testify. Chair, it appears that we have one uh, individual waiting to testify who has a hand raised. We're gonna check to see whether that individual is uh, seeking to testify on the flood resiliency proposals. We will now hear from, I believe, Jonathan Perez. Jonathan Perez. Yes, I'm, I'm test I was hoping to testify on the governor's island. Has that out happened yet? That item has not started yet. Uh, I will hold on to it then. Thank you. Sorry about thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. So, Chair Moya, there are, uh, I, we see no other members of the public wishing to testify uh, on these items. Okay, there being uh, no members of the public who wish to testify on the preconcerted LU items under ULIP numbers N210095 ZRY, C210130 ZMK, N210131 ZRK, N210132 ZRK, and C210133 ZMQ for the zoning for coastal flood resiliency and for the resilient neighborhoods, um, uh, Garrison Beach, Old uh, Howard Beach, and the special Sheep's Head Bay District proposal. The public hearings are now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, as, as I announced uh, at the start of today's meeting, since- uh, Excuse me, uh, Chair, sorry, that's, I'm gonna skip that paragraph. Okay. Got it. Um, I now want to open up the public hearing on the pre-considered LU's items uh, under ULERP numbers N210126 ZRM and C210127 ZMM for the Governor's Island Rezoning Proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment, and which relates to property in Council Member Chin's district 
I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online in advance and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. Um, I'd now like to take this opportunity to recognize council member Chin um, for some remarks. Council member. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. I just, uh, I have questions uh, for later, but I really thank you. Uh, for chairing this important meeting and Governor's Island is, is a treasure for the whole city. And I know that many of my colleagues have visited or brought their constituents there. So we just hope that um, whatever we do there in the future uh, will continue to be uh, a wonderful resource and place for our city. So I look forward to the presentation and, uh, and thank you again for chairing this meeting. Another long meeting for you, Council Member Moya. Uh, this is a walk in the park for our for us, <laughs> council member. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the council, if you could please uh, call the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Clara Newman, Christopher Tepper, and Sarah Krautheim for the Trust for Governors Island. Clara Newman as president and CEO uh, for the trust will act as a, a moderator of sorts for today as needed. We will also have Jack Robbins uh, as the project architect, designer, uh, and planner, and Wesley O'Brien, land use counsel for the applicant. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Thank you. Uh, and now, counsel, if you could please uh, administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee in an answer to all sub, uh, answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. No, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we are in uh, receipt of your uh, slideshow presentation for this proposal. When you are ready to present the slideshow, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced uh, when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the loading and the advancing of slides. Once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would please uh, once again restate your names, organizations for the record, uh, and then you may begin. Thank you, Chair Moya. I'm Claire Newman, president of the Trust for Governors Island. Good morning, Chair Moya. I'm Christopher Tepper, Chief Development Officer at the Trust for Governors Island. Yes, morning, and Council Wesley O'Brien, land use. Sorry, yeah. uh, Sarah Krautheim, uh, Trust for Governors Island. Yes, and Wesley O'Brien of Freed Frank. Jack Robbins, uh, Partner and Director of Urban Design for FX Collaborative, consultant to the Trust. Great, thank you. You may begin whenever you're ready. Great, thanks so much, Chair Moyo. We are ready for the presentation. Good morning, Chair Moya, Council Member Chin, Council Members. Thank you for having us today. As mentioned, I'm Claire Newman, the President of the Trust for Governors Island, and we're very thrilled to be presenting our vision for Governors Island. Next, please. Governors Island is truly a gem in the heart of New York Harbor, just minutes from Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn by ferry. It totals 172 acres, and is home to 1.3 million square feet of landmarked buildings on the Northern Island. We're open to the public from May to October. Next, please. The Trust for Governors Island is a mission-driven not-for-profit that owns and operates the island. We're 100% focused on making Governors Island an amazing public place for New York City residents through three key pillars. First, stewarding and expanding the island's open space, park, and recreational resources. A view from the hills is pictured here. Second, expanding opportunities for dynamic, diverse arts and culture, which has been a core of what the island has meant to New York from the inception. And third, making the island an even greater resource for the city through expanding its use as a climate education and research center. Next, please. The island has an incredibly rich history, first utilized as a hunting and fishing camp by the Lenape, and for nearly two centuries was utilized as a military base. It was closed to the public in the mid 1990s. 
Following the closure of the Coast Guard base, nearly a decade of advocacy led to the transfer of the island from federal to local control. In 2013, the northern historic section of the island was rezoned to allow for mixed uses envisioned by the transfer. Next, please. It's also important to note the history of planning on the island. The deed for the island required the creation of a master plan and it outlines required, permitted, and prohibited uses of the island. Note that the deed requires educational use and park use on the island in perpetuity and contemplates mixed use development on the island. In 2006, project goals in line with the deed were outlined, including mixed uses and revenue generation, which again are fully in line with our proposed rezoning. Next, please. In 2010, the master plan was released, which really outlined an award-winning park that has already been opened and delivered to the public. It also identified, as you can see here, two sites for development on the southern half of the island to support enhancement of the island as a 365 active resource for the city, as well as to generate revenue to support the island's mission. These are the sites now being proposed for rezoning. Next, please. Over the past 10 years, a huge amount of progress oops, uh, there we go, has been made, a huge amount of progress has been made on the island. Thanks to the work of many who came before, the island has invested in park, open space and infrastructure. Uh, the city has invested over $400 million, in fact. We've built out partnerships with uh, the Harbor School, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, and programming partnerships focused on arts, education, and environmental users and we've attracted millions of visitors. 80% of visitors to Governor's Island are from New York City, and we get visitors from every single residential zip code in the city. Thanks to this progress, we believe Governor's Island is now ready to take its next step and grow from being a six month destination to a 365 part of the city's fabric. Next, please. To that end, the mayor's office and trust laid out a vision to create a leading center for climate solutions on the island. A vision which builds upon the work of existing partners like the Harbor School, Billion Oyster Project and many others in the environmental and educational community. The island's iconic location, its unique geography, its role in New York City as an authentic public place, all mean it can provide a platform to bring together and scale the climate research and policy work so needed to tackle this next big challenge for the city and the world. By taking education and resource out of research out of a traditional campus environment and putting it in a public place, we believe we can center equity and public engagement in moving climate action forward. Next, please. For us, the realization of this climate center starts with attracting an educational and research partner to create a truly cross-disciplinary hub of learning, research, and public engagement. This will be the foundation upon which we can bring a cross-sector approach to the issue. Next, please. The link between public health, climate, and the environment is unquestionable. And as we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis, we have an opportunity to reimagine our urban fabric and prepare for the existential threat of climate change. This vision is a key part of the mayor's recovery agenda. Uh, the project alone is projected to create 8,000 permanent jobs on Governor's Island. The plan also offers tremendous potential to create synergies with our existing tenants, build broad educational and training opportunities, again, like the Harbor School and Billion Oyster Project pictured here. Next, please. This initiative also builds upon New York City's leadership in climate policy and resiliency by expanding space for education, training, and research, and offering opportunities to showcase and engage visitors in real solutions they can take back to their communities. Next. Here's an illustrative vision of what a climate center on Governor's Island could look like. Um, not official real architecture, but meant to paint a picture of how this zoning envelope could be utilized uh, to, in, to realize a climate center. Next. We plan to release a solicitation for an educational and research partner institution this year. Working with our community advisory council, we're outlining goals specifically focused on one, public engagement, two, development of equitable workforce and educational pipelines, and three, design guidelines. 
In addition, we will continue to move forward with the activation of the historic district through targeted RFPs focused on attracting educational, cultural, and amenity uses to the island. Next, please. This proposed rezoning is critical to delivering on the island's potential as a resource for the city that is accessible year round and for supporting the vision for the climate center. One, the zoning is necessary to allow for the mix of educational, cultural, and commercial uses long contemplated for the island and in line with the deed. Second, the proposal will generate revenue to support care for the park, to support expanded citywide access to the island, create additional programming, and care for the historic district. Three, it brings life and activity to the island year round, making it as much of a resource on a Tuesday in February as it is now on a Saturday in July. And last, it creates an envelope and guardrails that will enable us to realize a critical project for the city, the Center for Climate Solutions. Next. So on to the proposed rezoning. The proposal in front of you involves extending the special governor's island district that was created in 2013 on the North Island only um, to the Southern portion of the island. Next, please. Picture here is an overview map of the island. The Northern section of the island as mentioned is home to the 1.3 million square feet of historic buildings. It's also home to a handful of year round tenants. We continue to work towards attracting new users to these historic buildings and really pushing forward the adaptive reuse. The South Island zoning today is in conflict with the deed. It's zoned for residential uses. Throughout the decades of planning for the island, a rezoning has always been necessary on the South Island for that reason. Next. Pictured here are the current development sites on the southern portion of the island. Today, they are all fenced off to the public. Uh, one site is home to a glamping operation and the other is home to uh, vacant buildings that are structurally unstable, left over from Coast Guard days. Next, please. Our proposal is to extend the uses allowed on the North Island today to the South Island development areas, adding research and development and small scale production. Um, the zoning will also protect and expand park and open space on the island. The existing park will not be impacted by this proposal. In fact, an additional layer of protection is being afforded. And finally, the proposal would increase the allowable density on the southern part of the island from the approximately 3.4 million square feet allowed today under the R32 uh, to about 4.275. That's effectively a 3.0 FAR without including, of course, the open space. Height limits range on the island. They vary from 60 foot base heights to maximum heights of between 200 and 250 feet. Next, please. What's important to point out is that development may only be generated with the development zones outlined by the master plan. Uh, those are the only areas that create FAR. An open space sub area is proposed to be created, which includes all of the existing park, plus some unbuilt sections of the original park plan and the entire esplanade. Um, and that space also has protections under the deed. Next, please. I'm now going to turn it over to Jack Robbins from FX Collaborative to share more about the urban design framework for the proposed rezoning. Jack? Great, thank you, Claire. So um, this rezoning is the product of years of study and input from stakeholders, um, as, as Claire has uh, outlined some of that. Um, and I wanna just walk through what some of the key urban design points are. Um, we began by establishing a set of guiding principles, and these principles are designed to safeguard and to enhance those qualities of place that make Governor's Island so amazing. The park, the waterfront, the historic buildings, the relationship to the harbor and to the skyline. Um, in addition, we try to go beyond this by encouraging innovation and flexibility, the things that will allow Governor's Island to become a beacon of sustainable development. Next, please. One of the key 
questions, one of the key issues, of course, is what is the right density and scale? How do you get to that critical mass um, that, as Claire uh, talked about, will make you feel comfortable on a weeknight in February um, as well as a Saturday in July? How do, how do we achieve that critical mass? Well, one of the things we did was to study comparable developments from around the country, um, uh, places like Boston and Atlanta, um, and we looked at what the size of those developments uh, is and what the, the density there is. And they ranged, um, as you can see here, from about a two and a quarter million square feet up to eight million square feet. This puts the Governor's Island proposal um, exactly in the, in the, in the mid-range of that. Um, and when you look at the FAR, and again, the FAR, the, the denominator in the FAR is just the development zones. It does not include the park. It's only a 2.98, um, quite a low uh, FAR for this kind of development. Next, please. Um, another of the, the key elements of the urban design has to do with the connectivity, both the, the visual connectivity and how you actually move around the island. And we began with a, with a focus on Yankee Pier, and the, that is the main arrival point, um, <clears throat> and created the Yankee Pier Plaza, and then an, uh, a network of pathways connecting to and through the development zones to connect the waterfront to the park and connect the South Island to the North Island and really make this a place that's easy to get around. Next, please. Um, the park, of course, is one of the main um, assets of the island and we really were looking to enhance that. So uh, we are not taking away any park space with this development. In fact, we are adding to the park space. We're adding um, areas around the edges to become part of the park. And we are then creating a network of open spaces that support the park, pathways, plazas, other areas that will help to weave the open spaces on the island together into a network for everyone to enjoy. Uh, just to, to emphasize the park space is being increased, not lost or decreased. Next, please. The bulk envelope is designed to be flexible and to create variety. Uh, it allows moments of greater height um, while keeping the sensitive edges lower. Uh, no more than 30% of the development zone can be built at the, in the uh, taller, the maximum heights. And those again, vary across the development zones. Um, <clears throat> greater heights allowed closer to um, Yankee Pier. Again, that's just um, kind of good basic urban design, coordinating your transportation and your density. Um, but it's also kept lower in, in other key areas. Next, please. One of the key um, restrictions in height is this is a transition zone that's created along the border between the, the North Island and the South Island. That border um, is, was known as Division Road, but we want to make it not a division. We want to make it a, a seamless transition. Um, <clears throat> the heights uh, in this transition zone are limited to 60 feet. Um, the heights on the North Island across from that range from 35 feet to 125 feet, with most of the building heights being around 50 feet. So this will create a, a, a transition area as the height goes up or can go up towards the South Island. So even though you have some of the, the taller heights right next to Yankee Pier, they're not in the, in the development area next to Yankee Pier, they're not right next to Yankee Pier. Between the plaza and this transition zone, um, it will be pushed back considerably from the historic core. Um, we see this as a way to, to connect the North Island and the South Island. And as a whole, these uh, urban design controls, uh, we think is really the best recipe to make Governor's Island a vital year round place. Back to Claire. Um, can you uh, unmute Claire, please? There you go. Thank, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chris. 
Um, throughout this process, the trust has been committed to robust public engagement. Working closely with our partners, we've presented at 15 public meetings on this proposal alone. We've heard comments around a few key areas that we've made modifications of the application to. As you heard, we lowered maximum building heights, um, which had been in two areas at 300 feet down to 250 feet. We've made adjustments to lower base heights to allow for a better transition from the park and the historic district. We have decreased allowable parking. The island will continue to remain car free for you know, driving trips to and from. The parking allowance is really intended for the storage of operational vehicles. Uh, for example, the trust already has approximately 50 vehicles today just to care for the few um, historic buildings that are occupied in the park space and as well for ADA accessibility issues. Next, please. We've also significantly reduced park amenity uses allowed with the open space sub area in response to concerns. Um, we're now only allowing what you would find um, really anywhere. Uses allowed are limited to park amenities, including bike kiosks, small outdoor cafes, mini golf, um, other low impact amusements like carousels, all of which have to be open to the sky. Uh, and an amphitheater, which is something folks have long wanted on the island. We've also committed to ensuring that there is robust public engagement around the Climate Center RFP itself. We'll be presenting finalist responses for it, or qualifying responses for input publicly. Next, please. Of equal importance, we don't wanna lose sight of the other comments we've received throughout this process that fall outside of the zoning, but are incredibly important to the island. First, we have committed to ensuring that existing tenants and partners continue to work on the island. We're actively working with groups, including Harbor School, Grow NYC, Earth Matter, on location plans and are committing to committed to ensuring their work continues on Governor's Island. This is extremely important to the island and the Climate Center vision and something we are actively pursuing. And in fact, we've made significant real progress in the last months. We also know how important field space is on the island, especially during this past year. Um, we're continuing to work on expansion of the, those uses. Third, we plan to expand ways for visitors to engage with the waterfront. We have kayaking and other uh, activities now and as capital funding becomes available, we want to continue to integrate places to touch and be with the water on the island. And then of course, we're committed to building upon the legacy of the park to use the island as a showcase for new approaches to urban sustainability and resiliency, whether it's with our historic buildings or new facilities or day-to-day -day operations. Next, please. At the end of the day, we believe this proposed rezoning is our pathway to delivering on the long held vision to integrating Governor's Island into the city as a mission driven 365 place, generating a revenue stream to help support the island, all while creating a one of a kind project to bring together science, policy, arts and public engagement devoted to pressing issues of climate and the environment in a way that adds value to the city's recovery. We're committed to continuing this process in partnership with the council um, and to continue to work on all the detailed input we've received to date. Next, please. With that, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you all for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Before I, I turn it over to Council Member Chin for, uh, for questions, I just have a, a few questions um, for you. So according to the EIS, mm -hmm. um, Governor's Island and its open space uh, functions as a major destination for the city and the region uh, with over 16,000 uh, workers and visitors uh, on a peak single day. Uh, is it correct that your proposal is expected to double this population to over 42,000 people? Thank you, Chair Moya. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Wesley and Chris from our team to tackle that question. Sure. The, the the peak number of users would is not anticipated to go up to forty two thousand people on a single day, Chair Moya. They, they, they've they've looked at. Can you speak a little louder? I didn't I didn't quite hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So that, they've they've looked as part of the EIS. They've analyzed the peak hour of of come to the island. Uh, during during particularly during the business days. 
the, the Chair Moya, the number of um, people, because a lot of our peaks now are on summer weekends, we're actually going to have a, a somewhat even population on week. The, the big increase is going to be on weekdays because they'll have, start to have more tenant businesses and workers and students and people going to the, the climate center on the South Island. Um, but those will be, tend to be you know, Monday through fi Friday, where our existing peak users are, are public access summer weekends. And that we don't anticipate to change that much from where it is today. Okay, so just to be clear, you're saying that it's it's not going to be over 42,000 at peak hours? No, our, our peak hour transportation demand is around 9,000 people coming um, on like a Monday morning, let's say at 9 a.m. Okay. Um, so just with that as well, uh, you just mentioned something that leads to this question. Uh, which of the proposals, uh, proposed uses do you envision that would bring uh, the most uh, people to the island? I think, yeah, Chair, so, uh, oh, go ahead, Wesley, please. I was gonna say, uh, so of, of the two analyses that were undertaken, they, they looked at one that was heavier weighted towards the university uses and one that would be heavier weighted towards the office uses. For the transportation analysis, it's a bit of a mix and match because in different periods, there are different peaks. So they've taken as part of the EIS, they look at the most intense transportation from either one. So for example, the office may be the peak in the morning use, the more heavily weighted office mixed use development may be the peak in the morning, but then university may have been the peak for the midday. So it's a mix and match to get the most intense for the analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can you give us an idea of how much the ferry system would need to be expanded uh, to serve the increased population? Yeah, I'll, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Chris as well. Um, right now, I think it's just to give a sense of the volume of that on a weekend hour, we have the capacity to bring about four to 5,000 people to the island. Um, so our financial modeling and our planning for this intends to increase both ferry frequency and ferry service as we adaptively re reuse buildings and as new buildings come online um, in order to keep, keep up with the demand. Chris, do you wanna add the details? Yeah, just that um, as Claire just said, because we're already used to large peaky populations where everyone wants to get out as early as possible on a summer, you know, sunny summer day. Um, we're going from about um, the ability to carry about 4,500 people in a peak today to needing to be able to carry about 9,000 for what we envision in the long run, the full development of the South Island and, and the re-tenanting of the North Island. So it's, it's really basically, we have two ferries today with some supplementary um, chartered service um, in the summer to Brooklyn and with uh, NYC Ferry. We basically need to double what we have today, um, but we we actually have in our existing ten-year capital plan um, with OMB Capital for two additional ferries, one of which was, is already in design. Okay, thank you. Um, and what are the allowable uses uh, being proposed in the open space uh, sub area? Sure. Um, once again, I'll start and I'll ask. Uh, the team to jump in if I get anything wrong. At first, you know, the, we have to go within the zoning use groups, but we there's sort of things that I would put in the category of food and beverage. It used to be that it allowed for food and beverage uses of over 200 persons. It's now only such things below 200 people. So really similar to honestly, if you came to Governor's Island today and you ate at Fauzia's or Island Oyster or those kinds of spaces that people need on the island as amenities on the weekends and weekdays when they come visit the island. That's one group. The second group are open air, sort of children's oriented amusements. We eliminated a whole swath of things that folks were concerned could allow larger scale amusements like what you would find in Coney Island, which was not the intent, um, but we made sure to clean that up. So it would be things like carousels, mini golf, um, out there day camps, um, this whole group of things is only open air, nothing that's enclosed or covered in any way. And then there's a bucket of things that are sort of infrastructure related to serving the park. So, you know, I don't know, a city bike kiosk, um, a little stop with a overhead for a tram, 
Um, thank you, Council Member Chin, for your support on the trams um, and things of that nature. Wesley and Chris, did I did I miss anything? No, I think you captured the important things. There was a slide if we wanted to see the full list in the presentation, if it's helpful or not, but it, it listed out every single use and as Claire, I think made the important point that they all have to be open to the open to the air. Okay. And can you sort of talk through uh, how these uses were studied uh, in the final uh, EIS? Yeah. Um, Oh, Wesley, jump in. I, I do want to just make the point that, you know, because we started this, we started this process, gosh, back in, I mean, well, I don't know when you'd say we started, it's been going on for many, many years now. But the scoping in 2018 um, was looking at a more generic program. And so we did study, as Wesley said, two things. One was a more office oriented program, and one was a more university oriented program. And in all cases, obviously, took on the very serious responsibility to always look at the reasonable worst case scenario across those two so that that way there was no chance that we'd overlooked some potential environmental impact. Um, but Wesley, can you share the, the details of our approach there? Sure. And, and, and Chair Moore, I understand your question to be focused on the analysis of how of the open space area and how yes. that was looked at oh. in the EIS. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, this, this is a supplemental EIS. So there have been there was initially a generic EIS in 2011, followed by a supplemental in 2013. So the, the supplemental EIS, actually both of the, the 2011 and 2013, looked at the build out of the park pursuant to the master plan. So that, that and the trips generated by park users, um, the, the types of uses that would be anticipated at that time, were all studied in detail at that point in 2013. So, Today, we're here with a second supplemental EIS that looks at the new uses that are going to be generated by the proposed rezoning. So that, that is really focused on the uh, uses in the development zones, and that is layered on top of the work that was done in 2011 and 2013. Okay. And uh, how can we uh, provide more assurances to the public that these uses will not uh, take over the open space? I think, um, uh, could you unmute Claire again? Yeah, one second. Claire, you can't, um, don't, mute, don't mute yourself. Yeah, don't mute yourself. <laughs> I finally figured it out. I'm going to keep up now. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, um, well, we, you know, we've been managing, uh, obviously, um, there's going to be a balance, I think, between the number of amenities. I think everyone wants more than there is today. There's no bathrooms. There's very few places to um, get food, in, in particular, year round. Um, you know, I think it's it's just our, our uh, generally our, our commitment to, to managing the park so that it has a diversity of, of uses and a di diversity of amenities um, for a broad range of New Yorkers, both active and passive recreation plenty of green open space for respite, um, places for children to play, and places for families to find entertainment. And I could just one. add, um, Chair Moya, um, you know, the, the park, as Claire mentioned in her presentation, um, is uh, protected by the deed in perpetuity, and the open space sub area, the uses allowed within that area are very much in line with what you would find in any park across the city. Um, so, you know, again, the park is, is incredibly important to the island today and in the future. And, um, you know, while there has been some noise out there around uh, development happening on the park, FAR cannot be generated on the park and the park is um, protected through this process. Okay. But, but could those uses potentially reduce the open space ratio on the island? No, I mean, I would also say that, you know, again, we, it, particularly this came up a lot at the community board, um, you know, we were very concerned about the issue. And so we did, I mean, we, we really took pen to paper and tried to make the changes that we folks, we thought folks would provide the comfort you're asking for. But, you know, if there's something in that list that in second review and second look, people say, gosh, you know, that scares me. I really don't want that. We're of course open to continuing those conversations. As Chris said, we're trying to make sure that there's enough uses that we can add places to get 
a sandwich or coffee, what have you. Maybe people want to go on a merry-go-round, but um, we very much appreciate the importance of this issue and want to continue to work together on that. Okay, thank you. And just last question. Uh, do any of the construction of the retrofitting of buildings to be more resilient uh, require any specialized labor? Oh, um, you know, that's an interesting question, Council Member Moy. I'll have to get back to you on the details of that, but we do expect, you know, that the adaptive reuse of the buildings really can be a showcase for how to do, in particular, rehab of historic buildings in a way that's sustainable and resilient. So I expect that there will be a lot of specialized trades involved in that work. Um, Chris, do you want to share something more there? Um, no, I mean, I, a lot of, I think what you said is, is right. Uh, definitely, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities. And as the technologies and, and approaches change, I think it's certain there'll be specialized trades in engineering. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, I want to uh, now turn it over to uh, Council Member uh, Chin. Great. Um, yeah, thank you, Chin Moyer. Um, and uh, thank you to the Governor and Island team uh, on your presentation. I have um, some follow-up question um, that the chair talked about and another question. Um, in terms of expansion of the um, ferry service, because right now um, there are ferries coming from Brooklyn and from uh, Lower Manhattan, but for other part, I think of the city, uh, are you looking at really expanding uh, the ferry service so that other neighborhoods will have easy access uh, to Governor's Island instead of having to take a bus um, to the ferry terminal, ter terminal or to take a subway? Or since we have so many ferry stops now, how do we sort of um, increase the service directly to Governor's Island? Yeah, thank you, Council Member Chin. That is certainly our vision. I mean, as you as you said, we want to be able to connect directly with many more parts of the city at greater frequency. Actually, when the a few years ago now we were on on a year-round basis one of the New York City ferry lines, but there wasn't really the demand in place to support it. So our hope is that as we are able to bring more folks to the island on a year-round basis, whether it be park visitors or you know, students going to the Harbor School or, um, you know, folks tenanting new buildings in the historic district, that we will be able to really add that additional connectivity. Um, we think it's enormously important to, A, getting people to the island easier so they can enjoy this fantastic resource and, and B, providing those connections to jobs as and educational opportunities as the vision comes to life. Chris or Sarah, something you wanna add on that? The only thing I would just uh, point out is, um, you know, it's as Claire mentioned, it's very important. And recently, we did expand um, direct ferry service to Red Hook, um, really in an effort to increase accessibility, especially to communities that don't have as much access to open space. So I think that's something that's very much on our radar, and we're going to continue to um, study as as the funding becomes available to increase uh, ferry expansion. Okay, I think I, we also are asking the city, uh, EDC, to help support that, especially um, in the Lower East Side in my district and also Council Member Rivera's district, when the East River Park is going under resiliency efforts, um, people need uh, to go to another park, need to go totally. to Governor's Island, and we want to yeah. make sure that they have direct access um, yeah. Yeah. with the ferry service. So that's, that's one thing that is really important immediately. Yeah. Um, the other question that I, I want to raise is that I've heard from the public and constituents about the, the overall density. Mm -hmm. um, the, the level of density, um, what we heard back is that because they're comparatively, looks like it's a lot. I mean, it is, mm -hmm. the buildings are taller. Even you're talking about 250 feet, that's like 25 story building. Mm -hmm. uh, on the island, and and with that, the justification or the the talk has always been, well, this is also um, important for financial self sufficiency. So I guess if you can address that issue. Mm -hmm. Like what what's the need for that kind of um, density in terms of the bulk of the height, um, and how that financial self sustainability. Um, 
how is that goal uh, outlined in this uh, in this proposed special district? Uh, sure. Thanks, Council Member. Um, yeah, I think we've, we've really approached it through a few ways because, you know, it's not a simple question and we want to give it a lot of care and thought over the years working closely with DCP as well. Um, you know, I would I would remind that it does it does sound like a lot. It is also spread out over 33 acres. It can sometimes be hard to have a sense of the scale of the island when you come and visit, but it's equivalent to the half, like basically if you took, took Governor's Island as a map and plopped it onto Manhattan, it would run from the foot of the Brooklyn Bridge down to um, the Staten Island Ferry Terminal all the way to Broadway. So it's, it's a very large space. Um, and the effective FAR, as Jack pointed out, is below a three. That's less than what Cornell Tech is by way of example. It's, it's less than really every comparable in New York City we could look at. Um, you know, all that said onto the specifics of your question, we did look at those comparable neighborhoods. We looked at creating that sort of critical mass to enliven the island 365, as Jack was saying. And we did um, countless hours of analysis from a financial projections point of view, looking at what those um, spaces, both, adapt both adaptive reuse of the North Island buildings, plus new construction on the South Island, I should say, plus all the other sources of revenue that the island gets through the hard work of the friends and grant making through, um, you know, revenue from concessions and events, et cetera. And basically said, over time, can we get to the point where, um, you know, the island is generating more than it's taking in. Um, and this project that is the university pathway uh, does indeed sort of meet that goal and check that box. Um, we also have talked in, with the different public hearings about density. We understand it's a concern. It's an area we are, remain committed to um, discussing with you all um, uh, to ensure that you know f folks feel good about the amount that is being proposed for the island. We, we know that's an area where we have to continue to do work. Yeah, I think the concern is also um, encroachment on the open space or how do we view that open space? I had a discussion with community board one Mm -hmm. just last week and like when I talk about going from the North Island to the South Island you go through that the historic part yeah. through the through the arch and then you see this beautiful park and we just all want to, that view to be blocked right yes. so as much as possible we want to protect that that magnificent view it just reminds me of land, you know, the Wizard of Oz. Totally. <laughs> to go through and you're, yeah. So I think that's one of the concerns we heard uh, from the public. So in, in terms of the landscaping, how do we make sure yes. that that is kept intact? And also the island is very windy. And mm -hmm. because of the park, we're concerned about shadowing. Yep. And so those are the things that the public are concerned about. I mean, they go there, they want to be able to enjoy the sun, enjoy the park. And we don't want to be blown away by the wind and we don't yep. want to be, uh, you know, just always in shadow. So those are the things that we want to look at, whether whether the height and the mass um, would have effect. Yes, on, totally. on that, those aspects. Yeah, we're, we're, of course, 100 percent committed to that with you. Um, I, I would also say that, you know, one thing we didn't mention in this presentation, just sort of in the interest of time, is that when Westy designed the park whenever that was sort of coming out of the 2010 competition and, and really drew the outline of these areas that we're seeing today that are now being proposed for rezoning. They gave, I mean, hundreds of hours to consideration for exactly the issues you're talking about, which was really about views, was really about the experience in the park as those areas see new construction and also thinking through what's the experience like coming through Liggett Archway as the trees mature over time as well. Mm. And trying to position that development in a way to minimize things like shadow impact uh, and impact on, on views. And that in particular, by way of example, is why the sort of full Southern and the majority of the Western portion of the island, the park directly connects to the water. Um, so anyway, but yes, we, we will continue to work on that with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm also glad to hear about the, you know, expansion of athletic fields because that's really greatly needed not just for the harbor school uh but also you know for the all the neighborhoods in the, around the city especially for lower manhattan yes um you know all the soccer leagues and all the kids that wants to play yeah. baseball 
Absolutely. Um, touch the grass, you know, feed on the grass. Uh, yeah. That, that is really um, important. And I know that, uh, you know, we're expanding the Harvard School, and that's why the ferry service is so you yeah. know, critical because, I mean, the mayor is talking about a middle school in every borough. So I want to make sure that every borough, the kids will be able to access um, the Harvard School. Um, as easy as possible, uh, as Definitely. convenient as possible. Um, I would just go, want to say that as yeah. this is a little personal, but as someone who um, played softball in Central Park when the Central Park fields were just like literal shards of glass and dust, we are uh, very empathetic. <laughs> with those and um, in fact, Sarah and her team have already been reaching out to principals in your district and uh, council member uh, Rivera's district in order to make sure that they know about field space in preparation for the, the closure you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, uh, East River Park. And so we have a lot of teams that really are, are looking for space. I know that you talked about, um, you know, the, the climate center mm -hmm. and that education and open space are protected by the deed in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. um, so can you just expand a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the required uses, as we mentioned, there's sort of three buckets of uses that are contemplated in, in the deed, um, and each is treated a little differently. But the required uses are in perpetuity. They don't time out, and uh, they cover two topics. One is park space, and it essentially requires 40 acres of park space on the island in perpetuity. And then the other is educational space. It requires 20 acres of educational space in perpetuity. Um, Wesley, did I get anything wrong with that? Those are the correct acreages. I would just say the, the parkland requirement is in perpetuity. The educational uses are for, the, for 30 years of required use. Oh. OK, so we, we might have to look at that. How do we extend? Um, the deed on that component to make sure that, I mean, one of the fear or one of the concern I said that people are raising also is that they don't want it to all of a sudden become uh, office complex, commercial, Amazon and all that um, yeah. that can encroach upon the island. So the educational component versus a climate center, hopefully that will happen. Uh, otherwise, some higher education um, components continue to remain uh, on the island. Can you just expand on 40 acres? How much, how much is the, the park space now that's, that's there so that people have a better idea when you're talking about 40 acres of park, park land, park space? Um, Sarah, do you have that figure? Yeah, so the, um, the new park that's on the southern portion of the island that was designed by Westgate and completed really between uh, in two phases between 2014 and 2016 um, is approximately 43 acres. Um, the master plan um, incorporates all the components people know and love, Hammock Grove, Liggett Terrace, the ball fields on the South Island, the hills. Um, but when you look at the island in total, just in terms of acreage, it's a 172 acre island. And between um, the historic district and the southern portion of the island, we are home to roughly 120 acres of open space in total. Okay. And um, the open space sub area as um, through this proposed rezoning would cover the entirety of the built open space, the, the new park space uh, designed by West Aid as part of the master plan there are two portions of the original master plan that um, were not finished. There's a portion of Picnic Point that's envisioned to be um, rebuilt, as well as a tiny portion south of the Western Development Zone. All of that, um, in addition to the waterfront esplanade and then all new open space as proposed through the rezoning would be part of the open space sub area. Okay, I think we, yeah, it'd be good to get all that total up to see the amount of park space, open space. I mean, I think with open space, we have to get a little bit more specific um, mm -hmm. just to alleviate um, the issue out there. Um, that is not permanent structures or other things that can encroach on it. So if we can get down to be more specific in terms of what is allowable 
or what's restricted, I mean, that, that could be helpful. Um, Certainly. The other, the other question that it was, came up is one of the tallest part of the, the, re, the development there is a hotel and this whole issue with hotel and, and boat tail. Are you proposing a certain amount of floor area that you envision for those? Um, thanks, Margaret. We so the the zoning envelope doesn't specify a certain height for specific use. So um, you know we're not proposing that the ho a, a potential hotel be the tallest. Um, we you know what we're essentially saying is that this envelope establishes these guardrails around so much FAR, um, and that then via this future RFP process, we're going to start by securing this educational or research partner, um, and then over time expand into the other uses as well. Well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't really think that a hotel or hotels are should be part of it. I mean, especially a hotel. We have so many hotel in Lower Manhattan and also on the Brooklyn side. Um, so I just really don't see the need of having a hotel. Uh, on Governor's Island, I mean, we looked at if you have a, an educational institution or you have um, dormitories and you have you need faculty housing, I mean, we could take those into consideration. But having a, a hotel or these so-called boat tail dock on the dock, uh, I don't think that's what the public wants and in terms of what, you know, we need there. Uh, I just, want, just wanted to... Uh, you know, lay that out. Um, I know you touch on the parking and I understand that you're saying that uh, there is really use for service parking, uh, all the, all the, um, and most of them are run on electric. If they're not run on electric, how are they getting refueled? So they have to get off the island to get refueled? Or yeah. you have? Chris, go ahead. Oh, we, we do have a, um, a legacy from when the Coast Guard was on site. We do have a legacy uh, small, um, essentially f fuel gas station. It just has two pumps that's been used for operational vehicles basically since the time of the Coast Guard. It's only available for our, our vehicles. It's no one else is, is able to use it. Um, so that, that's currently what's used for our non-electric vehicles, but our intent is to transition to all, all electric over time. Okay. Um, the other and thing, Council Member, I just wanted to add too yeah. that you know we have we have heard that the hotel component is an important component of this vision for the climate center. Obviously, we remain committed to discussing that as as all issues with with you and the team. But um, when we think about this idea that we really can bring together a, a community that is talking about issues of climate, talking about um, you know issues of environmental action and sustainability and resiliency and making this a real center for that kind of activity. The idea that you can have some type of hotel accommodation on the island has really emerged as being a critical issue for those types of uses. And Claire, I would just I was going to also add that the amount we studied in our in our plan is, is less than 10% of the total development envelope. Yeah, but I, I mean, whoever comes to the climate center, I want, I don't want them to be isolated on this island either. I mean, mm -hmm. New York City has so much to offer. That's why, like, we have so many hotels mm -hmm. uh, available. So that's why it really doesn't make sense. I mean, you can go to the island and do your work, and then come back uh, and enjoy what we got to offer in Low Manhattan or in Brooklyn or other part of of the city um, that they can use up. So we, we have to, uh, I guess we can follow up with that. I just have a couple of more questions. One is that bicycle, right? I mean, Governor's Island is a great place for cyclists. So I guess the, the issue of getting the, the bicycle onto the island or having facility for people to park their bike before they get on the boat mm -hmm. and also after they get off the island, um, place for them to park the bike if they don't want to ride the bike. I mean, yeah. city bike station you, you talk about, are you also considering, you know, a, a path, a bike path? Because being mm -hmm. a, a pedestrian, bicycle and pedestrian sometimes just don't go together. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's ideal to share the road, but 
uh, it, it usually is not that safe for pedestrians. So yeah. that was one thing that I want to see in terms of having a, if you consider having a bike path um, yeah. on the we're, island. We're, um, we have pretty extensive cycling infrastructure in place today, but we also very much appreciate that's something that can and should expand um, in line with this vision. And you know, one of the things we heard as part of this public review process is the Eastern Esplanade's not wide enough. How can you accommodate people and bikes and et cetera safely? And so we did actually um, make that change and expanded it from I think the 55 feet to 70 feet. So that, that's certainly something we plan to take into account. Yeah, that's good because I think that that's something we have learned is that it definitely should be separated mm -hmm. because, you know, along with pedestrian, uh, they're walking along the Esplanade, they want to stop, they want to take pictures, they want to look at the view. <laughs> and I don't want people to get hit by bicycles from the back um, because, you know, you're walking and then somebody's, you know, honking at you or peeping at you. Uh, it's not a pleasant experience. So I think that we want to make sure that both pedestrians and cyclists um, get to enjoy the island. Yeah, and that's what is, is critical. You know? And our, you know, our belief is that visitorship to the park is going to, you know, go up as part of this project too, as we are able to open year round, as we're able to increase ferry frequency, and as you said, um, uh, ferry access locations. Uh, so yes, mitigating that potential conflict is something um, that we will address. And you also, I think early in your presentation, you did mention about commitment for space for Earth Matter and, and growth NYC so that they are part of mm -hmm. uh, the island, that they are tenants of the island. So they know that they have um, security, that they're not going to get evicted. I mean, yeah. they're going to be there and they're going to be able to expand because that's just so related to the, you know, climate solution. Yeah, we're, um, we've double, triple, quadruple checked uh, that our proposed zoning framework allows both compost, composting, excuse me, and agriculture as of right. Um, we know that that's been a sort of pain point and, and we wanted to make sure that that would not be an issue for us. And we are in conversations actively right now with both of those group groups amongst many other island partners on, as you said, long-term security on the island. So no one has to be worried, oh, what is my future here? It's in those cases, especially totally in line with the climate center vision. Great. Yeah, well, we're gonna have we're gonna continue um, the conversation and the discussion until um, try to address issues that constituents and the public have raised to us. Yes, and we will continue with that. Uh, Chair Moy, I'm gonna pass it back to you. I know that um, discussion will be ongoing until we uh, <laughs> get to a point where we can all uh, agree. Uh, so. I want to also give opportunity to other council members. Thank you so much uh, for the time, uh, Chair Moy. Thank you for the member Chin. Thank you so much. Um, I now uh, will ask our council to see if there's any other council members that have any questions for this panel. Uh, no, Chair Moy, I see no members with questions for the panel this time. Uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the Governor's Island rezoning application? Yes, uh, Chair Moya, there are approximately uh, 88 public witnesses who have signed up to speak and potentially uh, uh, additional registrations yet to come in. For members of the public here to testify, please note again that witnesses will generally be called in panels of four. If you are a member of the public who has signed up to testify on the Governor's Island rezoning proposal, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the chair recognizes you to do so. Please also note that all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you'll be removed from the meeting as a group and the next group of speakers will be introduced. Once removed, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this meeting at the New York City Council website. Uh, we will now hear first from the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer.
we should just be bringing in uh, the first speaker who will again be the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was un I was muted. Thank you very much, Chair Moya, and I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I am here to speak in opposition, although I know there's been a lot of movement in terms of some of these unresolved issues. And I thank the trust for doing that. Needless to say, I have been in hundreds of discussions and I just like everybody else, we love Governor's Island. Um, I do wanna thank you because I know that there is, according to the trust, an expansion of open space on the South Island because as you heard earlier, there's a commitment to widen the waterfront esplanade on the eastern edge, that's a big deal. And I know that um, there has also been, as you heard earlier, a commitment in the open space to have small scale park amenities and not large ones. And I thank you for the Harbor School. I know that the parents have been talking about uh, expanding into another building and the pool, I will tell you, ironically, I still want to know exactly how this pool is being paid for, because as we speak, I put in some money, capital, I'm sure that council member did also, but as we speak, the mayor's office is calling us to put more money in. So I'd like to understand who is putting in money to make this very expensive and fabulous pool uh, a reality. Um, I do have, and this is why I'm concerned, con uh, concerned about the scale development and the use groups. And I know that you have uh, put forth, uh, you know, a way to talk about uh, climate change and all those great overarching goals of increasing public access. We need financial self-sufficiency, but we're all nervous, I'll be honest with you, about doing it at the expense of the unique character of the island. And I know you heard some of this from the council member. The building that the trust is proposing would rise as high as 250 feet. And I know that there is a reduction of the maximum heights. And I know there's a lowering of the maximum base heights of all buildings to be more in line with the fabulous historic district. But uh, just like Community Board 1, I am pushing for 125 feet maximum to really reflect the scale of the historic district. Um, I do think when you see the photographs of the deck that you saw earlier, it's tall, it's 25 stories, that's a lot. And I also just wanna say one other thing that is um, of concern to me and probably only me, but when you, the council member said correctly, how do we get more, oh, how do we get more access to the island with ferry um, stop offs, which would make sense. But I just wanna be clear that the stop off that is currently there, which we've all taken many times uh, from lower Manhattan and the one from Red Hook, that they continue to be as uh, populated and as accessible and as publicized as the one at Yankee Pier, because I worry that people would end up at Yankee Pier and that would just be the commercial site. So just be aware of that. And I'm also concerned about the hotel. Um, you know, it's tall. I do think if you're an academic and um, I'm a semi-academic because I teach at Hunter, but I do know that they don't necessarily need a fancy four-star, three-star, two-star hotel. And is there something that could fit more in with the university academic uh, experience? Because I assume that this hotel will be open to the public. And I just have this vision, I'll be honest with you, of, of being, you know, people who have a lot of money coming for the weekend. And it does change the open public access of the island. Academics are fine. But I'm just saying it's, it's, a, it's a nuance. But you know what? I've been around a long time. And I know that that is what happens in a... Uh, situation where you make it so uh, private and it wouldn't be you, it would be the concierge and others pushing something that we don't want for Governor's Island. You gotta be so careful about that. And I know you need money. I think it would be helpful to have a little bit more. I know board one has asked for this in terms of the financials. How do you get to that break even point by 2050? What exactly do you need in order to get to that point? And also just, I know you've talked about all the resiliency issues, um, but I think those two should be set out a little bit more. Thank you for what you've done for Earth Matters. Um, in addition to the other ways in which you've responded to these uh, community-based organizations that are on the island, as you know, Earth Matters is uh, pleased to be uh, preserved um, and certainly there'll be an asset to the future of the island. They would like a little bit more space. I think you've heard that. 
I know you always think people want more and more and more. Earth Matters is fabulous. They want to go from half an acre to two acres to be um, responsive to the growing need with this plan. Um, I do think the climate research tenant, some don't agree with me on this. They certainly, I certainly would, would agree with you that that's the anchor of the plan, but you still have to make it clearer. I know that you have to have the plan and then the university, and I hope that CUNY would be part of this or SUNY, we have to have those public universities involved. And I know you've been talking about this. So the question is, how do you keep it as public minded as possible? Um, you have to make sure that that is the number one goal. If it's climate center, how is it diverse? How is it um, a university with CUNY and SUNY? Um, I just want to mention a couple of the things. I know that um, the issue of Community Board One review has been phenomenal. I want to thank the chair and all of the members because I know they have tried to figure out um, how to incorporate greater community input and you have certainly responded. It would be great as it has suggested that the final RFP would include um, three proposals and it would include CB1's review, but I also hope that they could have input through the Community Advisory Council into the RFP in the first place. We know that the goal of any development on Governance Island should be to enhance the unique character of the island and its uses. And I believe that the goals of the rezoning can be achieved without a major impact on the historic qualities and the pastoral qualities that make this island such a magnet for the public. And the fact that it's free and with my municipal ID, I can get on the ferry for free. That's what makes it special. It's hard to prioritize the preservation of the island along with its other goals, those public goals and the financial goals. But that's what you have to do. So I do continue to object of the proposed height of the buildings on the South Island. I hope you'll take that into consideration. But I thank you for the opportunity to testify and for your careful review of this application. You know what? This is probably the most beloved island in New York City, if not in the world. Please take care. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Borough President, for your testimony today. I want to check in with our council to see if we can call up. Uh, the first panel round? Yes. Uh, I, uh, before excusing the member of president, I see no members with uh, questions for yeah. uh, her. And we will then move to the next panel, which will include Tammy Meltzer and Lucian Reynolds, the chair and district manager, respectively, of community, Manhattan Community Board One. First speaker will be Tammy Meltzer, followed by Lucian Reynolds. I just want to take this opportunity to remind uh, the members of the public uh, that you will be given two minutes to speak. So please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms uh, has started the clock. Your time will begin now. Good morning, Chair Moya and esteemed members of the subcommittee. I am Tammy Meltzer, Chair of Manhattan Community Board One. While Governor's Island falls within our district, it's an extraordinary public resource for state and city and nation. In 1997, we testified at a congressional hearing on the future of Governor's Island that we wanted it to be kept as parkland with active, open recreational space. Further, the one thing Community Board 1 did not want to see happen was for Governor's Island to be converted into a private or semi-private area prohibiting residents, workers, and tourists from coming to the island. The sentiment has remained unchanged for over the past 24 years and was clearly demonstrated by the majority opinions presented um, in our review of the Euler. We had a public hearing November 9th with dozens of people speaking over 160 written comments with the majority opposed to the scale and density of development. We have long supported Governor's Island and in December 2020, we adopted resolution as our formal recommendation, which resulted in a no vote with conditions. Of note, the community board's vote included seven abstentions and three in opposition, who were people split between opposed to any development, opposed to some modifications, and three who voted in support. Of this, the trust has addressed two conditions fully, nine partially, and 23 have not been adjusted at all. The public's understanding of the rezoning and density was based on the 2013 environmental statement, which was 1.6 million square feet of development, close to two thirds less than the current proposal. Our resolution states the zoning must be amended to reduce density, bulk, and heights. 
Although the heights have been slightly reduced, we urge that the proposed height be capped at 125, the existing height of Liggett Hall. And this is limited in conjunction with the density reduction. The trust maintains 4.25 million square feet is required to become self-sustaining. We've not seen a detailed financial modeling of the initial plans comparative to this proposal. And the absence of the modeling for the alternative scenarios make it impossible for the public to determine the appropriateness of this proposal. Zoning is a blunt tool that cannot shape every aspect of Governor's Island. We are appreciative and hope to be involved with further engagement through the RFPs. Can I give one Thank last you. line? Thank you for the testimony today. The next speaker will be Lucian Reynolds. Your time will begin now. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. My name is Lucian Reynolds. I'm the District Manager of CB1. As Ch CB1 Chairperson Meltzer outlined the major overarching issues related to this proposal, I will address some specific issues within the zoning and the DSS GEIS, which CB1 has identified as problematic. New York City does not have a comprehensive plan. The zoning resolution serves to function as the city's plan and it is relied upon to make development predictable. While the trust proposal provides maximum accessibility for developers through the zoning, these wide parameters are problematic, make future development unpredictable and provide numerous opportunities for potential exploitative development, especially considering that both use and bulk regulations can be furthered or altered through the CPC authorizations. As CB1 Chairperson Meltzer has touched upon, there is many concerns that the plans will not actualize the way the trust intends and the already flexible uh, proposed zoning could result in exploitative development contrary to the vision. A major concern of the proposal is the management and protection of open spaces and parkland. While the open space sub area defined in the proposed zoning does not generate any zoning floor area, zoning still uses in, in structures not typically found in parks. Considered as permitted obstructions and exempt from any floor area or coverage restrictions, buildings and other structures up to 25 feet are allowed when they house permitted uses. Though the trust has made amendments to scale back the currently proposed development allowances within the open space sub area, the changes are modest and it is not enough to afford protection of what was originally intended as parkland. The zoning must redefine open space areas and open space sub areas as public parkland, including open spaces in the North Island to assure adequate protection and consistency with the deeds parkland restriction terms. The reasonable worst case development scenario is a critical aspect of the DSS GEIS and the community believes is not fully accurate. The DSS GEIS assumes there is no open development in the open space sub area, which is not a reasonable assumption as the zoning proposal does not in fact allow, does in fact allow for significant potential development. But no, no. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Now uh, I'll ask uh, our council to see if there's any council members that have any questions uh, for this panel. Chair Moya, do not appear to be any members with questions for the panel. Okay. There being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel uh, is now excused. Uh, Council, if you could please call up the uh, next panel. The next panel will include Jeffrey Chaturko, Nan Richardson, and Lenny Sparrigan. The first speaker on the panel will be Jeffrey Chaturko, uh, followed by Nan Richardson. Good time will begin. Staff and families of the Urban Sympathy New York Harbor School. There is no secret that while the New York Harbor School aims to provide this unique maritime program to New York City public school students, we have communicated for years that as a maritime school, Harbor School requires additional specific resources like a pool, additional space, appropriate funding for equipment and work-based learning opportunities. Not having these resources would be like trying to run a theater program without an auditorium and an art school without additional funding for paint. And now when Governor's Island, our home is looking to bring a climate center to the island, we couldn't be more excited to support this work. We are excited about the potential it brings to further develop our own school's growth and the potential it brings to all students in New York City. 
This vision aligns with our school's mission in educating our diverse city about climate change while continuing our restoration work around the New York Harbor with our students and staff alongside the Billion Oyster Project. Simultaneously, this initiative creates an opportunity to open the island to the public for the entire year. Most of our school year from October 31st to May 1st, the island is closed to the public and only open to a small number of tenants. This amounts to only having the island open for four, to ten, for four of the 10 months that school is in session. This creates an unrealistic environment for our students as well as provides difficulties with logistical challenges to running a vibrant school on a closed island. It is our hope that the Climate Center on Governor's Island will be a needed opportunity to grow and align our work with the city's need to increase maritime education and climate restoration development for New York City students. This will, direct, this will directly impact the ability in providing equitable opportunities for our diverse city population to be better represented in the maritime industry. The addition of a climate center on Governor's Island supports New York City public school students, our unique career and technical education programming, and it helps in breaking down the barriers towards diversity in the maritime industry by providing all New York City students the opportunity to engage with the university and or research center that inhabits the proposed climate center. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next, we will hear from Nan Richardson followed by Lenny Sparrigan. Good time, we'll begin now. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Nam Richardson. I'm chair of the PTA SEAC, School Advocacy and Expansion Committee. And let me just say, we're thrilled to hear that the trust, the SEA and the DOE have just given us building 515 on Governor's Island so that at long last, this school has the chance to have the facilities needed to fulfill its core mission. This has been a decade long effort for us um, through five chancellors and three mayors to try to argue that this school overcrowded, um, unscreened, a 69% minority school, which is a flag we fly proudly, um, deserves the ability to finally fulfill its mission. So today, um, since the time limits really, you know, make it difficult to say very much more. Um, I'd like to tell you the story, but many of you have already heard it about the Harbor School's you know, role and, and long path here. But um, hundreds of dedicated parents have really tried to make this clear over the last five years. So today I just wanna thank our redoubtable council member, Margaret Chen, and her able first lieutenant, Gigi Lee, who guided us through this labyrinth to SEA and Lorraine Gorillo and the trust president, Claire Newman and Sarah Krautheim. And we're forever grateful to Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and Senator Brian Kavanaugh, who supported us with council and funding, and hopefully more funding, I hear Gail. <laughs> and um, also to Speaker Johnson, who believed in us and gave us a million dollars in 2019 as evidence of that belief. Also to Congressman Nadler, Senator Gillibrand, Congressman Velasquez, um, Assemblywoman Yuli Neo, who's herself a champion swimmer, so she understood the, the, what was at stake. Former Senator Velman at Montgomery, Constroller Stringer, Senator Adababo, Assembly Members Lou and Glick, Council Members Levin, Matteo, Borelli, Ulrich, and incalculable support from CB1, especially Trisha Joyce and Tammy Meltzer, and CB2 and CB6 Brooklyn. Now, much work remains to be done in the future construction of 515 and the future of the island in planning, which we hope to have a voice in as a city facing climate change. But today, let me just sail, share a sailor's wish from harbor, fair winds, and following seas to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker on the panel will be Lenny Sparrigan. Your time will begin now. Hi, my name is Lenny Sparrigan. I'm the professional diving instructor at the New York Harbor School. And before that, I was a professional diver in New York Harbor. I'd just like to explain why investing in the marine and maritime education now is more imperative than ever. The city has almost a hundred, excuse me, over 1,100 miles of coastline. We call it the sixth borough. And while it's known that visible infrastructure of New York City has been eroded, it's less known that the underwater infrastructure has also been neglected for over a century. Because we don't have enough diving experts to do the job, we're importing divers from the Gulf of Mexico. And as soon as it starts getting cold, they flee back to the Gulf of Mexico. We also have, we've surpassed Seattle as the number one city in America with commuting by sea, with water taxis that crisscross the rivers. 
the lifeguards that guard the 52 pools and dozens of beaches in New York are being imported from Eastern Europe on a special visa. We don't have enough New Yorkers to fill those jobs. With only 14% of the 400,000 jobs and 99 million, 99 billion connected with the Port of New York, the large Eastern Seaboard are held by New Yorkers. The need for trained maritime and marine experts is huge and growing. Nothing really emphasizes the dire nature of this, this, this whole uh, the whole scenario we're facing is the climate change you guys had referenced earlier. Right now, our school is fulfilling a job, creating divers, creating captains for what we need to help New York. The Billion Oyster Project is helping clean up the harbor. We can't tell you how much you're gonna appreciate what we can bring to the party. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny, for your testimony today. Chair, that was the final speaker on this panel. Okay. Um, are there any council members uh, that have any questions uh, for the panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions. Okay, there being uh, no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, council, if you can please call up uh, the next panel. The next panel will include Alexander Pincus, Lily Chopra, Sean Connell, Janie Vavishi, and Pete Malinowski. The first speaker on this panel will be Alexander Pincus, followed by Lily Chopra, and then Sean Connell. Your time will begin now. Hello. Alexander, whenever you're ready. Hi there, good morning. My name is Alexander Pincus. I'm an architect and restaurateur based in New York City. My brother and I are the proprietors of Island Oyster, a full service waterfront restaurant on Governor's Island, which opened in 2017. We've been operating during the island's six month public season ever since, including during the pandemic. We also own and operate a number of other waterfront restaurants in New York City public parks, including Grand Banks, Drift Inn, and pilot in both in Hudson River Park and in Brooklyn Bridge Park. And in a volunteer capacity, I serve alongside Pete Malinowski on the board of directors of the Billion Oyster Project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to restoring oyster reefs in New York Harbor through public education initiatives. As the owner of an independent business on Governor's Island, I have been an early believer in its potential as a tremendous public destination in New York City. Governor's Island gives you the space and opportunity not only to escape everyday life, but to reflect back on the rest of the city and appreciate its past, its enormity, and its possibilities. The first time I visited the island, I could not believe that I had lived in New York for 20 years and had not been there. Since then, it had become a cherished destination for me and my family. My brother was married there in the hills overlooking the Statue of Liberty. My son loves to circumnavigate the island by scooter and just lay in the open grass. And of course, I love to cap off a weekend with a nice cocktail along the water overlooking New York Harbor. We're proud to have played a significant goal, role in the island's transformation, drawing thousands of visitors to experience its rich history, extraordinary park, and unique connection to New York Harbor. However, we believe that Governor's Island has untapped potential. Currently, the island is only open between May and October, with the last ferry typically departing for lower Manhattan between six and seven. This does not leave much time for your everyday New Yorker to visit the island after work during the week. More activity on Governor's Island will allow the trust to deliver on increased connectivity through ferry service. This incredible place should be- Time has expired. You can, you can wrap it up right now if you'd like, Alexander. Sure. Uh, this incredible place should be way more accessible to everyday New Yorkers. We're excited about the island's future and we encourage you to support their project. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Lily Chopra and then Sean Connell. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Lily Chopra. I'm the executive director of artistic programs at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, known as LMCC. 
And as one of the first anchor tenants of Governor's Island, LMCC is in favor and pleased to see an achievable proposal come together to provide the trust for Governor's Island with a forward-looking plan to become economically sustainable and thrive for the long term. The plan outlines a holistic vision centered on sustainability and equity. The Climate Solutions Center at the southern end of the island will create pipeline for equitable job and educational opportunities in the city, enabling the trust to expand the island's public parkland and build upon its existing framework of cultural and environmental programming. The plan provides opportunities for creating critical infrastructure that allow more diverse New Yorkers access to an increasingly broad range of public opportunities and uses on Governor's Island, including the Art Center. Finally, the proposal provides the trust with financial support to maintain the island as a year-round destination for all New Yorkers. LMCC was among the first inaugural partners to redefine the island as a cultural destination back in 2010. And it is a testament that the long-term vision of the trust that its year-round tenants included the Harbor School and our arts organization dedicated to connecting, serving and making space for artists and local communities with programs focused on sustainability. We see the trust future plan for building scientific research and public engagement on the southern end of the island as fully intertwined and aligned with the island's current mixed use of focus on the environmental stewardship. We are optimistic that the trust rezoning plan ensures Governor's Island as a cultural treasure, allowing it to grow into a truly vibrant, sustainable year long community for and composed of all New Yorkers. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, for your testimony today. Next, we will hear from Sean Connell and then Janie Bavishi and then Pete Malinowski. The time will begin now. Hi, my name is Sean Connell, and I'm the program manager for Grow NYC's Teaching Garden on Governor's Island. We're a one acre urban farm and environmental education space that hosts free field trips each year for thousands of New York City public school students and summer camp participants. We give young people the opportunity to plant and water and harvest and cook the garden's wide array of vegetables, herbs, and fruits. Um, we've been doing this work on the island for the past eight years in close partnership with the Trust for Governors Island. I'm speaking in support of the proposal to attract a climate uh, center for climate solutions to Governors Island. Uh, the proposed climate center aligns with Grow NYC's mission to improve our city's quality of life through environmental programs that empower all New Yorkers to secure a clean and healthy environment for future generations. Uh, the proposed climate center presents an exciting opportunity to expand learning, skills training, and public programming related to one of the most pressing issues of our time, all in a prime environment for research and public, public art and cultural programming and public engagement. Grow NYC's teaching garden is situated in the proposed redevelopment zone. And while we do love our current location, we look forward to the opportunity to continue our teaching garden in a new parcel on the island. We are also speaking today in support of finding a new parcel for Earth Matter, whose composting facility is also situated in the proposed redevelopment zone, and who are key partners in our joint commitment to food scrap collection and zero waste. We're eager to continue to work with the trust and our other partners on Governor's Island to continue to make the island a valuable resource in the fight against the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for the testimony today. The next speaker is Janie Bavishi and then Pete Malinowski. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Janie Bavishi and I am the director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. My office is responsible for ensuring that New York City and its residents are prepared to withstand and emerge stronger from the multiple impacts of climate change now and into the future. This is no small task. New York City has over 520 miles of coastline. As Hurricane Sandy tragically demonstrated, many of our coastal neighborhoods are vulnerable to flooding caused by storm surge. New York City also faces additional flood risk from extreme rainfall, which can impact inland areas in, additional to coastal, in, in addition to coastal ones. Finally, many New York City neighborhoods face high risk from extreme heat. These risks are especially severe in the South Bronx, Central Brooklyn, and Northern Manhattan. 
Since 2012, the city has invested more than $20 billion to make our city stronger and more resilient. These investments include over a dozen large scale coastal resiliency projects, as well as countless other efforts spanning from restoring wetlands to painting millions of square feet of rooftop rooftops with reflective white coatings to provide resiliency uh, to providing resiliency grants to small businesses that were impacted by Sandy. Despite this progress, much more remains to be done. Climate adaptation is both a sprint and a marathon. As we work to deliver flood and heat protections as quickly as possible, we're also planning for our long-term challenges and needs. As long as the world remains addicted to fossil fuels, we will have to continually find new ways to manage growing threats. For this reason, climate adaptation will be an important function of governments for decades to come. This proposed rezoning of Governor's Island is one important component of how we're preparing for the future. Creating a climate uh, center for climate solutions on Governor's Island would allow New York City to leverage our considerable climate adaptation expertise to attract some of the brightest minds and most innovative companies in the world. Gathering these people and enterprises in New York Harbor would generate powerful new ideas, policies, and technologies that could be deployed across the five boroughs and around the globe. Also, this rezoning would all, it bring also bring significant economic benefits that are especially important in this time of economic certainty and hardship. This proposal is projected to create 8,000 direct new jobs and $1 billion in economic Your impact. Your time has expired. Thank you. Were you wrapping up there? Can you wrap it up in, in, in 10 seconds? I'll give you that, there you go. Uh, thank you. The challenges we face are urgent. Addressing them will require creativity, innovation, and collaboration. Moving ahead with this rezoning is one vitally important step toward developing the solutions we need to create a safer, stronger, and more prosperous future for New York City. Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker on this panel will be Pete Malinowski. Time will begin now. Hi, thanks. Thanks so much for having me and hearing this briefly. Um, I'm also here to speak in support of the Trust for Governor's Island proposal for the for Governor's Island. I've been working on Governor's Island since 2008 and then starting 2010 as a teacher at the New York Harbor School and now as executive director of Billion Oyster Project. So I've been going out the island every day since 2010. And we work to restore oyster reefs through public education initiatives. So it's all about getting the public engaged in restoring New York Harbor. We do that citywide and our work on Governor's Island is dependent on the location of Governor's Island in the center of the harbor and access to the water. And so for, uh, for us and our work with the New York Harbor School, seeing a proposal for Governor's Island that leverages the unique location of Governor's Island and takes advantage of the access to water is, is very encouraging. Um, additionally, part of our, we see part of our mission to connect uh, public school students in New York City with real growing careers uh, based around New York's maritime experience. And there's obviously a huge opportunity with climate change preparedness and proactive planning for New York City's future to, to create all these new jobs around in the climate space. And so having that direct connection, to education, and workforce development right on Governor's Island for Harbor School students and other students around, around the harbor is very exciting. Um, additionally, as a small, we're a nonprofit, but as a small business operating on Governor's Island, the, the islands, you know, our, our business would be um, a lot more effective and easier if there was a, uh, you know, better access to the island. And so seeing a plan for Governor's Island that allows for enhanced public access from, for New Yorkers all across the city to the island is very exciting. So given that the, the, the plan leverages the location of the island, takes advantage of these blue green careers that are coming along and allows us to continue doing our work as we have been building oyster projects here to support the- Your time has expired. Almost got it in there. Support the proposal. I wrapped up. <laughs> All right. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel and I do not see any members with questions for the panel. Okay, thank you. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. And council, if you can, please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Marissa D. Dominicis, Chris Amatitla, Anita Chan, and Stacy Vasquez. The first speaker will be Marissa D. Dominicis.
The time will begin now. Dear Council, can you hear us? Uh, yes, am I ready to go? Yep, whenever you're ready. I'm ready, thank you. Okay. Dear Council members, good afternoon. I'm Marissa, co founder, director of Earth Matter, a stakeholder who will need relocation based on the proposed ULERP. In 2008, I worked to create Land Trust Operations Committee for 64 New York City gardens. I advocated for compost workshops and met with resistance and, re and pushback from garden leaders who said their members were not interested in composting. 10 years later, one of these leaders asked if I would be a keynote speaker at their annual garden convention focused on composting. Last Friday, the Parks Department Green Thumb told us Earth Matters Spring Compost Apprenticeship had such a demand we would host they asked if we would host a second apprenticeship this fall. Council member, the number of foot soldiers who have shifted and who now support composting as a climate mitigation solution is a rapidly growing force. We believe in and we trust the trust proposal for climate study. It's a great fit for our work. The trust has shown incredible commitment to our zero waste island collaborations and to the New York City community composting. And we're excited to take the first step with the trust tomorrow to explore the relocation of where potentially earth matter can be relocated in the southern development zone. Our expectations, however, are tempered by example of what the city has supported and committed to so far as land use for community scale composting. The Lower East Side Ecology Center's compost yard is, has been a part of the East River's redevelopment map plan, but it's not a dot on the map. And it's hard for Earth Matter to raise funds for a stable future when our physical home base of 1.5 acres, an acre and a half, is uncertain. We humbly request that the council close the gap from an exploratory conversation. Your time has expired. Can I just finish one sentence? Yep. To a definitive, definitive designated space that will preserve Earth Matters ability to assist in the trust goals and to serve the people of New York. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Chris Amatitla, followed by Anita Chan. Hi, uh, my name is, oh, I'm sorry about that. All right, whenever you're ready, Chris. I'm ready. Okay. Hi, my name is Chris Amatitla. I am a New York Harbor School alumni Marine Affairs alumni, and I work for Earth Matter. Relocating Earth Matter is an interesting choice. It is like placing a majestic beast in a confined enclosure. It's like they won't be able to roam free and do as they please. Now, I'm more than positive that there is I'm positive that there's two reasons that Earth Matter is capable of doing so many things. Their educational outreach is phenomenal. I, as a student, was affected by it. And what started as an after-school program is now a source of income as a young adult. Um, relocating Earth Matter to the north part of the island is, is odd. It's like, why would we place a facility next to office buildings and a public high school and other locations like the parks, like the park department? Earth Matter deserves to have two acres of land so that they can do the work that you do, where they could have resident New York City residents, food services come to their island and offload without having to disturb the, uh, the workflow of these other locations. Um, that's about it. Okay, thanks, Chris. Yeah. Thank you for your testimony today. Next, we will hear from Anita Chan, followed by Stacy Vasquez. Good time will begin. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Anita Chan and I am the coordinator of the Zero Waste Island Initiative on Governor's Island. 
This initiative is a partnership between the Trust for Governors Island and Earth Matter New York with the goal of reducing the island's exported waste to zero. Through this initiative and the space that we operate in, we are able to educate the public, island partners, island staff, students, aspiring resource managers, and climate activists. And we provide training opportunities on zero waste practices, sustainable waste management, composting, and much more. All of the island generated organic waste is processed into compost at our compost dining center right on the island. And we use the compost to grow food on our soil star farm, nourish the governor island landscapes and give back to the larger New York City community as well. What we do actively helps to combat climate change and it offers a closed loop model that can be explored elsewhere. We've had so much success in the past years with the immense support of the trust and we want to be able to continue this partnership. I want to thank the trust for confirming that Earth Matter and other partners will not be displaced, but the next step is to ensure that we, we do get this adequate space. We need to operate in, in a capacity to meet the needs of the community and to address the urgent crisis um, uh, in, around climate change. We need the space for our compost sorting center, our soil stock farm, um, organic waste collection depot, sorting space, and space for processing all of the organic waste. I ask that the city council vote to designate two acres of permanent space in the development zone for Earth Matter uh, to operate in years to come. And because we really want to ensure that we can continue our collaborations with the trust. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The last speaker on this panel will be Stacy Vasquez. Your time will begin. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Hi, my name is Stacy Vasquez. I'm a founding member of Island B Project. Uh, we've been providing programming, teaching the public about the importance of preserving pollinators on Governor's Island. Um, and throughout New York City since 2016. Um, today, I would like to express how important it is that Earth Matter is provided with the two acres of permanent land needed to maintain its operations. Earth Matter gave us our first beekeeping space in New York City. And the work we've been able to do because of Earth Matter's generosity has been impactful for us and the residents of New York City. To say this would be an absolute understatement teaching New York City's family about the benefits of compost and food waste and its multiple benefits is absolutely essential to its residents. As our city grows, teaching zero waste principles can only improve the quality of life our residents experience. On top of that, the opportunity to get outside, experience nature, tend to chickens, walk baby goats, and experience honeybee importance is an invaluable experience that Earth Matter has provided individuals and families since its beginnings. The Trust for Governors Island has always been amazingly supportive of ours and Earth Matters efforts. All right, thank you so much for listening to my testimony and we really appreciate the time taken to address this important matter. And thank you everybody for your continued support of all of our projects. We really appreciate you and um, Governors Island as a whole. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Council, do we have uh, any questions uh, for these panelists? Uh, no, Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Thank you. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Merritt Birnbaum, Bruce Monroe, Marissa Williams, and Robert Pirani. We'll hear first from Merritt Birnbaum and then Bruce Monroe. Your yeah, time will begin now. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Merritt Birnbaum, Executive Director of the Friends of Governors Island. Our primary mission is to support expanded public access to and increased enjoyment of this extraordinary place. We strongly support the proposed rezoning. The trust proposal represents the culmination of more than 20 years of collaborative community-based planning that was initiated by our predecessor organization, the Governor's Island Alliance. At, since the mid nineties, we brought together hundreds of conservationists, urban planners, park managers, community members to envision a future for the island and 
every plan has always included responsible mixed use development in support of public use and public benefit. Right now, as we speak, Governor's Island's spectacular new park is beginning to bloom, but no one is there to enjoy it. More than 1 million square feet of historic buildings are unheated, lacking occupants, and falling into greater disrepair. And the two land parcels on the South Island are fenced off and filled with crumbling warehouses. In a city starved for space, this is a real tragedy. The reason that the island is empty right now is because Governor's Island is much more than a park and a historic district. As the owner and operator, the trust is wholly responsible for running public transportation network, public utility system, public marine infrastructure, public facilities maintenance, and public parkland. And access to the park is not possible without all of the above mentioned services, and those services are not possible without significant revenue. Currently, they only have a bare minimum to keep the island going six months a year, and as their fundraiser, we know firsthand how difficult it is and how challenging it would be to use private philanthropy to fill that enormous gap in making the island a year-round public resource. Uh, the proposed rezoning will increase the ferry service and connectivity to serve more New Yorkers. It will also allow for expanded amenities to support other long-envisioned public uses, such as education, arts, and the culture, and limited commercial activity. We strongly urge you to approve the rezoning. Thank you. Bruce Monroe will be the next speaker, followed by Marissa Williams. Your time will begin now. Uh, thank you uh, for letting me testify today. Uh, as a volunteer for uh, the Friends of Governors Island for the last 10 years, since 2001, I've been working with visitor services and conducting walking tours on the island. And it's been my great pleasure to see the trust uh, process for, for planning and, and, uh, uh, and development on the island unfold. It's been a great education for me and I, I support their, their plans to proceed. In a perfect world, the South Island would be a beautiful, resilient public space and all the buildings in the historic district would be repurposed for use by nonprofit organizations and educational organizations and generously funded by the city, state and federal government. But uh, that's not gonna happen. That's not possible in the current political and economic climate. Uh, it would be logical, I guess. Uh, a lot of the visitors seem to think so. Uh, there's a lot of pushback. Uh, it, a success of their, their public engagement is that there's such a great community investment in what happens on Governor's Island. But I think it would be a mistake right now to restrict uh, the zoning and restrict the development uh, and, and impede the further access to the island year round. And the, the key to unlocking the potential of the historic buildings is to, to open up access all year round and get those development zones in play and bringing in uh, uh, money to support the island as soon as possible. Year round access is key to all that happening. I, I firmly believe that. Uh, even though I started out not thinking that was the case. I thought that they should fix up the old buildings first, but I think they should move on and do it all at once and get, get the process going and complete it. So I have faith uh, in the trust. I trust in the trust that their plan moving forward will, uh, will play out and, and keep the island, uh, the beautiful, uh, put, and unlock its potential for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker will be Marissa Williams, and then followed by Robert Pirani. Um, good afternoon. Oh, sorry. Oh, you can begin whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Moya and members of the committee. My name is Marissa Williams, and I am here as a representative for 32BJ. I'm here on behalf of the 85,000 building service workers 32BJ represents in New York City to express our support for this rezoning. Uh, the Trust for Governors Island and the city have asked to rezone the South Island section to allow for the development of a Center for Climate Solutions for the study of climate change. The rezoning would unlock up to 4.2 million square feet of space and create over 8,000 jobs. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service union representing thousands of property service workers across the city. We maintain, clean, and provide services, um, security services in buildings like the ones being discussed on Governor's Island. A development of this size will permanently be 
staffed by almost 120 commercial cleaners and over 50 security officers. We are pleased that the trust has made an early commitment to establishing prevailing wage jobs. The proposed project would provide permanent income and would give opportunity for upward mobility, security, and dignity to working class families. It is also an opportunity to support climate change in the city while creating more than 1 billion in economic impact. Uh, the 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the city. 32BJ has thousands of members who live or work in Community District 1. We know that this development on Governor's Island will continue to uphold the industry standard and provide opportunities for working families to thrive in New York City. On behalf of 32BJ SEIU, I respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. The last speaker on the panel will be Robert Pirani. New time will begin. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Robert Pirani. I'm a um, I'm the former founding executive director of the Governor's Island Alliance and currently a board member of its successor, the Friends of Governor's Island. My testimony today, which is in favor of the proposed rezoning, is based on more than 25 years of experience planning and advocating for this beloved resource. The island today is home to an extraordinary park and it's enjoyed by almost 1 million visitors each summer. Successive city administrations in this council really deserve much credit for transforming this once off limits federal facility to an extraordinary public place that I think is beloved by everyone who is going to speak here today. But that progress to date is only a partial fulfillment of the island's promise. The shared vision for the island has always included new mixed use development in the service of the public interest. Um, making space available for new construction within the narrowly defined development parcels on the South Island will help solve the island's infrastructure problems. And I'll, it'll, the zoning process uh, and, and passage of the zoning will both uh, will define allowable uses and establish what can be built, what, built where. Important guidance and a measure of certainty for a real estate market that to date has not been willing to make needed investments on the island despite multiple RFPs over the decades. The mix of uses proposed under the zoning, education, hospitality and conference uses and offices reflect two decades worth of planning studies and they are precisely aligned with the terms of the federal deed restrictions. Of course, uh, the council should take this opportunity to ensure that appropriate guardrails are in place. The final zoning should pay special attention to the design guidelines, to view and pedestrian corridors and to park to Esplanade connection points that can reinforce the island's current campus-like atmosphere. Public investments in the island's parkland and historic district must also be protected. But now is the time to ensure the governor's island is truly integrated with the fabric of the city. The proposed rezoning can help make that happen. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, now I'd like to um, ask our council if there's uh, any council members that have any questions for this panel. No, Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, there being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And if the council can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Carrie Oceans, Christine Dats Romero, Gwen Ossenfort, and Brenda Platt. First speaker will be Carrie, Carrie Oceans, followed by Christine Dats Romero. It's time to begin. Hi, thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify today. My name is Carrie Oceans. I am the Associate Director of the U.S. Composting Council. The U.S. Composting Council is a national organization working on building the nation's composting infrastructure and growing the use of compost for the multiple environmental and economic benefits they bring, not least of which is helping to combat climate change by avoiding landfilling and sequestering carbon in healthy soils. The USCC supports the vision of a Center for Climate Solutions on Governor's Island, but we must oppose the proposed rezoning only because on the face of it does not appear to allow for the continued presence and operation of the Earth Matter New York Composting Education and Operations Center. In my job, I've had the opportunity to visit many compost education centers all over the country. And I can tell you that the Earth Matter New York Center is really one of the best anywhere. By combining home and community scale operations, providing educational opportunities for kids and adults, they're helping to build awareness and competence around, around reducing food waste, 
developing climate resilient soils and growing and eating nutritious food. We support residential and commercial composting and organic collection at both the community and industrial scales throughout New York City and hope this preservation of Earth Matters, New York's community, uh, New York, Earth Matter New York's composting can serve as a bellwether in the fight to preserve and expand community composting around the city. Two acres of land all in one place, preferably on the southeastern tip of the Eastern Development Zone is critical and required for Earth Matter to continue its compost operations and public programming that support and promote composting sustainable practices for the people of New York. I was pleased to hear the trust commitment to Earth Matter earlier in this hearing and look forward to seeing that commitment spelled out in future revisions of the zoning proposal. By preserving two acres of continuous land on Earth Matter, for Earth Matter New York, the trust and New York City will be demonstrating their true commitment to a zero waste island. Time has expired. And a climate resilient future for both the residents and visitors of this beautiful island. Thank you. The next speaker will be Christine Datz Romero, followed by Gwen Osport. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Christina Datz Romero, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I'm testifying today on behalf of Save Our Compost uh, Coalition, which is a group of um, organizations uh, to save our compost in New York City while uplifting environmental and climate justice. Um, uh, we are testifying today against the proposed ULOP for Governor's Island because it does not include a long-term designated space for Earth Matter New York, one of our coalition members in the proposed redevelopment zone. The Save Our Campus Coalition firmly believes that community-based composting programs belong in public open space. And while we support the proposed proposal by the uh, Trust of Governors Island to create a center to address and study climate change, we would like to uh, ensure that the ULOP explicitly provides two acres of space for Earth Matters Campus Learning Center to ensure that the important work of Earth Matter on Governors Island, which began in 2009, will continue. Right now, small community-driven compost sites are the backbone of the sanitation department's newly restored food scrap recycling program. It's really the only program left right now for New, New Yorkers to practice uh, this climate-friendly uh, daily habit of composting. Without robust uh, composting programs, even more recyclable organic waste is being hauled to landfills and incinerators. And that, again, goes against the zero waste vision that uh, Governor Island and Earth Matter uh, developed together. By allocating space for Earth Matter, you will not only ensure that all New Yorkers continue to have opportunities to benefit from the educational programs offered by Earth Matter, preserve a unique closed loop system as part of zero waste uh, island vision, but also allow us to move forward in the urgent fight against the climate crisis. Composting is part of uh, the climate solution. Please ensure that Earth Matter is able to continue the decade long programs on, long, on Governor's Island. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Gwen Ossenfort, followed by Brenda Platt. Your time will begin now. Hello, my name is Gwen Ossenfort. Thank you for accepting my testimony. I am the operations manager and a hauler at Reclaimed Organics. Reclaimed Organics is a micro hauler for compost in Manhattan. We pick up food scraps from residents, offices, and storefront businesses from 110th Street all the way down to Battery Park City, east to west. We use only electric assist cargo trikes that can haul 600 pounds of material at a time. As a hauler, I can attest that this work is incredibly empowering because it is crucial to waste reduction in the city. Our tiny company is diverting tons of food scraps from landfills every year, reducing methane emissions, and creating hearty, nutrient-rich, worm-loving compost. And who doesn't love worms? One of our closest partners in this work is Earth Matter on Governor's Island. Earth Matter accepts almost half a ton of food scraps from us each week. This material is processed at their site on Governor's Island, and this is the embodiment of the closed loop system. New Yorkers put their food scraps in their buckets. We collect the buckets. Earth Matter turns it into compost. Closed loop means that nothing is wasted. 
Nothing is thrown away, everything is reused or recycled. Closed loop systems are climate positive, human positive and city positive. With support from the TGI, Earth Matter is already teaching climate science on Governor's Island at the Compost Learning Center. If you think about it, how better to demonstrate climate, how better to demonstrate commitment to climate issues, impact and assessment than to house the actual embodiment of climate change mitigation in a thriving compost processing site. It's all right there already happening. Why displace it? Two acres of contiguous outdoor space for a living, breathing compost facility that processes the food scraps of New York City within New York City for use in New York City is the prototype of a closed loop system. It's hyper-local, it's smart, and if the city truly embraces zero waste goals, and that's not just lip service. Earth, time Matter, time. Earth Matter Compost Learning Center and processing site at Governor's Island should be the cornerstone of New York City's current and future zero waste initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen, for your testimony. And the last speaker on this panel will be Brenda Platt. Your time will begin. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm testifying testifying in opposition because Earth Matters request to set aside two acres of the proposed 33 acre development zone for its operations has yet to be formally incorporated. Uh, my name is Brenda Platt and I direct the composting program at the National Nonprofit Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And I can tell you unequivocally that Earth Matter is one of the best community composting sites in the country. And it has served as an inspiring model for numerous programs across the US. We held our national cultivating community comp composting conference in New York City in 2019, which included a full day training at Earth Matters Composting and Education Center. Now, I just want to tell you community composting is essential and it brings countless benefits. It provides low cost composting infrastructure, educates and directly engages with food waste generators on what, why and how to compost. And it demonstrates firsthand why compost is important for sustaining our food systems, enhancing soils and how urban green spaces are directly tied to our well-being. And as others have said, it builds local resilience to climate change. Earth Matter does all this and more, given the role of healthy soil in acting as a carbon sink, uh, Earth Matters operations align perfectly with the planned Center for Climate Solutions. I urge the Committee on Land Use and the Trust for Governors Island, of course, to help Earth Matter secure a long-term two-acre space, either through zoning or a council requirement that its operations be included in the development RFP. It does sound like the trust is committed to supporting Earth Matter, and I hope that commitment includes a clear long-term commitment to the two-acre space. Earth Matter needs the adequate space dedicated for its operations and to accommodate growth on the island. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. Do we have any council members with any questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions. There being none, uh, there being no more questions for this panel, this witness panel is now excused. Uh, council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Marcel Negret, Emily Walker, Catherine Heinz, and Laura Colacursio. The first speaker on the panel will be Marcel Negret and then Emily Walker. Your time will begin now. Do we have Marcel ready? I can see Marcel uh, just getting his audio ready, perhaps. Hello, is Marce my microphone working? Oh, now we yes, can thank you. Oh, sorry, it took me a while to unmute it. Uh, thank you, my name is Marcel Negret. I'm a senior planner at the Regional Plan Association. Uh, we're pleased to provide comments in support of the proposed rezoning and creation of the South Island Special District. RPA played a major role in the transformation of Gardner's Island 
uh, throughout the mid-90s, RPA led and incubated the Governor's Island Alliance, a coalition of more than 45 organizations dedicated to transforming the island from an abandoned Coast Guard base into an urban park. The, the alliance later evolved into the current Friends of Governor's Island. Uh, RPA celebrates important milestones that have transformed Governor's Island, but we also recognize that there's more work needed before completing the vision that was developed over two decades ago. Um, the framework that the Trust has outlined, and which is under current consideration, will improve the conditions of 34 acres of underutilized land which within the southern section of the island, space which is today mostly a collection of vacant non-historic buildings and warehouses. Um, the proposed plan includes publicly spirit uses, including education, recreation, and hospitality, which have always been the basis for the island's transfer to city control. Future development on the island would generate revenue to maintain civic spaces and infrastructure and ensure year-round year vitality. Not only will establishing a world-class climate center put New York at the forefront of climate adaptation innovation, but the trust plan would substantially enhance the public space benefits of the island for New Yorkers. This proposal will increase public connections between the park and waterfront esplanade, enhancing the experience for active and passive recreation users. It will also go a long way towards securing the long-term financial security of the island, freeing up the city to devote funding to parks and public rail improvements in neighborhoods across boroughs that are in need of such funding. With the stoning framework, Governor's Island Trust is taking another bold step towards fulfilling the goals envisioned by the coalition nearly 20 years ago. As New York Harbor continues to become a flashpoint for the impact of climate change, RPA plus and trust decision, of moving ahead with the planning inspired. effort. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Emily Walker and then Catherine Heights. All right, thank you. My name is Emily Walker and I am the Director of Outreach and Programs at New Yorkers for Parks. Thank you for allowing us to submit comment today on the Governor's Island rezoning. NY4P testify, testifies in support of this proposed action. With a mission to be self-sustaining for the long term, the proposed rezoning will help allow for the development needed to ensure that Governor's Island can become a year-round destination and remain a, remain a vital open space asset for New Yorkers for years to come. We are pleased to note that the rezoning will now bring 9.85 additional acres of open space to Governor's Island, bringing the total acreage of public open space on the island to 55.85 acres. Given the challenges in identifying land for new open space development throughout the city, this is a welcome opportunity to provide more public space for New Yorkers to enjoy. Additionally, the proposed rezoning would help Governor's Island become a year-round destination, which would allow for more robust and regular utilization of the island. This goal has become all the more critical in light of the COVID crisis and the need for New Yorkers to have ample access to parks and open space as safe places to gather, recreate, and seek respite during this challenging time. We expect this rezoning to bring a reliable funding stream to provide for the maintenance and operations of Governor's Island, as well as vital investments in the transportation infrastructure that allows for ongoing and increased public use of and access to the island. We encourage the trust to remain committed to free transport for NYCHA residents and low-income New Yorkers and hope that the rezoning can be a way to secure the funding to ensure that all New Yorkers, regardless of zip code or income, can have access to Governor's Island. Additionally, we encourage the trust to take into serious consideration all feedback from the public process to ensure that the development this rezoning will bring will be approached in a thoughtful manner and one that is appropriately scaled to the island and its open spaces. The building height and mass reductions that have recently been made to the rezoning application are an encouraging shift and we hope that the final results of the public process will result in site conditions that incorporate as much external feedback as possible. Um, additional site considerations for sunlight access, wind reduction, and wildlife habitability, particularly bird-friendly construction methods, should be included in any final design. Thank you. The next speaker will be Catherine Heinz and followed by Laura Colacursio. The time will begin. Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Heinz, Executive Director of New York City Audubon, a grassroots urban conservation organization in New York City. I serve on the Trust Com Community Advisory Council. We've operated a summer house on Nolan Park since 2017. Our scientists have monitored nesting common terns on the island's piers since 2013, and our volunteers have collected census and breeding data since 2018. 
So far, 217 bird species have been recorded. Most important, Governor's Island provides critical foraging, nesting, and stopover habitat for tens of thousands of North American migratory birds. We have tremendous enthusiasm for the climate solutions theme as global warming threatens nearly all North American bird species. We are an urban conservation organization and expect that buildings will be part of our city for the foreseeable future. New building is an opportunity for better building. New building on Governor's Island has the potential to show the city, state, our country, and the world what a green future city embracing wildlife looks like. New York City Audubon does not oppose sustainable development within the development zones that were established in the 2010 master plan. We do have concerns. We see no benefit to very tall buildings on Governor's Island. We prefer an absolute limit, no greater than 120 feet, with most buildings limited to 75 feet. We ask that any buildings above 75 feet incorporate bird-friendly building design for their full height as otherwise required by Local Law 15. We ask that all new buildings have habitat-friendly intensive green roofs. We ask that development include habitat quality landscape architecture with wetlands, grasslands, trees, and shorelines that provide ecosystem services to wildlife. We oppose unnecessarily uh, illuminating buildings and ask that any lighting plan follow dark skies lighting standards. That is safety lighting that reduces sky glow and minimizes glare and blue light in the nighttime environment. And we oppose installation of artificial turf fields and stadium style lighting. I'd add we wholly support um, the Earth Matter group. We have a lot more to say and written testimony will be submitted. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to appear today. Thank you. Final speaker on this panel will be Laura Colacurcio. The time will begin now. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of the Association for a Better New York. My name is Laura Colacurcio and I am the Vice President of ABNY. ABNY is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the healthy growth and renewal of New York City's people, businesses, and communities. We are a 50-year-old civic organization representing corporations, nonprofits, unions, government authorities, and educational, cultural, and health institutions. We strive to promote connections between the public and private sectors to make New York City a better place to live, work, and visit. ABNY presently serves on the Community Advisory Council for Governor's Island, along with several other stakeholders. As a member of the council, we have learned that the proposal to rezone Governor's Island and allow for the creation of a year-round Center for Climate Solutions will bring together opportunities for learning, skills training, and public programming related to one of the most pressing issues of our time. As ABNY focuses on the city's inclusive and equitable recovery from COVID-19, we are eager to support a project that presents a bold vision for the city's future. The Climate Center provides an opportunity to prepare for the existential threat of climate change while creating more than $1 billion in economic impact and more than 8,000 jobs and career training opportunities that will ensure New York City has the available workforce to take on this critical issue. Further, ABNY believes that every New Yorker should have access to public assets like Governor's Island, and year-round access and increased transportation connectivity are critical to achieving this goal. This proposal will create increased ferry service to more New Yorkers, allowing the island to serve a more diverse user base. This will make the island a more inclusive place to enjoy free and low-cost access to open space, recreational opportunities, and arts and culture. Moreover, this proposal limits new development to specific areas and does not ex impact the island's beloved open spaces. In addition, the vision for a climate center on Governor's Island is aligned with its existing character and ethos. From its resilient award-winning park to the work of its partners, the Harbor School, Billion Oyster Project, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council and Climate Museum, and more. For these reasons, ABNY supports the reason. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura, for your testimony today. Sure, right, that was the yeah. last speaker on this panel. Do we have any council members that have questions for these uh, for this panel? See no members with questions. Okay, there being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And the council, if you can, please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Roger Manning, Ali Ryan, Adrian Sosin, and Alex Herrara. First speaker will be Roger Manning, followed by Ali Ryan. Good time, we'll begin.
Hello? Hello? Sorry. Hello, I was bumped off just as you said my name. This is Roger Manning. Okay, Roger Manning uh, should be the first speaker then on this panel, if you were, if I'm, apologies. I'm sorry, now everything on my computer is messed up. Can, can you come back to me after one person? Yes, uh, how about we will move to Ali Ryan and then Adrian Sosin. Hello, I'm Ali Ryan. Thank you, Chairman Moya, Council Member Chen, and the Zoning and Franchises Committee members for the opportunity to speak today. I ask all city council members to vote no on the Governor's Island rezoning plan. First, I like to speak as the co-founder of Metro Area Governor's Island Coalition, also known as MAGIC. Chief Dwayne Perry of the Ramapo Linnopa Pay Nation, have, has, who has not been consulted in the planning for Governor's Island, met with MAGIC and made the following statement. When we have such a natural, open, breathable place such as this, it should be left for people and wildlife as it was originally intended. It's a rare blessing to have a place like Governor's Island in New York City. Preserve the openness and sacredness. In response to the trust proposed Governor's Island rezoning plan, MAGIC created an alternative South Island visualization that provides for a Linnepe facility and there is interest in holding the annual powwow, which draws members from all over the Northeast, as well as other traditional Linnepe events. Now I would like to speak as a New Yorker, a wife and a mother of two children. Governor's Island is very dear to my family. My husband and I got married at Picnic Point on Governor's Island 10 years ago on Talk Like a Pirate Day. Governor's Island's parkland public and public space allowed us to afford a New York wedding. This Governor's Island rezoning plan was obviously created pre-COVID lockdown. I like to suggest a paradigm shift away from the 15 year plan. Thank you very much for your time. Next, we will hear from Adrian Sosin and then Alex Herrera, and then we'll come back to Roger Manning uh, and hopefully resolve, having resolved any issues there. Uh, Adrian Sosin. Hello, can you hear me? My name, hello? Yes, can we can me? hear you. Very good, yes. thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Adrian Andy Sosin and I live in downtown Manhattan. I have visited Governor's Island many times, basically to walk around, to go see the art at Figment, to hear Batala practice on a lawn. And my best memory is of my grandson's third birthday party, a picnic in the old historic area where a sweet visiting carnival had rise children. Now my idyllic memories may be unrepeatable because of the specter of development of tall towers on the island. As a member of the Seaport Coalition, we want to protect another historic district from speculation. And this beautiful and basically unspoiled land is subject to runaway capitalism, much like in the early 20th century when it took tragedies like the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire to inspire activism that instituted governmental controls that regulated unrestrained private interests from taking advantage of public assets. The reform movements that generated out of the Triangle Fire benefited everyone. If the progressive era ushered in by the Biden administration is really meant to benefit all of the people, vulture capitalism needs to take a pause. Because where is the benefit to the public to allow Governor's Island to become denser with tall buildings or with a hotel? Even with laudable goals of expanding public uses, I am against these speculative and untimely efforts to monetize it 
with the trust's proposals. The Governor's Island Trust can seek other sources of support from the government, particularly without building tall and massive buildings and keep it in the public domain. Governor's Island is and should remain a public asset. Community Board 1 has re resolved appropriately protecting public park lands and the Magic Coalition has proposed better solutions in my opinion. There must it's be a building on any building. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Alex Herrera, and then we will come back to Roger Manning. Hello, okay. I'm Alex Herrera. I'm with the New York Landmarks Conservancy, and the Conservancy opposes the proposed zoning change that would allow 4.3 million square feet of new building bulk on two sites just south of the Governor's Island Historic District. The proposal before you today would allow buildings up to 250 feet high with an additional 40 feet of mechanical bulkhead on top of that. Buildings of this height and bulk bear no relation to the special history and sense of place of Governor's Island. We also question how such huge buildings can be sustained on a small island with limited infrastructure and with only ferry connections to the rest of the city. To give an example of how big 4.3 million square feet is, one World Trade Center contains 3.4 million square feet, so it's almost a million square feet less than what is being proposed for this small harbor island made largely of landfill. The Conservancy is not opposed to new buildings on the south side, but the proposed zoning would allow for extremes in size and density. 25-story buildings would be grossly out of scale with existing buildings on the island. We believe the proposed scheme is driven by considerations of the supposed financial return of the sites with little thought given to the historic character or physical beauty of the island, which welcomes over a million visitors a year. This is public land. It is a popular public park. Other important considerations apart from financial return must be considered when planning future development there. The New York Landmarks Conservancy has a long history of involvement with Governor's Island. For decades, we have worked with the Trust and its predecessor organization to push for the preservation of the historic buildings on the island, most of which are vacant. There needs to be equal emphasis on finding new uses for these existing buildings. In conclusion, the Conservancy believes very strongly that Governor's Island is a valuable public amenity for all New Yorkers. Your time has expired. Thank you very much. So we hope you protect this public amenity. Thank you. Okay, and now we will attempt to hear again from Roger Manning. Yeah, can you hear me? Can hear you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Roger Manning, co-founder of MAGIC, Metro Area Governors Island Coalition. Uh, we're against this financially and, and environmentally irresponsible upzoning for Governors Island. Now, the blizzard of details from the trust diverts from the actual issue, which is what, or actual question, which is, you know, what is Governors Island going to be? That's, that's the, the, the conversation here. Is it going to be an irreplaceable, one-of-a-kind green urban refuge that essentially functions as a park even in areas with buildings and, and uh, ongoing projects, or another high rise, high density commercial urban district with uh, boxed in value added landscaping. You know, any discussion here of a climate research center is irrelevant. This is a proposal to upzone the South Island period. Uh, the trust, uh, trust for Governor's Island Chair Alicia Glend has referred to the island as, quote, a nice piece, a nice piece of real estate. And a city planning commissioner has pointed out that there's nothing, nothing legally requiring that a climate center be built there. And the uh, rezoning for the South Island is blanket C4-1 rezoning, which means that in the future, uh, other areas of the South Island can, are subject to um, application for uh, upzoning or changes. Um, and Governor's Island already functions as a climate hub uh, and new buildings on, on the island should not exceed the four story heights in the historic district, I mean, really. Um, and the main rationales for this proposed upzoning, making Governor's Island financially self-sufficient and accessible year round aren't supported by this plan. And given the trust break-even date of 2050, 
it would be infinitely more cost efficient to bypass subsidizing the real estate industry middlemen and fund uh, Governor's Island directly with that money using a revitalization approach such as uh, the magic alternative visualization, which it seems the trust was referencing a few times today. And year round access for what? You know, a backyard to Hudson Yards 2.0. That's not what people come to Governor's Islands for, you know. And this, this process is, it, it's been going on for years in a sense, but this proposal is just since less, uh, last uh, last and it's being rushed through during a pandemic. Anyway, thanks, thanks much for the hearing. Thank you. Chair, that was the last speaker on the panel. Uh, I don't see any members with questions for this panel. Okay, thank you. There being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Council, can you please call up the next panel? Next panel will include Adrian Guz, Benjamin Kubani, Miranda Massey, and Karen Imus. Adrian Guz will be the first speaker and then Benjamin Kubani. Your time will begin. Yes, can you hear me? Is, thank you. Uh, dear council members, for allowing, uh, thank you for allowing my testimony. My name is Adrian Goes. I'm founder, principal, West State Landscape Architects. West State is the landscape architect that made the park design of Governors Island. We were involved in the master planning from the beginning, and later, 2018, 2019, we were also partner of the team advising the trust for public spaces for the two developing zones. We brought a park design to execution since 2010. In two phases, we worked together with the trust all these years and the park uh, is there. It's a beautiful, beautifully undulated and flood resistant park. It offers scenic walks, exploring the unique harbor landscape. It's, beloved, um, it's a beloved public open space, a magnet for people from all boroughs. And since the early beginning, the master plan identified two developing sites to, to embrace this park. For this, the edge is very relevant. The park edge becomes an interface with positive, inviting, active plinth, accessible uh, with human scale. We support a climate center vision. This is the promising anchor institution that supports the ethos of the island. It brings visitors year round activities. It's the best uh, guarantee for economical sustainability for key utilities and the accessibility of the island and its park. Thank you. Next speaker will be Benjamin Kubani and then Miranda Massey. Your time will begin. Good afternoon. My name is Ben Kubani. I am testifying on behalf of Eli Dvorkin, Editorial and Policy Director of the Center for an Urban Future, an independent think tank focused on creating a more inclusive economy in New York City. I'm here to testify in support of the proposed Governor's Island Rezoning Amendment, which will help realize the island's full potential as a vibrant year-round resource for all New Yorkers. This proposal builds on more than two decades of thoughtful planning around the island's future and will generate new opportunities to address many of the city's greatest needs. More than a year into the pandemic, the role that parks and open space play as vital public infrastructure has never been clear. This proposal will further expand the island's parkland and open space while serving as a catalyst to open the island's unique natural environment to 24 seven year-round access. This proposal also has the potential to create thousands of permanent jobs, no small thing for New York, given that the city ended the year with 560,000 fewer jobs than in December 2019. In addition to cultivating the conditions to spark job creation, Governor's Island has integrated educational and workforce development opportunities and partnerships into the planning process long before shovels hit the ground. While these important initiatives will require a new level of support from city and state leaders, philanthropy, businesses, and educational institutions like the City University of New York, 
and New York City Department of Education to reach their fullest potential, as well as meaningful commitments from future tenants and vendors. The approach that Governor's Island is taking can help ensure that the economic benefits that new development will bring will be shared widely with the community on the island and in neighborhoods across the city. This proposal will also further strengthen the island's key role as a hub for arts and culture, bringing new audiences to the island, supporting the development of new spaces to make and present cutting edge work, and continuing to provide arts education opportunities that fill a major void left by the pandemic, which has taken a heavy toll on arts education funding. And for the city still reeling from the near total loss of its tourism sector to the pandemic, with devastating effects on thousands of accessible jobs and industries from restaurants and retail to ground transportation and accommodations, this proposal can help contribute to the rebound of this vital sector while rooting the city's future appeal in the principles of sustaining design and visitation. Perhaps most important of all, this proposal helps, this proposal aims to provide New York City with a leading global hub for- time has expired. expired. Uh, can I finish my sentence? Yes. Perhaps most important of all, this proposal aims to provide New York City with a lead global hub for interdisciplinary research on climate solutions. Building on the island's core assets from its unique geography to innovation, to innovative educational institutions like the Harbor School, to its status as a living incubator of exemplary landscape architecture, this proposal can help Governor's Island serve as an even brighter beacon of environmental and economic sustainability in New York Harbor. We'll next hear from Miranda Massey and then Karen Imus. Starting time. Hello, good afternoon and thank you, council members and subcommittee members. My name is Miranda Massey and I am the director of the Climate Museum, which is the first climate dedicated museum in the United States and which has had a steady presence on Governor's Island since we first started providing public programming in 2018. Um, I first want to uh, particularly thank Council Member Ayala for supporting our initiative to help high school students at the International Community High School in your district create a beautiful climate justice mural in their playground, and Council Member Levin for support for various environmental and climate justice initiatives over the years. Um, we've seen firsthand the depth and intensity of the Trust's commitment to this vision from the very first days when we started working with the extraordinary team um, that runs the programming on Governor's Island. And um, we can say that not only in words, but in deeds, this vision has been vibrant and developing iteratively um, for the whole period of time during which Governor's Island has supported us and really allowed us to come into being as a new institution on New York City's cultural landscape. Um, We've also, by dint of being on the island, had the chance to observe both what a spectacularly precious and special resource it is and how much more accessible it could be, what a gift it could be to the people of the city. Um, we encourage you um, to approve the rezoning on that basis. And then in closing, I'll just say, climate is the biggest threat we face. This would be a huge leadership move for the city of New York and the cultural and climate leadership of New York City will be absolutely essential to our recovery. Um, please vote in favor and thank you so much for your time. Next and last speaker on the panel will be Karen Imus. Start in time. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Thank you. My name is Karen Imus and I represent the Waterfront Alliance, a New York, New Jersey based organization focused on resilient and revitalized waterfronts. The water's edge of Governor's Island represents untapped potential while at the same time remains a landscape where the power of climate risk is undeniable. Waterfront Alliance is in favor of today's proposal to make Governor's Island a year round world class destination with a climate research anchor. And to strengthen the future potential of this proposal, there are a number of additional recommendations that we'd like to highlight. With both development zones being located on the portion of the island that was created with fill material and located within the 100 year floodplain and facing sea level rise conditions, resiliency is a key consideration. 
And in the trust previous presentations, the design flood elevation varies between 13 feet and 15 feet across development zones. We would wanna see the elevation strategies up to 17 feet and 18 feet, especially important as dormitories are listed as a potential use, introducing housing, even if temporary housing into a complicated floodplain merits a more conservative approach for the design flood elevation. And we strongly encourage the project team to work with the Waterfront Alliance through our Waterfront Edge design guidelines verification process to meet a commitment to resilience, public access and innovation at the water's edge. Um, in 2019, Manhattan Community Board One actually adopted a resolution encouraging all Waterfront ULERP applicants to use WEDGE. And we're having some productive conversations with the trust about this process. We also encourage the use of uh, natural shorelines in the design alongside esplanades and elevating structures for example, we were encouraged to see the wetlands proposal for Picnic Point. We're also encouraged that the trust continues to cite the Waterfront Alliance's maritime activation plan for Governor's Island as a resource for planning. This includes recommended uh, direct and enhanced water access opportunities, such as human powered boating, a marina, a boat lift, and historic ship docking. Currently, except for restricted access at Pier 101, there are no opportunities for visitors to touch the water at any other point in Governor's Time expired. Mile shoreline. We'll have a long your testimony to submit. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Chair Moya, that was the last speaker on this panel. Excuse me, this panel. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any council members with questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions. Okay. There being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And council, if you can, please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Thomas Devaney, Jeff Kressler, Stephen Smith, and Jonathan Andrew Perez. First speaker will be Thomas Devaney, and then Jeffrey Kressler. Starting time. Thank you. Uh, Governor's Island is one of New York's most tourist destinations. It feels a world apart from the rest of the city, but all that could change dramatically if the current rezoning is allowed to move forward. While the trust has been very accommodating, to MAS and has presented before our planning and preservation committees, we maintain that the plan could irreparably transform Governor's Island as we know it. The massive proposal, the equivalent of one and a half Empire State buildings, is currently underpinned by a series of assumptions about financial self-sufficiency and how to achieve it. The trust has yet to clearly articulate how the dynamics of, the short, of its short and long-term financial needs are manifested through the plan. Without a better understanding of the development trade-offs needed for the trust to achieve its goals, we cannot support the plan. We feel the trust has not adequately explored reasonable, less impactful development alternatives. MAS has urged the trust to explore adaptive reuse of the North Island's 1.3 million square feet of historic buildings and substantially reducing the scale and density of development on the South Island. MAS was a strong advocate in getting Governor's Island into public control after the transfer in 2003. We have supported the trust investment in the preservation of the island's historic buildings and the creation of new parks and public, uh, publicly accessible open space. The MAS has maintained that plans for the South Island must prioritize and preserve open space while the North Island must support preservation and adaptive reuse. We urge the open space sub area to be designated as parkland. Without these protections, there is no assurances that the sub area will remain as open space in the future if the trust's financial projections don't go as planned. Um, in addition, we find in, an in, inadequate disclosure of impacts on critical views of and from the development area and the effects on urban design, particularly interactions with the existing historic buildings and open space. We recognize the trust faces many challenges in achieving critical mass to ensure a vibrant island system of activities and uses requiring substantial revenue sources for upkeep and maintenance of the island as it becomes Time a expired. destination. Could I just finish my sentence, please? Uh, any development of this scale would radically and unalterably, unalterably change Governor's Island. In its pathway to self-sufficiency, the trust must explore many alternatives for creating the lively, resilient, special place that Governor's <laughs> Island should be. Thank you. Thank you. We will next hear from Jeffrey Kressler, and then Stephen Smith, and then Jonathan Andrew Perez. Hello. Time. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Kressler. I am the president of the City Club of New York, and the City Club of New York is uh, absolutely, without qualification, opposed to this upzoning of Governor's Island. 
when Robert Moses said, when you're on the side of the parks, you're on the side of the angels. Uh, what we have here is supercharged on the side of the parks because it's climate change as well as parks. And who can be opposed to that? Well, the bottom line is that what we have is four and a half million square feet of development on this island. That is a massive upzoning. And what will fill these buildings? How much space will a climate center take? Have they created a climate center? No. Have they tried putting a climate center and its research arm in any of the existing buildings? No. This proposal adds zero parkland and zero public realm. What it does add is public space built, controlled, and defined by private developers. In other words, it is a corporate campus that is being proposed, not a public amenity, not public realm. And what the public gets will be little pieces of leftovers. Why not build Governor's Island as a true public resource and then you'll really be on the side of the angels, not the cynical side of the angels that Robert Moses did. So thank you. Just say no. Thank you. Next will be Stephen Smith. Anishik Kishilamokwing, Anishik Kwachi Manadu, Elamiliang, Kukanaki Wak Mbi. Walk Kashong, walk Tindao, walk Mahikanatuk. These are, are words from the Muncie language, the original language of uh, Manhattan in this area. I, I just find it interesting that there's over 800 languages spoken in the region, but up until recently, Mun Muncie was all but extinct, but you know, we're bringing back the language, we're reviving it. And that kind of reminds me of the need to also protect these open spaces that are, are here in the New York uh, City area. And you know, my concern is that, you know, we haven't really been involved in the, uh, the planning process or consulted. I'm not even sure if we're uh, identified in the environmental impact statement. I know that that was mentioned earlier in the, in the program. So we're, we're just very concerned to, about the, you know, preserving the, the openness of the space. Uh, our partners have uh, talked about this matter. I've just talked to one of our Mohawk allies that said that Governor's Island has been a key point to, you know, the defense of the, uh, the East Coast or, or a place for, for the nations to come together as well. So as it stands right now, we're, we're definitely opposed to the, uh, the, the project. And I'm, I'm glad to hear a lot of the, the good sentiments that are being put forward, but we have uh, some real concerns as to the the weight and sufficiency of, of those uh, projects and also the need to uh, build the type of infrastructure that's currently being contemplated. So uh, thank you very much for, for uh, this time to speak. And so on behalf of uh, Ramapo, Muncie, Lenape Nation, uh, Anushi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. <clears throat> Last speaker on this panel will be Jonathan Perez. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Moya and Council Member Chen. My name is Jonathan Perez. I also appreciate, I think it was an hour ago, the walk in the park reference. Uh, it's very apropos of our, right, of our testimony. Um, I'm an attorney by trade, as well as an equity and racial justice advocate. Um, I've been a bird watcher my whole life uh, in New York City and Brooklyn for about 20 years. Um, I'm also a contributor on eBirds, which is run by Cornell, as well as Rare Bird Alerts. Uh, for me, Governor's Island represents one of the most important sites of equity, as well as a shared experience and appreciation for nature. Um, I'm urging the city not to build on really our only remaining green pastoral island, um, as well as the visibility for New York tourists, kind of seeing it from afar and the buildings that would be built. Um, on equity, everyone remembers a Christian Cooper in Central Park, a bird watcher, African American bird watcher, who's approached. Um, since that time, I started Birders of Color. It's a group that uh, has come together in different parts of the city and appreciated nature and have uh, kind of a cultural experience together. Governor's Island is a, is a site for that. Um, I'm not a scientist by trade, but very quickly, flora and fauna that should be affected or might be affected. 
There's rare birds, including uh, Wilson snipe and American woodcock uh, that use the, the shores and the piers on the island. Common terns are always on those piers, south part of the island. Um, and there's a famous butterfly, the variegated fritillary, which I've only seen once in Brooklyn, and I've seen them almost every summer in the flowering beds of the island. So most importantly, the grasslands in New York um, are urgently kind of um, being encroached on. Shirley Chisholm Park is one place that still maintains it, and Governor, Governor's Island is another. So I take, I take great pride in the city's protection of this land. I urge everyone to vote no, and hopefully it remains an equitable site where we can all come together and appreciate nature. Uh, thank you for I'm your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Chair Moya, that was the last speaker on this panel. Thank you, Council. Do we have any Council members that have any questions for this panel? I see no members with questions for the panel. Uh, seeing none, uh, this panel now is excused. Uh, Council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Eric Shiner, Michael Oppenheimer, Catherine Hughes, and Jessica Lappin. Erica Shiner, Eric, excuse me, Eric Shiner, and then Michael Oppenheimer. Start in time. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. I'm Eric Shiner, the executive director of Pioneer Works in Red Hook, Brooklyn, just a short ferry ride away from Governor's Island. I'm very happy to support the trust proposal today and want to remind everyone that culture is one of the best ways that we can bring people and dollars to our city. I first visited Governor's Island in 2005 to see a great installation by the contemporary artist Allison Smith that was a public art fund project and have visited many times since. So the potential for cultural tourism and the dollars associated with it is of course huge. And we at Pioneer Works wanna make sure that we collaborate to make culture as accessible to all New Yorkers as possible. This summer, we are co-hosting with LMCC a wonderful exhibition by the Nigerian-American artist Onyede Kachuke on Governor's Island, and I hope that everyone can come to visit that. But we're also very, very interested in the Climate Center being directly impacted by the realities of climate change in Red Hook. During Sandy, we were under several feet of water at Pioneer Works, as was most of Red Hook. Our neighbors in the Red Hook houses, the second largest public housing complex in New York City and the country are still living um, with generators and many other hard realities of that storm. We wanna make sure that people are empowered to fight climate change. And we also see this development as a great source of new jobs for residents of Red Hook. And we want to make sure that people are able to be trained in not only cultural related jobs, but also things related to climate change and remind everyone that it is a very short ferry ride across the water to Governor's Island from Red Hook. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. Next will be Michael Oppenheimer, then Catherine Hughes, then Jessica Lappin. Start in time. My name is Michael Oppenheimer. I'm a professor of geosciences, geosciences and international affairs at Princeton University and a resident of Greenwich Village. My research is devoted full time to climate change, adaptation and to its impacts and policies to stabilize our climate. I thank the committee for the opportunity to express my views, which apply only to the proposal to devote a portion of Governor's Island to a center for climate solutions and not to issues like density or building height. The proposed center would provide a unique opportunity to study, <clears throat> excuse me, to study the interactions between people, a megalopolis and climate change and sea level rise. Climate change is an urgent threat facing New York City and the entire world. When I was an elementary school student at PS 162 in Queens, we practiced hiding under our desks in face of the world shattering threat of a nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. Today's children are worried about where to hide from climate change. Just as with a nuclear threat, 
there is really no place that is safe from climate change. Escape means facing the threat and reducing our exposure and vulnerability to it by learning how to adapt to unavoidable warming while working quickly to reduce emissions from fossil fuel combustion and other sources. The proposed center could demonstrate these solutions in a publicly accessible and familiar environment, giving researchers like me and my colleagues the opportunity to test ideas and practical interventions by engaging with a truly diverse community. My experience on the mayor's New York City panel on climate change taught me the value of developing research questions and solutions while drawing insights from the, pub, from the very public who would eventually implement these. A properly structured research program would make environmental justice in a changing climate a central focus. Adaptation has not yet received the focus it deserves, but as the impacts of climate change have become more apparent, all city, states, and countries are rushing to catch up. New York City has an edge because sadly, Hurricane Sandy well, caught us off fire. guard. I'll just finish with one sentence. This terrible experience now presents us an opportunity to move the needle by engaging experts worldwide while also benefiting from the homegrown experience of people who know all too well the damages climate change can impose, especially on frontline communities. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Catherine Hughes and then Jessica Lappin. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Moya and members. My name is Catherine McVeigh Hughes and I'm here today testifying in support of the Climate Solutions Center proposed for Governor's Island. When Governor's Island was given to the city in 2003, it was like a miracle, 172 acres of grass and trees and beautiful historic buildings suddenly appearing in New York Harbor for the benefit of all New Yorkers. Governor's Island has a unique character and location and as a result has unique needs. Every park needs upkeep and maintenance and Governor's Island needs all that and more support for the ferries that make it possible and investment to return its beautiful historic buildings to public use. But the vision for Governor's Island is even bigger, not just to be a gem of a park, but to become the centerpiece of our city's recover from COVID and our response to climate change and global warming. Surrounded by the waters of the harbor with the New York skyline and the Statue of Liberty as a backdrop and serenity of a great urban park, is there anywhere in America or the world better suited to be the home to a climate solutions center? As bad as COVID is today, climate change will be worse as unfair and unjust as COVID is, placing the heaviest burden on those least able to bear them, climate change will weigh even heavier on those same communities. As the island looks to reach its full potential year round, increase open space on the island without touching existing park space or closing any of it during construction and solidify long-term funding stream, it is clear. Now is the time to move ahead with this rezoning plan that has responded to community input by lowering maximum heights, committed to ensuring that development incorporates innovative sustainability and resiliency practices and to work with the community for the Signature Climate Solutions Center, which is at the center of the plan, one that truly demonstrates that New York City can and will think big coming out of this pandemic. And just for the record, um, I was chair of Community Board One during Superstorm Sandy. So we've seen firsthand the devastation Time of uh, climate change. Thank you very much. The last speaker on the panel will be Jessica Lappin. Before we start, Sorry, to say, good to see you, uh, Jessica, former uh, councilwoman as well. I uh, hope you and your family are doing well. And, uh, Thank you so much. So nice to see you too, Councilmember Moya. Um, so I am the president of the Alliance for Downtown New York. Uh, as the chair said, former councilwoman who was very involved in the rezoning uh, or the ULERP to allow Cornell Tech to come to Roosevelt Island, which uh, has shared some similarities and was a real game changer. I'm, I'm speaking in favor of the rezoning application for the Climate Solutions Center on the South Island. Um, in, in Lower Manhattan, we think of Governor's Island as our unofficial backyard. It's always been an oasis, but certainly never more than during this pandemic. And we can't wait for the island to reopen in just a few weeks. Um, but the proposal of these development sites that were long envisioned, as Claire explained, as part of the master plan following 20 years of advocacy and community planning, don't exist the island, don't impact the island's existing park. And what's only open now six months a year 
I think we should all agree uh, should be open and accessible year round. And this plan will enable the trust to expand public access, ensuring a broader and more diverse uh, community can visit. There have been several community meetings, a lot of feedback, um, and a lot of changes that were made to this proposal in response. Height reductions, density reductions, uh, protections of park uses, um, and, and those are some of the important changes I wanted to highlight in addition to the creation of an additional seven acres of open space and the widening of the waterfront esplanade and the restriction of development uses to park related amenities only. Thinking ahead, uh, as, as Catherine said, Climate Solutions Center seems like a very wise use of this space in this unprecedented moment when it's threatening lower Manhattan, the city and the country. Um, we did get too much of a taste of that downtown during Superstorm Sandy and a Climate Solutions Center would help address these crises and really position us for the future um, as a city uh, leading on the global stage in addressing these issues. So I'll wrap up by just saying um, that I do urge you to support Governor's Island's rezoning proposal that is before you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank you, Jessica, for your testimony today. It was good to see you. Nice to see you too. Be well. Take care. Thank you. Chair Moya, that was the last speaker on this panel, and I do not see any members with questions for this panel. Okay. Uh, there being no uh, council members with questions for this panel, this uh, panel is now excused. Thank you again for your testimony. Uh, Council, can you please call up the next panel? The next panel will include Lynn Ellsworth, Lucy Cotine, Juana Paella Cazito, and Wendy Brower. First speaker will be Lynn Ellsworth and then Lucy Cotine. Start in time. Can you hear me? No. I can hear you. Wait, now we can't hear you. Hold on. Hold on. Now. Now we can hear you. Okay, great. I'm Lynn Ellsworth, Chair of Human Scale NYC and the Tribeca Trust. We oppose this profoundly ill-conceived vision for Governor's Island. We consider it to be speculative real estate fantasies and the climate center we see as just a red herring that should not fool anyone. We do not consider the trust vision to be financially necessary or in the best interest of the city. We see it as disguised privatization. Other more low key commercial uses for the existing buildings are possible and low rise contextual infill is enough. We call for an overhaul of the governor's island planning and managerial structure with a new planning team in place, one less wedded to real estate speculation. We ask for the removal of the real estate dominated Friends of Governor's Island from any role on the island. We point out that the whole planning process for us has been somewhat laughable, akin to setting up a kangaroo court to usher the plan through the system, ignoring the tsunami of opposition, which tragically is how most of these rezonings happen. Last, we consider the rezoning an obvious violation of the spirit, intent, and letter of the original deed restrictions. We're amazed that others with more means than we have have not launched a lawsuit to stop this disaster. We call on civic groups to get together to finance such a lawsuit. Last, we believe that Governor's Island is a citywide asset and that council members should ignore the tradition of council member deference in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Lucy Cotine, and then Buana Paye Cazito, and then Wendy Brown. Hello? Start in time. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Lucy Cotine. I am an advocate for parks, natural space, Op natural open space and the environment. Lenape language for watch over this land is Kanak Haki. In 1637, the Dutch West India Company purchased Pag Pagank, Lenape Nut Island, now known as Governor's Island, for two axe heads, a string of bees, and a handful of nails. The island was purchased for private use and real estate speculation. Sound familiar? 
The trust repeats the assumption over and over again that the island needs to be used by a large number of people throughout the year and it needs to be financially self-sustainable. Neither is true. The trust repeats the, sorry, the corporation throws out the do-gooder idea that we should have a climate research center there, but they have no institution in mind and no rationale that we need another climate research institution in New York or anywhere. Instead of an EIS, there is a FSSGEIS, a final second supplemental generic EIS, because specific impacts cannot be known as there is no specific development. The process is backwards. Currently, the island is in use 12 months a year for useful environmental functions and for the New York Harbor School. That is enough. We do not need to colonize every drop of land, every open space. To understand what is going on in this proposed upzoning, you must know who represents the Governor's Island's Friends Group, some of the biggest developers in the city and the world. They have only one bottom line, and it's not the needs of a healthier planet. A partial list, Blackstone, Tishman Spear, RAL, Amazon, MetLife Investments, Sidewalk Labs, AECOM, which is now AECOM Tishman, the largest receiver of contracts in the city. A glaring conflict of interest in the Friends Group is the inclusion of Cal Golem, of Fry Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson, a 500 member international law firm with a I'm contract, expired. almost done, contract with the trust that recently added $100,000 to their pay. Why? To shepherd through the Euler process. This is a pre-pandemic plan. The city is currently filled with empty offices and apartments. We have no idea where the needs of the city will be post-pandemic. Let's keep this open green space for the current Thank and future you. residents Thank of the you. city forever. Thank Reject you. this. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next speaker will be Buana Paye Cazito and then Wendy Brower. Hello, my name is Buana Paye Cazito. Oh, Hello, my name is Buana Paye Kizito. I am the president of Buana Foundation. And I believe that the current rezoning proposal for Governor's Island must be withdrawn. Bringing in high density, high rise development is not the best use of this unique space that belongs to all New Yorkers and is visited by people from 99% of NYC zip codes. New Yorkers have a serious need for the welcoming open, expensive parkland quality, even in areas with buildings that Governor's Island provides and really isn't available elsewhere in the city. The main rationale for this intrusive project, financial self-sufficiency for Governor's Island is not justified. The trust on speculative projections based on pre-COVID conditions state that financial self-sufficiency won't be achieved until 2050. Meanwhile, it will cost taxpayers billions. Also, as Manhattan Community Board, one points out in their uh, December 22nd, 2021 resolution, the trust has not provided enough information to evaluate the project. As a city planning commissioner said at the March 1st public review, this project is akin to the city giving the trust a blank check for an unspecified project. In the review of the rezoning plan, any discussion regarding a climate research center is irrelevant, misleading, and should be termed off topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. The last speaker on the panel will be Wendy Brower. Starting time. Hi, I'm Wendy Brower. And I'm inviting you to my birthday party on Governor's Island in June. It's an annual tradition to gather far from the fumes of traffic on this peaceful green jewel with Miss Liberty aglow. I have 30 years of sustainable design experience, but last year GI saved my life. I volunteered at Earth Matter, and this zero waste nonprofit pivoted to raising food for soup kitchens last spring, and we grew a ton of produce on one eighth of an acre. We need to preserve food security, so please support dedicating two acres to their climate smart education program and ensure that composting is on GI's list of future uses. We don't need a multi-year unneeded construction debacle. GI is already well on its way to becoming a citywide community 
green culture and climate center that can be rapidly expanded to build capacity for social resiliency and ecosystem services. Cultivate green jobs and stewardship skills with the programs already in place and add a public bike R&D lab, a repair and circularity center, a pool and water play area, a street tree farm and benefit the whole city as visualized in the magic alternative plan. It's our country place in the city and it needs to be preserved for future generations of all species. Council member Kumo, Eugene, Lander, Levin, Mancheca, Rivera, and my rep, Council member Chin, your constituents visit Governor's Island most often, so please keep their health and well being prioritized. There really hasn't been time to include all voices in this rushed Euler process. As a Lower East Side resident, I know I'm going to see a surge from this side as Esker and BMCR get underway, impacting our environmental justice neighborhood for years. The whole city needs this open space for the pandemics to come, as well as to recuperate from this one. Don't let your legacy be marred by permanent overdevelopment on Governor's Island. Time expired. Chair, that was the final speaker on this panel. And I see no members with questions for the panel. Sorry, uh, thank you. There being no more questions for this panel, uh, this witness panel is now excused. Uh, Council, if you can please call the next panel. The next panel will include Jeff Sears, Andrew Zelter, and Mark Ricks. The first speaker will be Jeff Sears, and then Andrew Zelter, and then Mark Ricks. Start in time. Good afternoon, Chair and Council Members. My name is Jeff Sears. My company, Blazing Saddles, has operated the bike rental operation on Governor's Island for the last eight years. We feel very fortunate to have our operation there and to see all the improvements made over the recent years. It has been great to see the growth in visitors to Governor's Island as the public becomes more knowledgeable about the recreational offerings and the other small and the other uh, from families with small ch children to avid cyclists. Each year, the volume increases as more visitors tell their friends and family what a world-class venue this is for all level of riders. Even last season was shortened to the, due to the pandemic. We ex experienced record months of business due to the desire of New Yorkers to enjoy all the open space that Governor's Island has to offer. Opening up the south side of the island will only increase that open space, provide additional year-round recreational opportunities. It has been our pleasure to be a part of Governor's Island community, and we look forward to the opportunity of helping expand the island's recreational offerings all year round for all New Yorkers. We hope you will support the rezoning of the south side of Governor's Island. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Next speaker will be Andrew Zelter. Your time will begin. We have Andrew Zelter. Andrew Zelter, if you can hear me uh, and you see a unmute request, you need to accept that in order to begin speaking.
Andrew Zelcher. If you can hear me, you need to accept the unmute request. If you can hear me, maybe you can raise your hand uh, and then we can try to get you, get your testimony at a, an upcoming panel. Why don't we um, go to the next speaker and then we'll come back to Andrew at the end of this panel. Okay. We had a Mark Ricks, who I believe we also may have lost. Mark Ricks. Okay, we seem to have lost Mark Ricks, and we'll try once again. Andrew Zelcher, if you can hear me, um, you could give us a raise hand, accept the unmute request. Okay, we're having some issues with Andrew Zelter, but we will uh, try to bring him back in an upcoming panel uh, that makes this panel complete. Chair, and I don't see any members with questions. Okay, um, let's move to the next panel. Okay, the next panel will include Lori Nelson, Jack Robinson, Caroline Parker, and Carol Ashley. Andrew Zelter, we will attempt to bring you in in an upcoming panel. First speaker on this panel will be Lori Nelson and then Jack Robinson. The time will begin. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Lori Nelson and I'm an artist working with the Four Heads nonprofit. Thank you for this opportunity to voice my opposition to the overdevelopment of Governor's Island. As an artist with Four Heads, the producer of the Governor's Island Art Fair for the last 13 or so years, you'll understand that the Eden we call Governor's Island is deeply important to me. Our organization is responsible for a lot of the growth of the arts on the island and the excited crowds in the fall for our fair on Colonel's Road. Many summers and fall, as an artist, I found the island inspiring for my work, but my main concern is not about art, it's about kids. My children grew up for over a decade spending summers with me on Governor's Island as I worked with my art community in preparing for the fair. Governor's Island was the only one solitary place in New York City that I felt comfortable setting my kids free on their bikes and scooters. It was during these summers that my children discovered Marissa and Charlie at Earth Matter and jumped ship from the art fair to Earth Matter, <clears throat> eventually committing their summers to intern with the Compost Education Center, tending goats and driving the garbage bike. This working farm was all the education center my children needed. Eventually, my daughter committed to the Rocky Mountain Youth Conservation Corps, and my son is preparing to study environmental law. The steps to these paths can be traced directly to their experiences on the island, in counterpoint to their life seven minutes but a world away in Brooklyn. The emptiness of the island was absolutely key. I understand growth is always of interest to the government and the city, but I question the interpretation of growth as high-rise buildings, hotels, retail, and packed ferries. I applaud the spirit behind an environmental center, but question the accompanying the density problem. <clears throat> you, can, you can finish up. Okay. And I'm concerned for the children who can be inspired by low density landscapes away and out of the shadows of tall buildings and away from the city culture. Please rethink your concept of growth. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Jack Robinson, followed by Caroline Parker. Your time will begin now. 
Hi, uh, I'm Jack Robinson. I am the executive director of Foreheads. Uh, we run Portal Governor's Island, uh, formerly Governor's Island Art Fair. This is our 14th year on the island. Um, I'd like to thank the city council members and the trust for Governor's Island for their ongoing support. Uh, but we cannot support this proposal. Uh, the, other, the, the, the island's main mandate is for public purpose. Um, is being revenue neutral a healthy model for venues of public purpose? How does a hotel benefit the public? Um, by definition, hotels are for out-of-towners and developers. Uh, couldn't the Climate Center be in Liggett Hall? Liggett Hall was the biggest military building in the US before the Pentagon was built. I think that they probably have room for that. Um, what's, what's more environmental, uh, environmentally friendly than using an existing building and not building a new one? Um, small, small nonprofit orgs like ours uh, have helped them make the island what it is today. And my testimony is meant to defend it. Uh, I urge the council not to approve the proposal. Thank you so much for your time and service on the council. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next, we will hear from Caroline Parker and then Carol Ashley. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon, my name is Caroline Parker. I'm here on behalf of the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. And I'm testifying today to urge you to ensure that Earth Matter Composting and Education Center has a long-term home in the planned rezoning of Governor's Island. We support the trust vision for a global center on climate solutions, but we believe that Earth Matter New York should anchor this plan as a concrete model of closed loop green infrastructure that works. As New York faces down the existential threat of climate change, organics recycling is a critically important pillar of the city's emissions reduction policy. The city currently sends more than 3.2 million tons of solid waste to landfill and incineration each year, much of which could be diverted to composting. Like all dirty industries, this waste moves through a system of truck routes and transfer stations that spew pollution in historically overburdened communities of color. For these reasons, Composting has repeatedly been highlighted in the city's climate and emission reductions targets, including the mayor's zero waste goal and the updated 1NYC 2050 framework. Sadly, due to recent budget cuts, the city's nascent composting system has been severely delayed. Only a handful, only a handful of community organizations, including Earth Matter, are doing this critical work on behalf of the entire city. As the city looks to restart and expand its organics recycling program, we must lift up and learn from the grassroots projects that have spent years building an extensive knowledge base and deep connections in the community. We, can't, we cannot afford to re-envision them out of existence. For over a decade, Earth Matter has operated a publicly accessible compost facility that is an internationally recognized working model of environmental justice principles. The facility recycles all the organic resources on the island and returns them to compost um, to the landscape. Today, they also accept food scraps from more than 400 residents as part of the Grow NYC compost program. Earth, Matter, Earth Matters Learning Center brings residents together with local students, urban farmers, and grassroots organizations to learn about sustainable waste management and other green jobs. Their dedicated staff and volunteers play a pivotal role in making Governor's Island the living laboratory that it is today. We know that the Trust for Governors Island shares our vision for a green, resilient city, and we believe that Earth Matter, which unites New Yorkers together in the name of stewardship and sustainability, is fully aligned with that vision. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And the last speaker on this panel will be Carol Ashley. Your time will begin now. I'm trying to, un okay, thank you. Um, thank you, committee members and council member Chin for the opportunity to speak. I'm a Lower Manhattan resident and Governor's Island member opposed to the upzoning plan. Last Thursday, Mayor de Blasio said, quote, Governor's Island is one of New York City's crown jewels. It's the kind of beautiful open public space that we will rely on to drive our recovery this spring and summer, close quotes. I think we rely on it for much longer than this spring and summer. We need tranquil green space to mitigate the urban stress we all experience. Please consider that many, if not most New Yorkers don't have a country retreat and can't afford to go to the country. 
outside of the city. Governor's Island is a place that helps our mental as well as physical health, not only during a pandemic. It's also the safest and healthiest park in the city for young children to run free. The park has also become a bird sanctuary and it's full of other wildlife, which must all be taken into serious consideration. We need large green spaces with a lot of trees to mitigate our city's polluted air. And we need to make Governor's Island as all green as possible to help mitigate global warming and be a part of a sustainable city. Earth matter should definitely be expanded to two acres. The Climate Centre is described as a vision. Don't we need a solid commitment from a participating institution and funding before this plan can even take shape? Any development needs to primarily enhance the Harbour School and its educational facilities. But why can't existing buildings in the historic district be restored and used instead of new construction? The plan proposed by the group MAGIC would keep the island's character intact while expanded, expanding planted areas and providing entertainment and recreational zones. And it includes input from the Lanupe people, the original inhabitants of the island. Please also note that this year's Prickster Architecture Prize was awarded for creative restoration and refurbishment, not new construction. The time is expired. Thank you. Jeremiah, that was the last speaker of this panel. And I'm seeing no members with questions for the panel. Thank you. Uh, there being no uh, more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, but before we call up the next panel, I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone. Uh, we really appreciate your patience. Uh, I know that this has been uh, a long hearing, but um, you know we want to try to get to everyone as best as we can. So thank you so much for uh, your patience. Uh, Council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will be Emily Hellstrom, Susie Schropp, Brad Vogel and Howard Bradstein. First speaker will be Emily Hellstrom and then Susie Schrapp. Hello. Hello. Emily. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, great. Sorry, I must be on some type of mute on my phone. In any case, thank you so much for giving me the chance and opportunity to speak today about Governor's Island. Um, my family and myself enjoy going there um, so often um, to ride bicycles or just get away from um, city life. It feels truly like a vacation. My name is Emily Hellstrom. I've lived in lower Manhattan um, for most of my adult life. And I just want to say we really need to keep our public spaces public and our private spaces private. Public private partnerships by design are not public. It is so important that we keep this open space for our community. I know that many people bring up things like, oh, you wouldn't build on Central Park, but really this is so much um, our Central Park of Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn, and really the entire city. These public spaces must be kept sacred. There, obviously, we must um, grow and adapt, and we need resiliency and climate change and all of our incredible um, 501c3s and nonprofits that thrive on Governor's Island, but we need to be able to do that um, in a way that keeps this public open space in perpetuity. Um, so I urge you to um, vote no on this proposal. There are many ways that we can move forward in a um, slow pace that involves the community. So thank you so much for listening to me today and please vote no. Thank you. Next speaker will be Susie Schropp and then Brad Fogel. Um, Hello, everybody. Oh, camera. All right. Uh, I'm Susie Schraub of 8 St. Mark's Tenants and Block Association. I'm also a county committee member, ED80-10666, and an avid composter. I'm here in, op I'm here in opposition to the proposed uh, rezoning by the Blasio administration and in 100% support for the Metro Area Governance Island Coalition Alternative South Island Visualization. The MAGIC plan proposes a use of the public lands that is genuinely beneficial to the public. The current rezoning proposal for Governor's Island must be withdrawn. 
the main rationale for this intrusive project, financial self-sufficiency for Governor's Island is not justified. Magic outlines this in detail and their in the opposition. The trust's proposal is akin to the city giving a blank check for an unspecified project. Any discussion regarding a climate research center is irrelevant, misleading, and should be termed off topic. It has nothing to do with the uh, proposed upzoning of the South Island, period. It is an upzoning. Um, why? While a worthwhile project, it mainly serves as a potential anchor tenant in, other, in order to attract developers to sell the up zoning to the public. As a 30 year plus lower Manhattan resident, I've seen the public land pillage. It always begins with an up zoning that is favorable to aggressive overdevelopment. Past proposals for luxury hospitality and a gambling mecca um, for the island, and now the proposal of hotels and boat hotels indicates the direction this trust proposal is taking. Absolutely no development of this kind should take place on Governor's Island. If the commission is truthful about making this a fantastic public park, it will deny this upzoning in lieu of the magic proposal. Thank you everyone for your undivided attention and for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Brad Fogel and then Howard Bradstein. The time will begin. Thank you, Chair. My name is Brad Vogel, and I am here today as an individual and also as a representative of Voice of Gowanus. We are a grassroots community coalition in Gowanus, Brooklyn, and we're here today to oppose this proposed rezoning for Governor's Island. Uh, we, too, are facing a, a rezoning that would lead to overdevelopment in a floodplain um, and that would fundamentally change the nature of uh, a, a place. Um, we are here today in solidarity with MAGIC, the Metro Area Governors Island Coalition, um, a fellow member of the Citywide People's Land Use Alliance. Uh, one of the chief issues that we're concerned about in Gowanus in particular is the fact that increased development on Governors Island stands to increase the overall load on the sewage system and while it may not seem like it on the face, we are directly connected through the Red Hook sewage treatment plant sewage, sewage shed. Um, so we are concerned that all this additional development will further load that sewer shed, which we know full well in Gowanus flows directly into the Gowanus Canal in many places uh, when, the, when there's not sufficient capacity in the system. It is a long running problem and one that will likely also be exacerbated by the proposed Gowanus rezoning. We're also concerned that this rezoning is going forward using virtual ULERP or remote hearings. Um, we also know full well that uh, ULERP is, a, is the one chance for the public to hold public officials accountable. And while Zoom may bring in more people, it does not necessarily provide the community with the same ability to hold public officials accountable face-to-face -face in the same room about major land use decisions. Uh, we have many concerns along the lines that MAGIC does about the finances, about the sort of, what is the end result, the egalitarian park-like, haven-like nature of Governor's Island that would be impacted by this proposal. So again, we ask you to vote no on this proposal to upzone Governor's Island. Thank you. Thank you. Next and last, next and last speaker on this panel will be Howard Bradstein. Your time will begin. Howard Branstein, you are the next speaker on this panel. If you can hear me, 
And if you see an unmute request, you need to accept the unmute request in order to begin speaking. Why don't we come back? Yes, unfortunately, I think we're having some issues with Howard Branstein. Howard Branstein, we will attempt to bring you back in an upcoming panel. That does it for this panel chair. Uh, and I see no members with questions at this time. Okay, thank you. There being no more questions uh, for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And Council, can you please call up the next panel? The next panel will include Gregory Thompson, Jenny Lowe, Lindsay Boylan, and Megan Malvern. First speaker will be Gregory Thompson, followed by Jenny Lowe, followed by Lindsay Boylan. It's on, we'll begin. Good afternoon. My name is Gregory Thompson. I'm a media lawyer and native New Yorker. Also work for Cornell University where I study remote work and its impact on startup business ecosystems. I testify in today in opposition to the pro proposed upzoning due to its outsized height and bulk and general overdevelopment. The break-even point 2050 is of dubious public benefit and the supposed requirement of a climate center use appears tenuous and uncertain. We lifetime New Yorkers have heard it all before. The lottery was supposed to fund education. Remember that one? We're all grateful that our spectacular Central Park was not a development site that those who planned New York City did not force it to break even financially. A counterexample is a much larger Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx, New York's Hampstead Heath. But in the 1950s, the major Deegan Expressway was rammed through it. Today's issue is not simply one of total open space, but of the impact that that development has on what open space there is. Ugly as it may be, the major Deegan is still a public use. Before us today is an essentially private use that with its 25 story height uh, and bulk and hotels and maybe even gambling uh, will degrade what is special about Governor's Island. We know our city is hurting economically post pandemic. We know that with the rise of remote work, workers can work for, for New York City companies but live elsewhere. Today, we have to think about what it is that will continue to make New York City attractive and worth living in. So to those who blithely say we can't afford it, when speaking of the world's richest city, and that's what we're in, I, I reply, we cannot, we cannot afford not to protect Governor's Island. Stuffing high-rise buildings onto Governor's Island would be like ramming the BQE through Prospect Park. It'd be like approving an ugly utilitarian Brooklyn Bridge design to save money instead of John Roebling's enduring masterpiece that has inspired millions. If we had approved such plans in decades past, we and our grandchildren would not be proud they and we would be profoundly ashamed of us all. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jenny Lowe, followed by Lindsay Boylan, followed by Megan Malvern. Time will begin. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Moya, for allowing me to testify. I'm Jenny Lowe, a lifelong resident of Lower Manhattan and a candidate for City Council. First, I'd like to thank the Trust for Governors Island for su taking such good care of the island for all these years. Governors Island is a unique and beloved public space in our city. The island's long and fascinating history and the important role it plays for residents today makes it especially important that any development on the island is done right and that community voices are in the center of this process. There are several concerns about this proposed project that needs to be addressed. And as it currently stands, I cannot support it moving forward. As many community leaders have stated, including Borough President Gail Brewer and members of Community Board One, mm -hmm. it is critical that any new development on the island preserve its unique landscape and prioritize protection of open space. Many New Yorkers see Governor's Island as an escape from the city. The proposal is unfortunately out of sync with the existing infrastructure on the island, including low scale structure, open parkland, and would overwhelm the carefully preserved space. Some community members have proposed 
low density development and a cap for the height so that new buildings are consistent with existing structure. Others have called for a more rigorous environmental study of the, uh, of the impact of this new project. And many members have expressed a wish for Governor's Island to continue functioning as a public park. It is clear that this project cannot move forward until these voices are heard and have a real seat at the table in this process. So until these concerns are addressed, I strongly oppose the current plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Always good to see you. Hope you and your family are doing well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you. Next speaker will be Lindsay Boylan, followed by Megan Malvern. Your time will begin now. Thank you, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. My name is Lindsay Boylan, and I've spent my career in urban planning, and I'm a concerned Manhattan resident and parent. I stand with the Metro Area Governors Island Coalition in urging you to reject the proposed upzoning of South Island. New Yorkers have far too little access to green space, which was felt even more painfully in the past year than ever. While some affluent families fled the city for vacation homes, most families remained trapped in their apartments as they tried to survive the pandemic. Preserving green space for the enjoyment of all New Yorkers should be a top priority of the city council. The proposed upzoning of South Island will change the character and experience of Governor's Island forever. Open space should be open, not boxed in by massive corporate style facilities present presenting themselves as a climate change uh, metropolis of sorts that doesn't consider resiliency. The Governor's Island website touts itself uh, that the proposed rezoning will allow for a mix of academic, commercial, nonprofit, cultural, convening, and hospitality uses. That sounds like an extension of the city, which is exactly what people are trying to escape when they visit Governor's Island. 99% of New York City zip codes use Governor's Island. Even as it becomes increasingly safe to travel again, many New Yorkers do not have the means to explore New England or even Long Island. I ask you to reject this plan and instead consider Magic's alternative South Island visualization, which doesn't essentially privatize the island for out of scale, high density, high rise development that is not resilient. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Megan Malvern. Your time will begin. You can hear me? We can hear you. Great. Chair Moya and the commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to add to the discussions. Oh, I should turn my camera on. Hang on. Smiling. Um, there I am. Hi. Sorry, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to add to the discussion. My name is Megan Malvern, and I live in lower Manhattan and love Governor's Island. First, I had to address the elephant in the room. Um, I had no idea what Council Member Chin would say, and I find it incredibly disingenuous that CM Chin is championing the saving the views and protecting it, as she put it herself, the Oz-like feeling as you approach the towers and um, the arch in uh, Governor's Island. While at the same exact time, she's supporting the absolute annihilation and the views of the Oz experience in the Seaport Historic District. And also, I thought it was crazy that to hear Brewer insist that there be no more than 125 foot tall buildings on the same island, where in the seaport, she's advocating blowing out 120 feet tall zoning that exists. Ignoring the public's wishes not only risks unappealing projects, it also undermines a sense of commonwealth that makes democracy function and gives legitimacy to government. But back to the governor's island. At this moment, I'm sitting across this table sort of thing from my son, who brought up today that he wanted to go on a play date on the island all on his own. He wanted me to call up Layla and Tycho and Tristan. And I asked him why Governor's Island? He said, I don't know, mom. It's the only place where it doesn't feel like New York City. It's where I can crawl on a rock. I can throw a ball, lay in the grass, go on a scooter ride. And I am just with my friends having fun outside. There's no other place like it in the world. My son agrees. This place is like Oz. And the wizard here is in the details. Please do not allow this blunt zoning to ruin Governor's Island. It needs so much more work. And please do not depend on zoning limitations to save the island from being overdeveloped in the future. The Seaport Historic District is more than a cautionary tale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chair Moya, that was the last speaker on this panel. 
and I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, there being no questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Council, can you please call up the next panel? Next panel will include Stacy Shubb, Phyllis Weisman, Kirsten Theodos, and Nora Green. First speaker will be Stacy Shubb and then Phyllis Weisman. Time will begin. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm a resident of Lower Manhattan. I am opposed, angry, and saddened. Opposed to this proposal that includes inappropriate out of scale development. Angry that this development is being pushed through under the guise of climate change research. Can you not do research without destroying that which you are trying to protect? Can you not use existing buildings, you know, repurpose? The climate center then somehow will need a hotel, then restaurants, shops, Starbucks, deliveries, maintenance, care, traffic, and trash. On one thing, I agree with Council Member Chin. All these amenities already exist downtown, a quick ferry ride away. Why do you need to replicate it on the island when we could use the business for the starving businesses here? We don't need more. Saddened, this island is a gift precisely because it is largely undeveloped. I'm saddened to think that Governor's Island will cease to exist as it is and will be barely recognizable to future generations. My family's made it an annual event to get into our tutus and wings and halos and glitter and ride the ferry with equally quirky people of all ethnicities and economic backgrounds coming from every zip code in the five boroughs. It's one of the few places that is truly accessible and affordable to anyone. While some people may leave the city bound for the Hamptons on Long Island, the rest of us go to our island, Governor's Island, to escape the city without leaving the city. Will my daughter be able to share this with her children? When I hear the words untapped potential and need to activate, do you know what I hear? Corporate speak, code words for corporate led development and corporate profits. The island is vibrant. It's vibrant with visitors, birds, sky, sun, grass and trees. We do not need a corporate campus on Governor's Island. Magic and others have a plan. Please slow down. What you do or do not do will impact the island forever. Please review alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Phyllis Weisman and then Kirsten Theodos. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon and thank you for devoting such a long time to this critical issue. Um, I am speaking against the rezoning of Governor's Island to make it a 24 seven community uh, with commercial development. Um, I think that the financial sustainability plan needs to be further reviewed. I live near Hudson Yards and that was a city project where we were refurbishing a very dire and bleak area of Manhattan. But today it's become a ghost town, uh, an oasis for the rich, and New York City has to provide massive tax credits in order for Hudson Yards to continue to survive in the upcoming years. Um, I'm concerned that the financial plan, which the trust says is only sustainable with building uh, a hotel and other commercial development, uh, needs to be further examined. Um, and I agree with the other speakers that there should be a height limit on building and basically a rehabilitation of the existing buildings for educational and nonprofit use. Um, I hope that the council will vote no on the current proposal and that the trust will continue to refine its redevelopment plan as it has been doing all along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker will be Kirsten Theodos and Nora Breen will be the last speaker on this panel. Your time will begin. 
Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, the city is trying to privatize Governor's Island, um, even though the restricted deed limits the island's use to be for public benefit. In 2018, the de Blasio administration <clears throat> announced a massive rezoning for this incredibly unique green urban refuge in New York City. Kicking off the process for the rezoning, the CEO of the trust that operates Governor's Island, a former executive from related companies of Hudson Yards, stepped down and former deputy mayor Alicia Glenn was installed. Glenn quickly got the trust mission changed to be about bold visions and full potential and partnered with the Friends of Governors Island, a nonprofit dominated by big real estate firms such as Tishman Spire, Related and Blackstone. In September, amidst a COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic, the city resumed Euler and began fast-tracking rezonings for Governors Island, Flushing, Soho, Noho, and Gowanus. The city's proposal for upzoning Governors Island's southern half will allow buildings as high as 300 feet where none of the buildings currently exceed five stories while dang dangling a climate center as bait. Per the deed agreement, um, the permanent residential development is barred, but hotels and dorms are permitted. The rezoning proposal, which is three times as large as what was originally proposed in 2013, also paves the way for department stores and other commercial and office uses. The purported goal is to create financial self-sufficiency, but that's something that likely won't be achieved until 2050, according to the trust's own projections. Yet today, the island is already mostly self-sufficient in terms of basic maintenance. More alarming is the suspicious timing of key ULERP hearings taking place on days when the community is distracted from voicing opposition. On the eve of election day, Manhattan CB1 held its first public hearing regarding Governor's Island. On December 14th, the day of the Electoral College vote, CB1 voted on rezoning Governor's Island. More recently, uh, Manhattan Borough President Brewer announced she was hoping a panel discussion about the rezoning on Inauguration Day. The ULERP public review process during COVID has been utilizing a deficient virtual platform, causing equity, access, and transparency issues. Uh, recently, um, the Supreme New York State Supreme Court judge time issued has expired. I'm sorry, I ran out of time? Yes. Okay, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The last speaker on this panel will be Nora Green. The time will begin now. Hi, thank you for your time today. And I would also like to thank Council Member Chin and Brewer President, uh, or uh, Borough President Brewer and CB1 President Metzer for their opposition to this project. Firstly, no plan should move forward during a pandemic in an election year. The current trust president was appointed in 2019 by the mayor and has a background in development. I would like to repeat the concerns about corporate interests and echo the press for transparency as to who these entities are and what tax incentives are being offered to um, private corporations. Gambling, I had no idea that, I mean, I really need to look into that. I didn't even know that that was a possibility. Really, gambling, I can't even believe it. It seems outrageous that there is so much testimony about the Climate Center as if, as if there is a clear vision or affiliation for the center and agree that it seems that it appears to be a smoke screen for the entry of private interests. East River Park is closing at the same time. I cannot begin to understand why two major green spaces would be proposed to be demolished at the same time. Seems crazy. Public trust, public trust, public trust. I don't, it, it is always shocking to me how these friends of and corporate interests seem to supersede the public trust. This is public taxpayer money and this is our park, it's our park. And as the work, as work moves remotely, we need time to settle and see which empty, as people keep saying, let's repurpose whatever real estate there is empty. And as Jack Robinson said, there's already a huge structure on the island. Let's occupy what's there and not climate sustainability. Like building is not sustain, you know, new building, new construction is not climate. Time has expired. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. And that was the last speaker on this panel, Chair Moya. 
Um, I see no members with questions, the panel. Okay, there being no questions uh, for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Council, can you please call the next panel? The next panel will include Irene Van Slyke, Jonathan Rubin, Bonnie Weber, and Joel Kupferman. The first speaker will be Irene Van Slyke, and then Jonathan Rubin. Good time will begin. My name is Irene Van Slyke. Uh, I'm representing. <laughs> I'm just uh, representing the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club is America's oldest and largest grassroots environmental organization, and in New York City, it's a volunteer-led entity of the national organization. We recognize that the opening of Governor's Island to the public is making vital park space available to New Yorkers who desperately need it. No doubt, Governor's Island presents our generation with a rare opportunity of creating a park in the harbor, a unique space in a one-of-a-kind setting. Let's not squander this opportunity. <clears throat> the Governor's Island deed does not require that the island or its park be financially self-sustaining. The Sierra Club calls on the City Council to reject that requirement. This would set a terrible precedent for current and future park spaces. So far, the City has contributed to the park from general revenue and this should continue. The Trust has not released its fiscal model for public review as requested by the local community board and borough president, uh, Gail Brewer. The council ought not to approve a plan without full transparency and public scrutiny. <clears throat> South Island should be an entire park expanse bounded only by the harbor and the adjoining North Island Historic District. The rezoning proposal, however, establishes uh, development zones in the South <clears throat> with oversized buildings. New Yorkers deserve and desire to experience a waterside to waterside full park without the intrusion of high rise development and give us a, continue to give us a full escape from the urban urbanization we daily experience elsewhere. <clears throat> and we'll be submitting written testimony as well. Thank you. The time has expired. Thank you. Next speaker will be Jonathan Rubin and then Bonnie Weber. I appreciate the work of the trust. In, I appreciate the work of the trust in stewarding the park opening thus far. I've been to Governor's Island a number of times since 2010, mostly for water festivals. I implored the committee to reject the real estate development for Governor's Island in favor of park development leaving the South part as park only. I'm a 50 year member of the Sierra Club who's enjoyed the best of our national parks as our national wealth. I ran New York City Friends of Clearwater for two, two years. I'm a member of the New York City Sierra Club Urban Sustainability Committee. This development of Governor's Island should be park development, not real estate development. Firstly, I personally make the conditions concerning the height of Governor's Island buildings as four stories only compatible with pre-existing historic buildings regenerated through adaptive reuse, but not rezoned for hotels and dormitories of an anchor center as the proposed climate center yet not yet approved. I reiterate the south part of Governor's Island must remain park rather than dormitories and hotels largely vacant citywide now. The approval of height of rezoning of Governor Island, Governor's Island prior to our RFP approved for the climate center is illogical and not considered the uh, consider of those who cherish park in New York City. The climate center or any center must be approved prior to the rezoning. More is not always better. At a time when dormitories and hotels are largely vacant, enhancing the earth and preserving park makes space. The park first was settled by the Lenape Native Americans, where Lenape means the people, but the city people are not really part of this proposal with members of the Friends of GI maximizing real estate development for hotels and dormitories, not even for city residents. The trust respects 
the false assumption over and over over again that the island needs to be used by a large number of people throughout the year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Bonnie Weber and then Joel Kupferman. Your time will begin. Hi, my name is Bonnie Weber. I am also testifying for the Sierra Club New York City group. We urge you to reject the two Governor's Island applications before you. Despite Community Board 1, as well as Manhattan Borough President's request, the trust has not released its fiscal model. Thus, the public and the City Council will not be able to review or critique it. The Council ought not to approve a plan without full transparency and opportunity for public comment. This is a unique and very important opportunity to save valuable open space. Future changes should not become an exclusive top-down process, but incorporate a bottom-up method. The North Island's height limit should be a maximum of 120 feet, as also proposed by Community Board 1 and the Borough President. The city should maintain the current 35 foot height limit in the South Island. High rises on the South side will take up parkland and obliterate the opportunity to escape from our high density urban environment. The plan foresees upwards of 3000 permanent residents that will need clean water and waste disposal, including sewage treatment. The city must assure that the island's waste does not overload the Red Hook wastewater treatment plant where Governor's Island sewage would be transferred. The Red Hook plant during heavy rain already regularly overflows with raw sewage into the Gowanus Canal, which is already an environmental disaster. Thank you very much, Councilman. Chair Matt Maya, I really appreciate your style. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Joel Kufferman. Yeah. Sorry, there we go. Hello, thank you very much. Joel Kupferman, Environmental Justice Attorney from Environmental Justice Initiative. Um, I think this is the fourth, fifth copy of my talk that I that I wrote after hearing all the concerns. But it concerns me as an environmental justice attorney that this is one of the worst plans that I've seen, not just the plan, but also the process. Um, I am in support of the magic plan. The present plan is a false opening, many red flags going up. The first red flag was raised in the presentation by the trust executive director, who had to be corrected by the trust's attorney. The education section will not be protected by the deed provision for perpetuity, as she said, but only for 30 years. This isn't a minor error. The trust plan as we presented to the, to, to the city council and to all of us who spoke today was presented by someone who doesn't really know what the plan is and how as a lawyer representing um, all these community groups and the work that we've done, it's very, very hard when we have a moving target. We definitely wanna know what the plan is. Um, there's a major misinterpretation. Um, and moreover, we cannot just rely on the deed, the deed restrictions alone, but must insist on clear, distinct language and transparent terms that it might take a little longer to do and definitely has to take longer to do, but we can't rely on a deed that we don't even know what the deed says if there's, if there's disagreement among the, the, the um, project sponsors. Mm -hmm. This And misleading. The second flag that came up to me was council members Chin's reference to East River Park as a model of resiliency. Not only, in, in the East River Park did we face a tree massacre, but we're also, we basically had a miscarriage of the Euler process. After weeks of-, of, 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 of Can I just finish my statement, please? If you can wrap it up right now. Okay. Great. I just want to say as a lawyer, this is really, really bad. The city keeps on terming open space as less and less green and smaller protections. They always end up defending the developer in terms of private public partnerships. We have to be concerned about. And number three, most of this is being done for the financing. We just have to remember that just a few billion dollars have been passed in Washington, and much of that money is available through very different 
different departments in terms of resiliency and, 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 and um, natural resource protection that we don't have to depend on a private public partnership here. Okay. Thank you. Today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last speaker on this panel, Chair Moya. I currently see no members with questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, there being no questions for this panel, the witnesses panel is now excused. Council, if you can please call up the next panel. Next panel will include Michael Davis, Margot Spindleman, Emmy Campbell, and Will Kurtz. First speaker will be Michael Davis and then Margot Spindleman. Hello, my name is Michael Davis. I was born and raised in New York City and I've lived in Brooklyn for the last 32 years. I oppose the re proposed rezoning of Governor's Island. Anyone who's lived in New York City for any period of time knows that this proposal is just another real estate deal, the selling of a valuable public asset to raise money for the city and enrich the private interests involved. Any plan must include portal, portal Governor's Island Art Fair. I've exhibited with this important art fair twice, and I've seen countless artists and art lovers make their way to this there every summer. This art fair has been on the island for more than 12 years and is an essential anchor. They must remain on the island. The idea of economic self-sufficiency is a ridiculous burden to place on a beloved already functioning park, education and cultural center. The island should be publicly funded through increased taxes on those who can afford them. I, I suppose we could put a Hudson Yards in Central Park too. The most alarming part of this proposal, after the part about ruining the island's character entirely, is the way it completely ignores the climate crisis that is now upon us. Buildings in New York City account for somewhere around 70% of our carbon emissions. New York State passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act in 2019. This is New York State law. It calls for the reduction of greenhouse gases by 40% by 2030. And the Governor's Island Trust wants to increase the carbon footprint of the island by who knows how many percentage points. This takes us backwards. Dropping a climate, uh, dropping a climate study center in the middle of this, uh, of this project won't change the fact that it's, that it's illegal and immoral. Thank you. Next Thank speaker you. will be Margot Spindleman and then Emmy Campbell. Good time, we'll begin now. Hi, my name is Margot Spindleman. I'm an artist living in New York City and a past participant in the Governor Island Art Fair, which was my introduction to this unique and beautiful place. Before my initial participation with the fair in 2012, I'd never visited this gorgeous piece of wilderness, a five minute ferry ride from Manhattan. I was shocked by the island and moved by it too, a place that is wide open, strollable, surrounded by water, quiet. I spent three days a week on the island in the month of September 2012 and was just struck by this unusual gem that offered so many ways to sit on some grass, look up at the sky, listen to the water. I've been coming back ever since, both as an artist in the fair and as one of those New York City residents who feels the tremendous luck in finding a cheap and easy way to get out of the city without actually leaving. I know about developers in open space. I live in Greenpoint as 40 story luxury condos metastasize in my neighborhood, they've built a discontinuous skinny green ribbon of what has been called open space, which you can get to by navigating your way around and between gigantic sky blocking towers. How something similar can be proposed for Governor's Island is beyond comprehension. The plan as currently presented lacks the rigor and specificity that would protect Governor's Island from future voracious overdevelopment. Reducing building height to 250 feet from 300 feet is utterly insufficient. I fully support work that seeks to address the climate emergency we're in. I just fail to see how building massive new buildings accomplishes this. Actually, I wonder if they'll be mandated to be built to use 100% renewable energy. Since COVID, we have acres of vacant office buildings in Midtown Manhattan. I would suggest exploring options to reconfigure that space instead of building out Governor's Island at the expense of air and light and wild habitat. Please say no to this disastrous rezoning, this terrible privatization of our glorious public space. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next speaker will be Emmy Campbell 
and then Will Kurtz. Hi. It's time to begin. Now. My name's Emmy Campbell, and in solidarity with the Indigenous voices I have heard today, amongst others, I speak in opposition to this proposal. Climate solutions do not include erecting steel behemoths on some of the precious little wide open green space in our city, which is how spaces which are home to a number of seabirds that will be displaced with this development. You talk about year round use, neglecting to recognize that nature is a year round phenomena. Your development threatens to devastate the free and natural feeling of Governor's Island, all in the sordid name of capital. You conveniently largely left out details of your hotel operations in your presentation. This craven behavior shows that you know that we do not want more walled gardens for the elite in our city. We want real green space, not conciliatory shrub shrubbery wedged between yet another stand of dreary hulking monuments to our, need, to our need to colonize every corner of the map. Please consider voting, saying no to this proposition. Thank you. Thank you. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Will Kurtz. Your time will begin. Hello, am I on? We hear you. Okay. Um, I'm a, I'm an artist, and I've uh, been going to Governor's Island se several years, and I've attended the art fair. And I remember um, riding my bike across the bridge and taking a ferry there, and it was so unique um, to have that space next to, to an urban area like New York is is really, you can't find it anywhere else. And when I was over there, I would be, I would look back at the city and I would just think, wow, look at this open space. And I, when I was in, I lived next to, to, to Central Park and I can't imagine Central Park having buildings put on it now. And for the fact that they're talking about 250 foot tall buildings going there, it's unbelievable. I mean, when you're out there, there's all these huge buildings that are empty and they're not even being used. Why would you put new buildings up when you can just uh, revitalize the existing buildings that are there? And if, if, in, if, and if even if you couldn't do that, just think um, if you put the new buildings up, why do they have to be 250 feet tall? Why can't they just be four stories like the existing buildings and have the same character? I mean, I, I don't I don't even want to go out there anymore if it's if you're going to start changing it and if and it's going to become um, like a regular city park. What's unique about it that it's all open. And, you know, I, I lived out in Vancouver and they had this beautiful park right by it, right by the city, and they left it alone. It's just massive trees. They just left it alone. Why did, does everything have to be developed? I just don't understand. So I have to say about that. Thank you so much for your uh, testimony today. You're Thank welcome. you. Chair Moya, that was the last speaker of this panel. Uh, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, there being no questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And Council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Gabriel Willow, Patty, Heffley, Dan Campbell, and Maria Roca. The first speaker on the panel will be Gabriel Willow, followed by Patty Heffley. Good time will begin. Thanks. You may begin. Good 
Mr. Willow, you can begin. Gabriel, can you, yeah, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yep. Great. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I've been visiting Governor's Island since it first opened to the public, and um, I have worked out there in various capacities for several years now, including with um, some environmental organizations uh, that have spoken earlier, but I'm speaking just as a private citizen uh, on behalf of myself and, and how, how I feel about the island. And it's, it's, a, it's a magical place as so many others have mentioned. And um, I, I think there's this ineffable quality of openness and green space and sky that so many New Yorkers don't have the opportunity to experience. And you know, Richard Louv in his book, Last Child in the Woods, talks about this, this quality of, of nature deficit disorder where, you know, so many children increasingly don't have the opportunity to experience the outdoors, experience nature. I'm an environmental educator, so this is what I do. I take people outside to experience nature. And there's something so unique about Governor's Island in all of New York City, where you have uh, this open sky. And that's something that so few New Yorkers and so few uh, children in New York have the opportunity to experience this feeling that you can breathe and see this open skyline and see the Statue of Liberty and see the New York City skyline. And while there's been a lot of talk about preserving the footprint of the existing park and only building on the footprint of the designated uh, zones, that hasn't, they haven't really discussed how much that'll still change one's perception and experience of the island. So if you go to Hammock Grove and you lay in a hammock right now, you look and you see trees and you see sky. And how different will that experience be if you go to Hammock Grove, if you lay in a hammock and you see a skyscraper instead. And, and so I think maintaining one place in New York City where you have open skies and open air and that feeling that you can really breathe and, and unwind and there's no cars and no traffic, it's, it's just remarkable and, and so unique and so special on a global level to have something like that in New York City. I mean, I take uh, people out there on tours from all over the world and they are, they are amazed. The time has expired. They're astounded. Um, if, if I may just uh, finish up here. Um, yeah, that'd be great. I just ask you to, to maintain that quality. Uh, I, I, think, I think everybody agrees that a, a, a climate center would be amazing. But uh, Liggett Hall is nearly the size of the Empire State Building lying on its side. It's over a thousand feet long and it is standing empty. Please use existing structures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker will be Hat Patty Heffley, followed by Dan Campbell. Your time will begin. Hello. Hi, Patty. How are you? Fine. What's uh... okay? Hello. Hello, I'm Patty Heffley. I'm a 43 year old resident in Chelsea living adjacent to the High Line Park and near Hudson Yards. As a newer member of community, the county committee, I say no to these proposals. I oppose the governor's island real estate construction and all manner of graft from New York City's budget and future tax revenue pot. We all know what this is. It's a giveaway from the taxpayers pockets knowing it's 2050 before it maybe might even break even. The whole time taxpayers are paying taxes and upkeep and expenses while the above grifters are getting giant tax breaks right out of the box. New York City can't afford another Hudson Yards boondoggle. Hudson Yards has failed and we the taxpayers are paying for it. Enough people will not go to Governor's Island enough for the trust stated plans profitability and won't want to take a ferry every day to work. They want grass, open skies and little to do. The High Line works because it is accessible by walking and trains and buses. It's a small commitment. It's New York City when you step off the stairs. How many people do you need to be constant users of the island to pay for itself by 2050? And how will they get there? 
Will Governor's Island be like the Hudson Yards, a giant failure of ideas and a waste of money? Taxpayers' money. We need affordable housing on a massive scale. We need COVID ventilation citywide. We need better schools in every corner of the city. We need to tax the rich to pay for their own mistakes, like Hudson Yards, not the taxpayers paying. There are other proposed appropriate plans that are in scale to the island and won't hold the tax paying citizens hostage. The magic plan seems to conserve the island. And very importantly as well, the migrating birds who need the park should be considered. No on this taxpayer graph boondoggle. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Dan Campbell, who will be followed by Maria Roca. The time will begin. Are you hearing me okay? We hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm Dan Campbell, and I'm a New Yorker and one of the many people who visit the island every year. Um, I look forward to it all year long, and I think I probably um, speak for all of those thousands of people when I say that we're not coming despite Governor Island's lack of commercial development. We're coming precisely for its lack of commercial development. Um, I'm not sure I would want to still come if it just felt like more of what I've already got plenty of and, and encounter on a daily basis as I go about my routine in the city. Governor Island's always been a special place and special for how proximate it is to the city, but you can just take a ferry across the Buttermilk Channel and suddenly you feel like you're so far away. The current proposal destroys that and it seems like a gift to the planners and the developers uh, the commercial interests that would all seek to benefit from this and not for the people who live there and, and the history of the island uh, and the people like myself who have been going there for 10 years and support this, this special place that we'd like to see preserved. So while I and others <clears throat> were all in favor of good things like education and bathrooms and the environment, I don't think we need to add high rises and, and a hotel to get that. That just shouldn't be a requirement. Uh, so I urge you to please not approve this, this upsell and keep it for the people, something special that's worth preserving uh, down through the generations as a park. Um, so I, I implore you to save Governor's Island. It's worth saving. Thank you. Thank you. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Maria Roca. Your time will begin. Okay, here we are. Ready? We're ready. Okay. I am Maria Roca. One second. One, one more pop up. There we go. Um, I am Maria Roca, and I'm here as a 60 year resident of New York City founder of the Central Sunset Park and advocate for all New York City public parks, in particular, the ones in Southwest Brooklyn. One of many New York City areas, sadly and severely lacking in adequate, and that is in quotes adequate, because even adequate is less than we should tolerate, environmentally safe, green, open space for each and all of its residents and visitors. To anyone who has lived and or is living near the waterfront of the archipelago that is New York City, the proposal plan here with discussed is clearly another major predatory thrust against a livable New York City, again, for each and all of us. All you need to look is at, um, and I'm staying in Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn, and what has been coming south on 4th Avenue. And here in Sunset Park, it is knocking at our door. Um, and we know it, people know it, and it will. it is the same predatory thrust that we have seen all around New York City. This is very personal, very, uh, to all New Yorkers. All these people here have spoken e eloquently, and why? because they have personally felt the abuse, the predatory um, energy of all of this that is, as we're discussing here, 
uh, will be thrust upon governor's island. It, it's it's with, um, without precedent, what we have seen. It's a long time coming. Time but, has expired. You know, when you go after a, a place like governor's island, I, I don't know what else. Uh, what can you say? Um, you have no soul. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for your testimony today. That was the last speaker for this panel, Chair Moya. Uh, I see no hands from members for the panel. Okay, there being no questions for this panel, this uh, witness panel is now excused. And Council, if you can please call up the next panel. Yes, Chair, the next panel will include Jada Fabricio and Judith Canipa. Jada Fabricio will go first, and then we will hear from Judith Canipa. Your time will begin. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. You can hear me? You can okay. hear me. Um, for over a decorate, uh, decade, community arts groups have enhanced the experience of Governor's Island. I've been listening all day to people talking about um, the cultural experience of Governor's Island. And I really haven't heard very much about local community legacy artist groups being supported. I also oppose this um, development because New York has enough hotels and enough high rises. It does not have enough open space. As an artist who has participated in the Four Heads Governor's Island Art Fair, I can tell you that being an artist and getting that opportunity was like a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, I'm concerned that the rezoning of the Governor's Island, um, of Governor's Island will create an environment in which community-based arts and culture will eventually suffer and fade. I hope the trust will continue to support community-based arts organizations and, and I hope that the people will oppose this development. Um, I guess that's all I have to say, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now hear from Judith Kanipa. The time will begin. Hi, my name is Judith Kanepa, and I'm calling about the my opposition to the proposed plan for Governor's Island. I think that it's out, out of scale development for such a bucolic treasure as this island with the history of this of this place and how it succeeded its original mission of being a uh, military base and became a haven for wildlife and for people who appreciated it. For those of us who could just jump on that ferry and in a quick five to seven minutes, we were in another world. How are these spas and tall buildings and um, workout centers and commercial um, office buildings, how, how is that supposed to fit in with the plan that was originally thought of that beautifully conceived plan for this island. And that as, Ms. as Mr. Kupferman alluded to earlier, there is now funding to restore such places without burdening New York City with overdevelopment just to, ca to catch a few bucks to, to create uh, half of a dream. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Chair Moyad, that was the last speaker on this panel. Uh, I'm not seeing any members with questions for this panel. Okay, uh, there being no more questions, uh, for, uh, there being no questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, Council, can you please call up the next panel? Yes, Chair, we, we actually have a couple of holdover panelists that we're gonna try to uh, hear from now. 
we will start with, uh, well, they include Howard Branstein and Andrew Zelcher. We're gonna first try to hear again from Howard Branstein. Howard Branstein. Okay. Yeah, one second, please. Still catches your flow, can you hear me? Can hear you, Howard. Okay, thanks. So uh, my name is Howard Branstein. I'm the um, executive director of Sixth Street Community Center in the East Village, Lower East Side. So every summer for the past 10 years, we bring our kids in our summer program to Governor's Island on bicycle trips. And it's, a, as everyone has said, it's an incredibly beautiful bucolic park. Um, New York City, as has been pointed out right now, is incredibly overbuilt and currently very un under occupied. So we want to preserve the pastoral character and open space of those areas like Governor's Island that remain. The uh, Trust for Governor's Island plan changes the character dramatically with its 20 proposal for 25 story buildings and millions of new square feet. I think even 125 foot buildings are too much. And I think we should stick with the existing heights. The climate center proposed by the uh, trust is really just a Trojan horse for overdevelopment, including the uh, hotel, which is completely inappropriate for that beautiful space. And in fact, this exacerbates the climate crisis. We don't need the so-called climate center as proposed by the governor's island. We need to fight climate change by expanding open space and reducing our greenhouse emissions. And in that regard, yes, of course, we should support the existing organizations on Governor's Island to do more of the great work that we're doing. So let's renovate and repurpose the existing structures or remove those structures that are not usable and create more open space. So I urge the city council to vote no on this very misguided proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Howard, for your testimony today. Okay, uh, and for our remaining holdover panelists, Andrew Zelter, we're gonna try to see if we can get Andrew Zelter's testimony. Andrew Zelter, if you can hear us. Um, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Okay, Chair, it appears that we unfortunately are continuing to have uh, trouble getting through to Andrew Zelter not being to get his testimony. Um, you'll have an announcement later regarding submission of written testimony, uh, but for now that is the uh, last witness name on this last panel. We will now uh, see if there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the Governor's Island rezoning proposal. If so, please press the raise hand button now. Okay, it appears that we do have someone doing just that. Okay, we're going to try to the witness identified as Ali Ryan. We're going to bring that individual in. Allie Ryan. If this is someone who has not already testified, we will take that testimony. Um, in the event that it's someone who has already testified, um, that we, we, we won't do that. I'm, hello, Chris Ryan here. It must have signed in with my wife's name, but um, okay. Hi. Hi, sorry. I'm, was, uh, this is Chris Ryan, husband of Allie Ryan. Um, I would like to testify as well. Uh, as she mentioned earlier, we were married in uh, Governor's Island and was dear to our hearts. We're concerned that we do not need it to uh, be lost. We'd like it to be preserved like Central Park. I think we have a unique opportunity to have a Central Park from our generation that we preserved. I believe the lower half of the island should not be built at all 
I know some people even willing to go up to four stories, but I think if we can come up with a plan with the bottom half being left undeveloped until all housing or built structures on the upper half are occupied. Renovate those first, occupy, and then see if we still need more space. We probably uh, do not, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I thought it was ironic the plan proposed by the trust ended with an image of the island and the untouched with a view of Manhattan. And the whole plan seemed to be about eliminating that image. We don't need the hotels. We don't need, uh, you know, if we need a climate center, then great, put in some of these buildings that are already built and make that happen. And was touched upon earlier also about bike lanes. Yes, I think there should be a somewhat protected bike lane protecting the pedestrians that can go around the whole of the island so people can uh, cycle without worrying about hitting older people or young kids running in their way. Um, and hey, I don't think profitability is a goal. I think we have to keep our parks uh, free from pressure of profit. We seem to find money for everything. There are ferries going there year round. They're just not for the public. You know, if we need more ferries, great. May not be so many people in December, January, February. So until we find out what we need, let's just keep working with what we have, which is a beautiful island, half of it undeveloped, the other half already itching to be filled up with real estate and developers or whoever you want to put in these other buildings, let them put their money to work into those buildings. But let's keep the Your time has expired this unique space available for all our families. Thank you. We are now going to attempt to get testimony from Daniel Reynolds. And after Daniel Reynolds, if and when we can get his testimony, we will also hear from Gerald Forsberg. Forsberg. But first, again, Daniel Reynolds. Daniel Reynolds, if you can hear us, please uh, press the raise hand button. Okay, we're gonna give Daniel Reynolds um, a couple more minutes, during which time we will now try to hear from Gerald Forsberg. Gerald Forsberg uh, is going to be brought into the meeting to testify. There we go, can you hear me? Yes, your time will be here. Uh, thank you, okay. Um, yes, uh, so I want to challenge the city of New York to consider a less myopic view of Governor's Island as a single entity, entity separate from the other islands. Um, the island is, the, the, as I see the problem here, the island's disconnected from the city as a whole, regardless of ferry service. Uh, underlying the trust request for rezoning is a desire, though not a mandate, for the island to be financially independent. One problem that has been presented as a block to this financial independence has been year-round access to the island. What has been meant by this or suggested is that year-round financial support for the island is, is what's missing. <clears throat> um, and I would provide that year-round access to the island um, could, could be had with, without that actual financial support. Uh, in fact, I challenge the trust, uh, the, I, I challenge that the trust, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm, I was writing this very quickly. Um, instead of speculative build it and they will come approach, why not use data that is read, readily available? Walkable cities, pedestrian friendly cities, open spaces, these are what make a city livable. I propose that the city of New York take a more proactive approach to preserving the openness of the island, financial viability of the island and access to the island by considering a completely different approach. That is a construction of a pedestrian only bridge to connect Governor's Island to both lower Manhattan and Brooklyn. Uh, COVID has shown each of us the need for social distancing and outdoor open space. There is a push in urban planning for more walkable cities. Why rely on a ferry to get us to the island? The, the Lenape used canoes. Why not build a walkable pedestrian bicycle friendly connection to permit the Hudson Greenway to continue across the harbor, encompass the island and continue to the Brooklyn waterfront, thereby giving year round accessibility to 
New Yorkers and visitors alike equally. Such a structure um, would also possibly spur development at the Brooklyn waterfront, which may incidentally be a better inspired. place for a climate research center. Elements of the magic plan could be incorporated. Thank you very much. I urge the council to um, really consider the, the island as the heart of the harbor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Council, do we have any other panelists? Chair, there are no more witnesses on this panel. However, I understand that we are getting in some additional uh, registrations. So uh, as I get that information, we will be introducing some new names. Uh, but as for this panel, uh, they could be excused. I see no members with questions. Thank you. Um, seeing that there's no questions for this panel, this panel is now excused. And we will call okay. the um, Yes, as we continue to wait for the new registrations, we are also now going to hear from the individual logged in as Ali Ryan. Uh, once again, we're taking testimony from individuals who have not already testified. Uh, so the person logged in is Ali Ryan. Um, I'm going to turn on that microphone and hear the testimony provided. It's from a new uh, speaker. Hello. Hello again. My daughter just saw her father speak, so she now wants to speak. Hi, how are you? Good. I really like Governor's Island. And also, when I first went there, her and it was very fun going on the slide, and, uh, and, and also, uh, why would the governor destroy a yeah, island named after him? <laughs> uh, because like the governor wants to destroy Governor's Island. So, exactly. what's, the, what's your name? What is Virginia. It? Virginia. Well, thank you, Virginia, for coming on and testifying. We really appreciate it. Can you share how old you are? I'm eight going on nine. Eight going on nine. Look, I, I remember when I was eight going on nine. I wish I was back there. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, Virginia. Would you like to add anything else before we go? Mm. No or yes. No. No? Uh, well, thank you so much, Virginia, for coming on. We really appreciate it. I'm sure your dad is very proud of you right now. So thank you so much. This is our other daughter. <laughs> okay. The whole family's on. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to the Ryan family for coming on. <laughs> Take care. All right, Chair, uh, Chair Moya, um, I, I do understand that we were getting some late registrations, but we're gonna now, um, so, so we're gonna wait just a little bit uh, for those to come in. Uh, I'll ask once again, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the Governor's Island Resuming Proposal and have not already done so, uh, please press the raise hand button. Or if you're watching and have not already testified, uh, registration must be completed at the council's website. We will stand at ease briefly uh, while we check for those last members of the public who might have registered.
Okay. Chair Moyet, we just have one uh, potential last individual to testify. That would be Dan Reynolds. Dan Reynolds, if you can hear me, please press the raise hand button now and we will take your testimony. Dan Reynolds. Do we have Dan? Sorry, Chair, it appears that uh, we, we may have lost our last person. Okay. Uh, so I see no other members of the public seeking to testify on this item at this time. If there was anybody that might have missed uh, or dropped off, there's uh, you can always email your testimony um, to uh, the council. And uh, Arthur, if you want to read off the email. email. Written testimony should be emailed to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the pre considered LU items under ULERP numbers N210126 ZRM and C210127 ZMM for the Governor's Island rezoning proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, that includes today's business. I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to submit uh, testimony again, uh, you can always do so uh, by emailing us at land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank the members of the public um, for your patience. And uh, I know it might, might have been a bit of a long hearing, but thank you so much for uh, coming on. My colleagues, of course, the subcommittee council, uh, land use and the council staff, and of course the Sergeant at Arms uh, for uh, helping us get through this and for participating in uh, today's meeting. And always thank you to uh, my co-pilot, uh, Arthur, uh, for helping shepherd this thing through, uh, and uh, Angelina as well. Thank you so much, everyone. This meeting is hereby adjourned.